Well, good morning, everyone. I'm calling to order our special meeting of the Douglas County School District Board of Education for July 25th at 8.08. .08. We have been working through some technical issues and we think we're up and running. So at this time, we would like everyone to join us. Or actually, before we do that, I should do roll call. Um, so we'll start with Director Chancho Shore. Here. Director Graziano. Here. Hansen. Here. Holtzman. Here. Lung. Here. Meek. Here. And Ray is here. Please join me as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on our agenda is to accept the agenda and board directors and the public. I will let you know that um, the majority of the slides today that align to this agenda are under agenda item number four. So those of you that are able to log on to the website, you can go to our agenda and under agenda four, you'll find the slide deck. Um, those sections actually align with the many topics board directors that are on our agenda. My hope is that we will get through sections one through four of the plan before lunch and then sections five through 10 after lunch um, is how we will pace that today. So with that, I will entertain a motion to accept the agenda. So Move to moved. So moved. Moved by Graziano, seconded by Holtzman. Any further discussion regarding the agenda? Seeing none, let's vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. So as we begin this meeting, I just want to make some couple of remarks to set the stage for us today. Typically, this is something we do on an annual basis to get away, and we uh, tend to go to our outdoor education center, and certainly we have uh, a pretty difficult and challenging issue today in terms of um, having students return to school. I, I, I wanna first of all, though, just affirm with confidence that every person on the dais, every person in the room, Dr. Tucker, cabinet, leadership, everyone, is absolutely believes that the best way to educate our students is with their peers, five days a week, with their teachers and support staff. Um, that's, the, that's the hallmark of public education. Learning is relational, it's interactive, and it's collaborative. You will not hear anyone today debate the necessity to get our students back to this kind of environment. Our purpose today is not to convince anyone of whether their fear or their absence of fear is valid or irrational. No one has the right to dismiss or devalue anyone's level of tolerance for risk and whether the level of tolerance is reasonable or not. Everyone has the right to have their fear or their lack of fear acknowledged and respected. And I would tell you, judging by the hundreds of emails that we've received, the comfort level for risk are all over the place. And we get that. And we've read heartbreaking stories of what it means to feel at risk or when it comes to health or the fear of exposing loved ones, as well as those who are adamant that school must resume in person with minimal restrictions for the sake of children's mental wellness. So trust me that all of us feel the angst, the loss of sleep that these kind of decisions bring. When I served as the director of the outdoor education program, my favorite activity was facilitating the zip line because over and over again, I got to experience students conquering their fears and finding a new sense of confidence. However, we always emphasize the motto challenge by choice, which simply meant that no one has the right to force you to do something that you are uncomfortable doing, and we always respect each other's sense of fear. 
So for one camper, just standing on the zip line platform and looking down became that person's challenge. For another, it was launching off the platform backwards or without their hands. Each of those was worthy of celebration and acknowledgement. And as a zip line facilitator, I knew that no matter what I did to orient students to their equipment and their safety techniques, every time I released a student to zip across the cable, there was always a risk that something undesirable could happen. I won't go into details because I don't want to increase people's anxiety about zip lining, but there is always a high degree of vulnerability and risk. No plan can eliminate risk, and we need to challenge each other to accept that today. And although today's intent is to answer a multitude of questions, the reality is that some of the answers may not be the guaranteed assurance that some of you are needing. So, what is it that our community, employees, and students can expect today? Um, we've seen it, we've seen drafts, we've seen it evolve over months, a clearly detailed plan that implements a reasonable standard of care while providing viable options out of respect to those who have different levels of tolerance for risk and vulnerability. And this absolutely includes both our students and our employees. So I want to emphasize also that whatever plan we land on today, it is our plan. It's not the superintendents, it's not the boards, it's not the states, it's not some special interest group, it's our plan, Douglas County School District's plan. And the reason I can say that with confidence is because the incredible amount of input from our task force, survey results, students and employee feedback, and literally thousands of emails and social media responses, building, letter, building leader level meetings, and continual feedback that has been accepted through this process. <clears throat> Every voice has been considered along with the direction from the governor's office, the Department of Colorado Public Health and Environment, the Colorado Department of Education, the Metro Denver Partnership of Health, which also includes Tri-County Health. So regardless of whether your request or recommendation shows up in this plan today, it is important to know that every voice has been heard and has had some kind of influence in its development. And this development has happened over several months and it will continue to evolve even after today. I also wanna address this notion of in data we trust. While data and science are absolutely a factor in our decision-making, Data ultimately is just numbers, and it doesn't tell us what we should do or how we should do it. The way it's interpreted, manipulated, expressed, presented, tells many different stories and gives us clues about how we should proceed. Data absolutely is a vital part of our decision making. The opinions of our medical experts like Dr. Douglas that we'll hear today, Dr. Early, the American Pediatrics Association should absolutely be considered and responded to. But we are fooling ourselves to believe that all data and all medical experts agree to how schools should open. So clearly our dilemma and challenge today, board directors, are enormous. And what we know is that it is impossible to please everyone. This is simply not an achievable goal. What is achievable is a plan based on solid principles, reflective of health and safety expertise, as well as a plan that will continually be vetted for feasibility by our leaders and employees and expediently modified accordingly. Finally, I also want just everyone to understand that with the exception of executive sessions in which, real, uh, in which we deal with legal issues, the board can only meet in public. This means that today, those of you that are viewing live stream, as well as those of you in the room, will see authentic discussion, questioning, and real-time problem solving. It is for this reason that you may see disagreement, tense moments, difficult conversations. As elected officials, we are not afforded the opportunity to meet behind closed doors and polish our presentation for a public performance. However, rest assured, 
regardless of real people having real conversations today, there is a tremendous respect and high regard for Dr. Tucker, his cabinet, and all of our staff, because we know first and foremost where their hearts are. And just like my colleagues here on the dais, their hearts are hyper-focused on doing what is best for our students and staff when it comes to safety and learning. Many of these individuals are in the room with us today, so I want to take a moment just to acknowledge you. Um, Superintendent uh, Dr. Tucker, Assistant Superintendent Ted Knight, Communications Officer Stacy Rader, Chief Technology Officer Gautam Sethi, Chief Operating Officer Rich Cosgrove, Personalized Learning Officer Nancy Ingalls, Chief Academic Officer Marlena Gross-Taylor, Chief Assessment and Data Officer Matt Reynolds, Interim Chief Financial Officer Colleen Doan, and Janice Slicer, as well as our new CFO, um, Katie Kulaska, sorry, Katie. I'll, I'll get, I'll, it'll be a home name here soon for me. Uh, General Legal Counsel, Mary Clemish, Human Resource Chief Officer, Amanda Thompson, Executive Directors of Schools, Danielle Hyatt, Ian Wells, Danny Weiser, Corey Wise, Director of Health and Wellness, Lisa Cantor, Director of Safety and Security, Richard Payne, Director of Athletics and Activities, Derek Cheney, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Erica Mason. I read your names because I know you have worked exhaustively through the summer since the outbreak in March, even before the summer. And we owe, we owe a debt of gratitude to all of you. And on behalf of my colleagues, I want to genuinely thank each one of you for persevering, remaining professional, and focused on our students, even when confronted by those whose filters of grace and decency have not always been evident. So with that, to quote one of my colleagues to my left, it's ever onward to the work of today as we look at the most current information impacting our students' return to school and detailing the plan and multiple scenarios for responding to circumstances that are ever moving. So with that, I want to welcome our esteemed leader, Dr. Tucker, who is going to begin facilitating and guiding us through this, this work day to day. Dr. Tucker, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly good morning uh, to our outstanding and hardworking Board of Education members, uh, cabinet administrators, uh, teachers, our support staff, the entire 8,600 people who represent the Douglas County School District. This is a great day uh, for us. Today represents what public education is about. It's about every facet of the community coming together to do what's best for our children, for our 68,000 students and our 8,600 colleagues and the 350,000 or so people who live here in Douglas County. Again, this represents what's great about America, what's great about democracy, and what's great about public education. As Director Ray mentioned, uh, this has been a challenge. For almost 400 years, public education has been a challenge. But there's one thing that ties this community together, and that's about educating our kids and taking care of our kids taking care of our staff, our teachers, support staff, administrators, and always, always doing what's right. Regardless of our political ideology, regardless of how schools should start, this is the one thing that ties us together. So it is my pleasure uh, to stand here, not only as your superintendent, but to facilitate this discussion that we're going to have all day. Uh, first, a couple of special introductions and acknowledgments. Uh, Director Ray did a fine job of pointing out staff. I won't uh, reemphasize that. Uh, the Douglas County School District Board of Education, uh, Dr. John Douglas, Executive Director of Tri-County Health Department, and he'll be joining us soon. And also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Brian Early, who's the uh, medical epidemiologist with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, he's been uh, great in terms of giving all superintendents, educators, board members advice in terms of this outbreak of the coronavirus. 
So a, a big shout out uh, to him. Uh, to our Douglas County School District Cabinet, uh, a small group of folks, but a mighty, mighty uh, group of folks. Uh, the Douglas County School District staff that we've just mentioned, all, everyone who works for the Douglas County School District, regardless of his or her title. And then our principals, they have really, really been outstanding in giving us a bird's eye view in terms of what this looks like uh, in our school district or what this could look like once we implement whatever plan uh, that we're going to implement to bring our students and staff back safely. So principals, thank you, thank you. And you're going to hear from uh, several of our principals later on this morning as well. Uh, quickly, a uh, couple of our goals here. They are in full alignment with the Denver Metro Area Partnership. You heard that uh, mentioned earlier, which is a consortium of six or seven county health departments. Our Goal number one, we need to maximize in-person learning in as safe and healthy way as possible with flexibility to change models uh, when necessary. Moving from uh, in-person to hybrid to e-learning and ensuring we're doing that without uh, much disruptions to the educational process. Ensuring equity in educational opportunity. Uh, as you know, we had the pleasure on September 21st of 2019 uh, launching our strategic plan and one of the challenges our board members have given us is to look at our decisions uh, with equity as a lens. So we're uh, excited about uh, that huge challenge. It is a challenge but our folks are up to meet that. And we need to encourage flexibility, adaptation, innovation as we develop new approaches to this disease control and working with our health experts and working with science. And last but not least, allow for local approaches based on COVID-19 incidents and allow for the community to be part of the solution. I want to dissect that very briefly here. Allow for local approaches. That simply means it's going to look different in the Douglas County School District versus Cherry Creek versus DPS versus Aurora. There are different dynamics in school districts. Buildings are going to look different. Our buildings in Douglas County will look a lot different. The elementary, middle and high school approaches to how to deal with traffic flow, how to deal uh, with uh, not only traffic flow with students and staff in the buildings, but outside of the building. So one size does not fit all. So I ask our folks who are listening in, our parents, to please keep that in mind. And the most important thing, and our head of our nursing staff and wellness, Lisa Cantor, she's here with us. She reminds us the importance of the community. This cannot be Thomas Tucker's plan or approach to opening schools, nor should it be the board or staff members. It needs to be a community all-in effort. And the community, as Lisa says, will play a big part, will play a huge part in slowing the spread of COVID-19. And now I am very pleased to uh, welcome our esteemed colleague. He's almost like one of our best friends, uh, Dr. Douglas. He's going to give us uh, some scientific background information in terms of where we are with the spread of COVID-19 in the state, where we are with Douglas County. Uh, as you know from the, uh, remember the presentation from July 13th, we were at a different point. And the point that Dr. Douglas did emphasize, and I tried to follow up, and hopefully I did a decent job, that was the case then. This virus is novel. It has a, a term of being novel for a reason. It changes. It, it's new, and things are evolving, folks. And so uh, although uh, we have one recommendation today, we need to be able to change to meet the challenges of this virus. And so without any further ado, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Douglas to please join us. Uh, uh, Mrs. Taylor, is he about ready? Uh, yes, good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Dr. Douglas, we can hear you great, and I know you're on vacation with your family and grandkids, and uh, we won't keep you all morning, but thank you. Thank you for your dedication to all the folks in the Tri-County area. Uh, <clears throat> my pleasure to join you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can, Dr. Douglas. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, terrific. And if you hear a noise in the background, it's my kids who are not, my grandkids who are not in school running around yelling. Um, <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed having a chance to uh, speak with uh, the board and Douglas County staff a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as Dr. Tuck Tucker said, I thought I would uh, go through some statistics about where we stand in Colorado. 
Um, that's really important, of course, to the decision about how to reopen schools since the level of community transmission will probably uh, impact what happens in schools. Um, as uh, David Ray said at the beginning, there is no plan that's going to eliminate risk. And I think that's something that we talked about really in, in all of our settings, that, that this novel virus is going to be with us until we develop sufficient population herd immunity. That's probably really going to take a vaccine. The good news about vaccines, as you have probably heard, is that we have really historically unprecedented work going on to develop those vaccines. We've got uh, four uh, very impressive vaccines that are moving forward that have already shown in phase one study of immunity um, look like it should be able to protect against infection. You don't know until you do the trial, so we'll have to see that. One of those vaccines is going to be uh, studied at the Anschutz Medical Center, so we in Colorado will get a firsthand opportunity to see what happens and even potentially take place. But until that day happens, we're going to be dealing with the unexpected. And so watching the, the data that happens in our community, I think, can really give us an important guide. Um, the U.S. really since Memorial Day, I think you're aware, has been on an, an upward trajectory. Uh, we are now experiencing over 70,000 cases a day. When Dr. Fauci of the NIH said in a congressional testimony a couple of weeks ago, we could expect 100,000 today. He even admitted that was maybe sort of an exaggeration. We're not there yet. But when he said that, we were at about 45,000. And we have clearly increased since that period of time. Colorado has been part of that upward trend. We saw sort of, if you will, what was our, our nadir of transmission, at least as measured by numbers of cases around uh, the sec uh, first and second weeks of June. And we've seen a, a progressive rise since then. For example, during the first and second week of June, we were seeing in Colorado about 150 cases a day. We're now up to about 550 cases a day. So that's statewide over a threefold doubling. The good news about that is that that's probably been, at least in part, accompanied by or caused by or rather contributed by uh, increased testing. Colorado is now testing at the target that we had originally projected, um, 8,500 uh, tests a day, although we now believe that may not be quite enough. Um, part of the reason we think that the increased testing has been playing such a major role in the Colorado story is that our hospitalization rate has actually stayed fairly low. Now, fairly low is not flat. We are still seeing about 35 hospitalizations a week, um, and that's an increase of where we were several weeks ago. That's the trajectory that was uh, followed or, or began to occur in the in the Sun Belt states that have been hit so hard. Uh, Florida, Texas, Arizona, uh, California, but also really now pretty much every state across the southern tier, uh, including Georgia, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, all seeing those sort of increases. And whether or not we are um, exceptional in Colorado and we'll see increased cases without increased hospitalizations and then deaths, or whether we are simply uh, later in the trajectory, I think is not clear. I'm an optimist. I like to believe we've done things smarter in Colorado. And, I, and as I said to you guys a couple of weeks ago, I think our climate helps us. Uh, we can be doing things outdoors a little more easily than you can if you're in a climate where it's so hot, you need to be inside an air-conditioned facility. Douglas County has followed a similar trend as Colorado. And over the last month or so, we've gone from about 10 cases a day in Douglas County to about 25 a day. That's not quite as big a proportionate increase, but it's still, you know, relatively hefty, a two and a half fold increase. The 14 day incidence rate, that's an important number that we end up following because that governs a lot of what the state is using to determine whether you're in a, a, a zone where, uh, Variances are, can be allowed to go forward. These are things that have allowed businesses and churches and other entities to open back up. Douglas County's 14-day incidence rate has uh, increased uh, similarly to its case numbers because the population hasn't changed. We're now at about 100 uh, uh, cases per 100,000 over a two-week period of time. That puts us in the high to very high 
incidence uh, uh, transmission or incidence rate level. Um, and in fact, Douglas County received notice uh, eight days ago that it needed to develop a mitigation plan. Mitigation meaning it needed to take steps to try to reduce transmission if it didn't want to have uh, alterations in its variances. Douglas County has been very successful in applying for and receiving variances. So far, 13 and the county would obviously like to maintain those and not go backwards. Um, so we're, we are at a high incidence point. But I do want to emphasize again that that is almost certainly due to lots of testing uh, because testing has gone up and hospitalizations have not. We are averaging around two hospitalizations per week, and that's not changed at all since the end of June. So I don't know whether we, we are seeing a Douglas County paradox where we see increased cases without hospitalizations. Uh, you guys know the, the mantra that you're the healthiest county in, in the country, really, by an average of health metrics. So if any county was going to experience increased cases without having increased sequelae, Douglas County, with the many advantages that it's got, is, is you know, one of those, is, is, is a county in which one might hope that one might see that. Nonetheless, I don't take that rising incidence right for granted because one thing I've been telling anybody who will listen to me is even if we aren't getting, uh, uh, seeing lots of sick folks and lots of hospitalizations, community transmission increases, uh, raise concerns about uh, uh, opening vital community institutions. And I've always said that reopening uh, education was probably the top priority in terms of what the county ought to be focusing on. So it's, it's uh, we are seeing uh, a high incidence that um, is substantially higher than where the county was about a month ago um, and does raise uh, concerns about whether we will begin to see some of the concerns that have happened in other states. Um, test positivity is an important metric that we follow because that tells us whether or not we're simply doing more testing and detecting a, a fairly constant level of transmission that had been uh, present. Colorado's test positivity level has been going up and uh, looks like it's now somewhere around six and a half to seven percent. I use that somewhat equivocal language because we've had, had a recent uh, increase in test turnaround. We're getting delays in test results. We've got some laboratories that service Colorado not getting us results back from anywhere from 10 to 14 days. The goal is 24 to 48 hours. So that, that turnaround has been extremely challenging. It's challenging whether you're an individual who's feeling sick and you want to know whether you have COVID. It's challenging if you're a public health department and you're trying to do what we call case investigation and contact tracing to try to prevent infection because that delay really uh, creates a problem. And it's frustrating if you're trying to track metrics because you've got, if you've got data coming in that slowly, uh, both case metrics as well as test positivity metrics can be delayed. Douglas County's test positivity level, which had been hovering in the two and a half to three percent, has now gone up, and that's about six. It's now about six percent. Again, that's important because that probably means we do really have increased transmission going on in Douglas County. It's not just we're doing more testing. And, and it's not just that we're doing more testing among people who aren't sick enough to hospitalize. We're there because the positivity rate is going up. We probably really are seeing increased transmission. So big numbers to keep in mind for Douglas County right now, 14 day incidence rate of about a hundred and test positivity rate of around 6% or so. Um, now I'm not going to speak uh, in detail about um, what Douglas County schools have been preparing for so diligently. And I, I really have to say again, uh, when I hear David Ray and Dr. Tucker talk about the engagement process you all have undertaken, it is just extraordinary how many, uh, 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 how much effort you've, you've undertaken and how much input you've received. I, I'm not aware of any other district that's, that's gotten such broad input. And I think it's really a, a fantastic place. As I think you're aware, we've got a couple of parameters that we can use to try to uh, uh, reduce transmission when schools begin to open back up. Um, none are perfect, and the more we can use all of them in sort of a uh, layered fashion, I think layered is the term of the day, the, the better off we can be. And I like to think about those layered metrics as involving distance. 
If you can achieve distance in classrooms, that's great. If you can achieve distance uh, by staggering schedules, that's helpful. If you can achieve distance by altering traffic patterns in schools, uh, uh, you know, grocery stores now have you know one-way lanes, and to the extent that schools can achieve movement of, of groups with that sort of uh, a process, that's useful as well. We can mitigate by reducing transmission, and uh, transmission reduction really um, uh, falls into four major categories. One is the increasing recognition that the use of face coverings uh, will substantially reduce transmission and probably uh, provide some protection as well. Secondly, uh, by screening those who are sick and encouraging parents to keep kids and staff, frankly, home when they are, are experiencing symptoms of COVID, one reduces the opportunity of the folks who may be heaviest transmitters coming into the school environment. Thirdly, we are realizing that uh, ventilation matters. Um, part of the reason, as I mentioned earlier, that Colorado has been able to maybe chart a different path in Arizona, Texas, Florida, has been that we can do more things with the great outdoors. And to the extent that we can take advantage of uh, air exchanges from the outside when the weather's not so cold and the pollen is not so bad, keeping windows open if possible if the building allows that. If it doesn't, then tr try to increase air exchanges with the outside. Um, and then finally, uh, environmental surface cleaning. We don't think that that's quite as important as we used to, but certainly high touch surfaces. We do know that hand to face transmission could play an important role. Um, and we want to keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, I know that you'll be talking today, at least I suspect you will, about the concept of cohorting. And this is really going to be probably one of your leading strategies in terms of disruption avoidance. By virtue of keeping uh, groups of kids in a small number, if, if a kid or a teacher gets sick, you've got fewer folks to have to worry about quarantining. Um, one of the things Dr. Tucker asked me about a day or so ago was whether or not, uh, given the use of the mitigation strategies by the, by the school district, whether it was prudent for school to start slowly <coughs> or whether it could be safely done in a slow fashion. I do think we're at a level right now where it is safe to restart the schools. I think slow makes sense because a lot of the stuff I've just talked about and that you all know actually a whole lot better than I do um, are going to take some practice to get right. And I think to the extent that schools can begin to figure out what it looks like to stagger movement, to a stagger space in classroom, to stagger traffic patterns, I think that's a smart strategy to begin to get things going again. And as David said at the beginning, you know, different people have different perceptions of risk. And I think one of the things that will, uh, in an environment when we know cases are going to happen, create some greater confidence is probably starting in a way that uh, manageable and that one can implement these strategies. So I think that the, the while the uh, community transmission level has gone up, I think Douglas County is in a place where starting schools in a careful way uh, does make sense. Finally, Dr. Tucker asked me about, if I comment for a second, about the community's responsibility to mitigate the spread. And I think the community's responsibility is paramount. Um, one of the reasons that Tri-County put out a masking mandate uh, a couple of weeks ago was that we felt that Getting transmission under control to allow schools to start was one of our top priorities. We saw good uh, compliance with masking. It was around 70% in Douglas County, but it wasn't as good as it could be in, in the healthiest county in the country. Now, we did it as an opt-out strategy because we wanted local leaders to get involved in helping to own it. the decision to use our mandate uh, Several cities, Parker and Castle Rock and Castle Pines, all decided to opt out. However, the governor issued his own 30-day mandate five days after we did, and our monitoring of Douglas County has indicated that mask wearing has gone up by about 15% during that period of time, which I think is fantastic because I think the more the community does its part, it's masking, it's avoiding large crowds, it's a thing. and frankly, it's taking the epidemic seriously. Um, 
I, th- I think the more the, that our broader community plays that role, uh, the more effective uh, our schools can do their primary job, getting the kids back and getting their education going. So thank you uh, very much for the chance to speak to you again. And uh, Dr. Tucker, if, if you'd like, I can take questions or I can let the agenda proceed. I'll uh, defer to President Ray and the board. Or if you all, the board sure. would like to ask Dr. Douglas any direct questions. I you know bet. He could get back to his grandchildren. Yeah, Dr. Douglas, first of all, thank you uh, for giving us your time. And we do want to honor your, your vacation time that has been well well earned based on all the work you've been doing these last several months. So, so thank you for taking time out. Directors, yes, let's, um, if there's specific questions that will guide us in our conversation today, uh, I would like to hear that. So I'm gonna start with uh, Director Chancho Shore. Uh, any questions for Dr. Douglas? No questions. All right, and Graziano? Uh, no questions. I would just like to, again, echo the thanks for Dr. Douglas uh, for appearing at two board meetings. Uh, been great. Very good. Director Hansen. No questions. Director Holtzman. Um, yes, actually, I have two questions, and hopefully they won't be too long. Um, thank you for being here again, Dr. Douglas. Um, my first question is, when we look at the positivity rate, and I'm looking at the website right now, that's based on um, the testing in Douglas County. And it says that the Douglas County testing goal is 515 tests. Um, I assume that's like per day. What happens when we're not testing that much? Because I'm, I, it, it could be that, I guess it's in the grayed out area, so I'm not sure. but. What happens if, say, we're not able to test that many times? Is, the, is that number, the percentage of 6% still reliable? Um, you know, I'm having a little trouble hearing the question. I think it had to do with Douglas County's targeted target of testing. And if, is, is the percent positivity reliable if we're not meeting that target? Was that more or less the question? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Douglas County has been increasing. It's not at target, but it's getting close. The county has got a number of strategies that we've been working on them with to increase that. Um, the, uh, the positivity uh, shouldn't really be biased by sort of where you are in the target unless you are um, uh, testing uh, uh, preferentially lower risk people. So, for example, if a bigger part of your testing is coming among hospital patients who are being tested really as a precautionary measure before they have pre-op or before they have elective surgery, that could drop your rate. Um, the real concern about testing has been that if you uh, begin to get higher and higher, it suggests that you're not uh, uh, sufficiently testing. You're missing people who may be sick. WHO, the World Health Organization, originally used 10% as sort of a cutoff, and they're now uh, dropping that down to around 5% or so. So Douglas County is, is, is hovering at about that level. Um, and, and again, that's, that's why it's an important metric. But in and of itself, um, the volume of testing really doesn't affect that much our interpretation of the positivity rate. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, My only other question is, um, as we go through our presentation today, I know that the recommendation um, really is looking a lot at our positivity rate. And I appreciate that we're looking at um, the current data. I'm also wondering if you would recommend that we also consider the incident rate per 100,000. if there's some way we can look at both of those or if just looking at the positivity rate is essentially getting at the same piece of data? No, I'd say they're both important. Um, certainly the, uh, <coughs> the state uh, uh, CDE got, makes reference to the various phases we are, whether we're at you know, the more extreme stay-at-home phase, the more intermediate safer at home, or the more relaxed protect our neighbor. And, both incidents as well as test positivity end up being fairly critical factors in that. I would say, honestly, between the two, it's incidents. It's the number of cases per 100,000. 
And we use test positivity as a way of determining whether or not we think that's an accurate measure. If that measure of 100 per 100,000, about where Douglas County is now, is occurring with a test positivity rate of 4, 5, 6%, that's probably real. If that number, if you've got 100 per 100,000, but your test positivity rate is twice as high, you're probably not doing enough testing, and that rate is probably even higher. So when I think about a dashboard of metrics, incidence is number one. Incidence, however, corrected for test positivity is number two. And then, of course, I'm looking at things like, are people getting really sick and getting hospitalized? So, so they're both important, but I'd say incidence is probably actually the more important one. Thank you. Director Grazina, was there a follow-up to that? Uh, I think Dr. Douglas answered it. I was, my question was going to be, since we know this is going to be a very fluid time, what are those key dashboard-like metrics to be looking at regularly? So if we hit a certain level at any of them, the district can pivot, you know, or I would imagine we'd have those kinds of ben, you know, benchmarks in place, but I think he kind of laid that out with incidents and test positivity. Very good. Thank you. Director Lung, questions? Well, again, um, I want to echo um, your commitment to uh, the public safety by uh, taking time during your vacations to come over and talk to us. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask you um, a question related to face masks. Um, we get a lot of email, um, send us the contradictory information about, uh, um, about how dangerous you know, face masks is you know, for students. And um, I, I would like you as a professional and science scientists and, uh, and, and authority in uh, Tri-County Health Departments just give us the fact about face masks and um, why it is important that um, the recommendations is have all the student wear them. Um, is it truly going to cause a huge problems? Um, I, I think I think the public deserve to know the truth um, and not the rumors that are flying around there. Thank you. Um, thanks for that question. I think I got it, but one of my grandkids was crying. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I must have struck out the whole thing. I think it was around face masks and the truth about them and how effective they are and their role in the school. Did I get that correct? Correct, especially for uh, younger children. Uh, um, and, and what kind of risk um, that, is it, is it um, yeah, you basically capture you know, what, what I asked, thank you. So, um, you know, the, the face mask has been, you know, there's probably no part of COVID that's been as fast moving in terms of our perspective changing and frankly as controversial as you use the face mask. So, of course, we went from, you know, late February, March, the Surgeon General CDC that said, don't bother. Dr. Fauci said, don't wear them, they don't work. And then about two months later, we begin to say, yeah, they actually probably do work. And, and so what happened really was the increased appreciation of the role of asymptomatic transmission when you simply couldn't stay home when you had a cough or cover your, your mouth or whatnot. Simply breathing could transmit infection. Um, secondly, bioengineering studies demonstrated pretty clearly that at least large respiratory droplets, the kind that we think transmits most of COVID, uh, can be successfully trapped maybe 50, 60, even 70% by cotton re reusable face cloths. Um, now that's gotten a little controversial with some observations recently that sometimes COVID can be transmitted by smaller sized particles, what are called aerosols. <clears throat> and a bunch of scientists wrote a letter to WHO about two weeks ago and said, you need to acknowledge this, that this may be a more important role than you've uh, uh, given credit to. It's likely that face masks won't play as much of a role in stopping those. And if those ended up being a bigger part of the attributable transmission, I would be less uh, of a proponent of face masks. Frankly, I, I think there are some cases where, where that happens. I think it's relatively rare. And I, I do think the respiratory droplet part of the equation has been the most important. Um, the third thing I would say is that we, we now have some real-world scientific experiments where states 
that implemented mandates early on were able to track what happened with face mask usage and, and COVID transmission and were able to demonstrate within a week or two some reasonably impressive reductions in transmission. Now, this is in the community setting, not in the school setting, but that said to me that it wasn't just a, you know, kind of an attractive idea that requiring masks might work. It actually seemed to uh, it, it empirically work as sort of a pre-post study design in about 20 some odd states who tried this out. Now, in the school setting, there, there's, there's lots of sort of ways to think about this. One way to think about it is that kids are less likely to get symptomatic than adults. And therefore, if you believe that masks play their biggest role in terms of preventing transmission from symptom, asymptomatic people to others, that's sort of a logical niche to consider using it. However, secondly, there is the observation that kids probably transmit less than adults. And that's especially younger kids, and that cut point appears to be around 10 or 11 years of age. And so I, to me, the idea of really trying to very stringently, as much as possible, and I know this is not going to be absolutely 100% possible, but as much as possible for older kids, requiring them to use face masks, I think fits in with that evolving understanding of the data. They're more likely to be asymptomatic. They transmit more than younger kids. That's a great group to be wearing masks. I think when you get to younger kids, I, I still think encouraging their use makes sense because, frankly, it's part of, a I think, a culture that, that we'd like to be promoting until we get a vaccine. But I do think that their uh, lower rate of transmission probably makes the use of the mask a little less important in that kind of setting. I'm realizing a lot of what I'm telling you now is, is sort of qualitative and not quantitative because... Most of the sort of integrated understanding of what face masks do is based on both laboratory studies as well as a growing but still small number of real-world studies that, that don't allow us to sort of really nail things down quite as much as I'd like to. I used to work in HIV, for example, and we had great <clears throat> numbers about risks of blood transfusion or HIV from blood transfusion or uh, uh, how do you get HIV through sex? We could really nail it down to the percent. We can't. We can't really do that with COVID, unfortunately. So we've got broader ranges. But I'm sort of giving you what I think is the best state of the science in terms of how we should think about them, both in general as well as with our kids. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Director Meek. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Douglas, for taking part of your Saturday and joining us again. Um, I do want to acknowledge that any successful opening of our schools with in-person learning requires a really strong working relationship with Tri-County Health, and we really appreciate the relationship. Um, and having clarity in our reopening plan on the metrics is really key. I appreciated uh, Director Holtzman's question around other metrics that might help guide that. Um, you mentioned the incident rate um, as a metric. I'm wondering if you have any further input on what those uh, cutoff rates might be for the different options that we're looking at in our plan. You know, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I, I missed the last part of the question. I heard you, you mentioned the incidence rate. Right. So. And, and, it, and its implications for your plans, but I couldn't quite get the question. Correct. Yeah, Dr. Douglas, I think what we're looking for is um, what should be the indicators for us to be more restrictive with strategies that we put in place? If you could just kind of, uh, we know we're watching the, the percent of positivity rate, but I think what Director Meek's asking for is what's, that, what's those incremental steps that would cause us to become more restrictive in our, in our strategies? Well, that's really... And I wish I had a better answer for you. I, I think what CDE put together is a good start where they sort of tried to stratify in general what uh, in-classroom strategies would look like uh, uh, by the three categories. Uh, one problem I have with what they've done, and I'm not blaming them, it's just a challenge, is that there's, there's a definition of what it means to protect our, or from, from safer at home and to protect our neighbor. 
its incidence, its test positivity, its hospitalizations, its public health capacity to do contact tracing and case investigation. Um, there's seven in total. And you, you either go into protect your neighbor or go out of it based on those. However, the safer at home, which is where we're at in Douglas County right now, is really much, much broader. And there's not really a clear endpoint to say when you move from safer at home to stay at home. Stay at home is what we were in March, April, when pretty much everything that was non-essential, including our schools, were shut down. And right now we don't really have sort of that clear dividing line. Um, I think a lot of it, honestly, is going to be experiential. You, you guys have developed a lot of strategies. Uh, the CDC and CDE and, have put out their guidelines. CDPHE is going to put out some outbreak response guidelines next week. We've been breathlessly awaiting these because they're, they're really important for the, sort of how, how schools are going to predict what's going to happen. I honestly think that <clears throat> we're going to be learning as we go about when we have a community transmission incidence or a community incidence rate of 100 per 100,000. What, what do we begin to see in schools? Do we begin to see schools with, you know, two cases a week? Uh, do we begin to see uh, situations where we have to close down uh, a class or even an entire school? And so I think that uh, it would be terrific to have a dashboard ahead of time. I heard an interview with Fulton County the school superintendent. I used to live in Atlanta, and so I was sort of tuned in on that. I thought he talked about having what's like a great dashboard. And I went to it, and... It's pretty good, but it's not really a whole lot more detail than what we have, which is pretty good, but it's it's not really good enough to give a super good uh, perspective guidance. So I, I, I think the honest answer to the question is we've got a broad framework. It's not as good as I would, if I was in your shoes, would like to see. And I think we're going to be trying to refine that as we begin to get schools back in place. Very good thing, Dr. Douglas. Um, as we summarize with you, Dr. Douglas, it, am I correct? I hear kind of uh, more caution for you in terms of how we strategize than what I heard before when you were when you talked at the board meeting. And, and I, I know you've always ex always um, talked about strategies, but it seems to me that get based on what you're seeing as far as trends. You know, I heard you certainly advocate for more distancing, more staggered considerations, more cohorting. Um, I've heard that emphasized more than what I heard last time where it was, well, the benefits of getting everybody in school outweighs the additional caution. So could you just summarize for me if that's, if I'm hearing correctly, or um, just how would you summarize as we uh, move forward with this work today? Sure, that's a fair question, and <clears throat> I may have come across less exuberantly <laughs> than I did before. Um, I want to say that I'm not really less exuberant. I do feel that reopening schools uh, is critically important. You guys know that. Um, I do feel that reopening schools where we stand right now is safe to do. Um, I have been involved in more conversations in the last two weeks about concerns of both parents and teachers and staff, you know, about how do we make this as bulletproof as possible? And the answer is, we know it can't be completely bulletproof. And so I, I think I maybe spent more time emphasizing the various levels of protection that I think, I know you all have thought about. I know the guidelines have, have suggested that districts think about. And I just wanted to emphasize those as what I thought were part of the parameters of reopening safely. Um, I still think that we're in a good place. Again, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'd like to believe that better community uh, buy-in to things like masking will reduce the incidence rate and, and give the school some more breathing room. So if, if I sounded uh, more cautious, um, uh, I think it was maybe the way I framed my questions. I'm still relatively uh, positive about what it means to reopen, but I want to you know, do so with... Uh, thoughtfulness about how we create the safest environment possible. 
Very good and well said and thank you. Again, uh, we want you to restore and re-energize with your grandchildren because we need you back here in Colorado as soon as possible to continue to guide and direct us. So Dr. Douglas, again, um, very, very grateful for your time and, and uh, conversation this morning as always. Thank you so much. Great, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I know you have a full day and uh, uh, good luck. You're doing fantastically important work and uh, uh, I uh, look forward to hearing the outcome of today's deliberations. Very good. Thank you so much, sir. All right, Take Dr. care. You too now. Dr. Tucker, it's back to you to continue navigating our day. Yes, directors. our road to getting to this point here. And uh, I am so appreciative. I'm so appreciative of our folks and their patience. Hello, and, Douglas County. Sorry. Yeah, I'm extremely appreciative of our folks and their patience in getting here. And I know um, a lot of folks' patients, uh, have, their patients have been really challenged. And I certainly understand that. But I also want to say that we want to be very cautious. We want to go slow rather than go fast. I am uh, certainly pleased that our major health groups and the Colorado Department of Education have, within the last 36 hours, given us further guidance. We didn't want to jump out and put a plan out there with all the details and have to go back and backtrack. We want to make sure uh, it's, it was steeped in common sense. It was steeped with co uh, community collaboration. As you heard from Dr. Douglas, there's not a community around here, and I'll challenge any community in the country that have gone through the process that we have in getting feedback and putting passion in. Not to say that the other folks didn't do it. They have great plans out there. But we wanted to make sure that we had the latest research. And our plan, which is on the district website right now, it's ever evolving. As Dr. Douglas said, the CDPHE is still working on guidance now. And once we get that newest guidance, uh, which should not be any major, should not be a major departure from what we have from the from Tri County or from the partnership, but we're certainly going to welcome that guidance. Now, without any further ado, I want to introduce our community uh, to our road to recovery, and also this video really exemplifies the thoughtfulness. Uh, that has really gone in, and then we'll continue with the implications of our plan. Mr. Seppi. Hello, Douglas School County District School family. District family. I am, I am Superintendent Thomas Tucker. As you know, our world drastically changed back in March. Buildings closed, events were canceled, and our daily routines were shaken up. It left everyone trying to figure out what does normal look like now? Douglas County School District has made it a priority to figure this out together. At the conclusion of the 2019-20 school year, we launched our Restart and Recovery Task Force. Nearly 2,000 applicants from the community applied to join us in safely reopening your Douglas County School District. From this incredible pool of applicants, we selected 200 people to serve on our task force focus group. The focus groups analyzed several topics, including hybrid models, e-learning, mental health, nutrition services, operations, technology, and much more. We conducted a comprehensive survey to gather feedback about how our community, the Douglas County School District community, felt about the remote learning we conducted in the spring. The 17,000 responses we received helped shape the Restart and Recovery Plan. It has helped us to develop a more comprehensive e-learning option that will be offered to families this fall. The information and guidelines we are receiving from our public health partners changes almost daily, and I do mean almost daily. So our plans will have to be adaptable and fluid to match that ever-changing landscape. With that said, we are committed to ensuring a safe environment for our students, staff, and families when we do return to school this fall. 
For a closer look at what that would look like, I'd like to turn it over to Douglas County School District's multimedia producer, our very own Christian Lean, to take us through The Road to Return. The Road to Return. It's been a road with stops and starts, and certainly more twists and turns and detours along the way than we could have ever expected. It has been very, very challenging. It's been challenging to plan, it's been challenging to accommodate. But the destination has remained clear. We want to have students back in the classroom, but we want to do it in a very safe manner. Preparations for this journey have been a community-wide effort. Surveys, a task force. We had around 2,000 folks sign up to be part of our focus group. There have been and will be town halls, conversations with medical professionals. It takes a village. Generally speaking, uh, people want to have students back in classrooms. Hi, guys. But it will, of course, look different than the last time you made the trip. I like the mask. Good job. Let's keep them on. And if your trip is on the bus. Since you guys are brothers, you guys can sit together. Just make sure that you are not having anybody sit in front of you or behind you. There will be social distancing and masks in place for the duration of the ride. Once you arrive, here's what you'll need to know. This is DC Oaks, a DCSD alternative high school that returned to school in July. It's great to be back. It's wonderful to have kids back in our building. Of course, the number one priority is health and safety. So here's what you'll notice. Good morning. Hello. A daily temperature check. 97. It's best done at home before you make the trip. However, thermometers are provided on site when entering the school. All staff will wear masks or face shields while indoors. Students will also be required to wear facial coverings while in school buildings and on buses. Physical distancing is in place throughout the building. Hand washing and sanitizing happen frequently, as well as cleaning and disinfecting. Sean here is keeping busy throughout the day. I'm doing bathrooms and, you know, it's, it's a really organized system. Teachers also have spray that they're taking care of, you know, all of the touch points in their room and in between classes as well. Visitor access will be extremely limited. Food will be eaten in the cafeteria with social distancing in place. You've done amazing. But what about the learning itself? It's going to be especially important that we give our teachers and our leaders and our families, as well, of course, as our students, the right tools and resources so the learning can continue. That's it. Perfect. We'll continue to have professional development opportunities. PLCs, our professional learning communities, will be in place in each of our schools, in person and virtual, whichever whatever the case might be. Parents and students will be able to choose between in-person learning and e-learning, with the option to switch after the first semester. For those that choose e-learning, they can expect a robust curriculum for them, specifically for them, so there is continuity and there is consistency in schedule. E-learning classes will be taught by dedicated DCSD yeah. educators. Did you say third law? Sorry. First law. Daily live instruction with the combination of also asynchronous, our pre-recorded uh, instruction as well. You've been doing an awesome job keeping up online. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good job, sir. Better than I thought. <laughs> Flexibility is a must in these times. With that in mind, DCSD is prepared to pivot into different models depending on the severity of positive testing in our community. You can find out more information on each of these scenarios on the Road to Return page on the district website. So how will DCSD handle exposure to COVID-19? Staff or students who do not feel well should not come to school. If a student or staff member tests positive, DCSD has very clear protocols in place to mitigate risk and to isolate and quarantine. Of course, ongoing testing is key to maintaining safety. DCSD is also working with other entities to partner with them to offer testing to employees and families as well. This road to return has been long and sometimes bumpy. With all the instability, we realize that everyone's mental health is important. We have been preparing over the summer and gearing up to provide mental health services to both the students who are in person and students who remain remote. Whatever road has led you back to learning, let's travel it with grace. Take it one day at a time and be as flexible as we can and give grace to each other. We're on this journey together because a new school year is on the horizon. Awesome job, Chris, as always. I understand the idea of returning students and staff to the classroom comes with great anxiety. It's a process and a responsibility we are not taking lightly. We are listening and we will continue to hear and respond to the concerns of our great community. 
We're here to address those concerns and answer any questions you may have about this process. In the coming weeks, we will conduct community and staff town halls, we'll respond to questions through emails and a continuously updated FAQ on our Road to Return landing page, and keeping a close eye on the latest medical data we're seeing from our public health leaders. Therefore, I encourage you to stay informed by visiting our website at www.dcsdk12.org forward slash road to return. Douglas County family, I want to thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for being an engaged and dedicated community. As always, I am deeply proud to serve as your superintendent. Yeah, I like that. Uh, as we continue to discuss the implications of our revised reentry plan, uh, we want to make sure that we highlight those things in the on the agenda that President Ray and the board members have asked us to highlight for our community. And we'll go through that very uh, quickly here. And in about one minute, we'll start to transition over to uh, staff to talk about those things that the board members in the community really want us to address. Uh, Director Ray, would you like for the board to hold us questions after each section? And we'll finish a section and then entertain questions? That's correct, yeah. That's okay if, yep. with the board? Okay, we'll get ready now to turn to our next section. And Dr. Tucker, I, um, I understand that we may have another solution for our remote board directors, and so I, I think this might be a time for us to take a quick break and try this, uh, another audio solution. So if we can take about a two, three minute break for a uh, five minute break <laughs> for Mr. Sethi to move uh, this box closer to the podium since oh. it sounds like now everybody will be coming to the podium to speak, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick five minute break to allow IT to, to do some changing uh, for our remote listeners as well as for Director Chancha Shore and Director Hansen. All right, five minutes.
Perfect. I think we Okay, we're going to go ahead and resume our meeting at 9.25. Um, we are beginning to reveal the many different sections of our reentry plan. Uh, Dr. Tucker, I'll turn it back over to you for introductions. Thank you, President Ray. This first section, Public Health and Safety Guidelines, uh, will be facilitated by Nancy Ingalls, personal, Personalized Learning Officer, and Lisa Cantor, Director of Health, Wellness, and Prevention. And we'll fill questions from the board after each section. Very good, thank you. Good morning, board directors. Mrs. Cantor and I will overview our public health and safety guidelines. Uh, we appreciate Dr. Douglas reviewing these and we saw uh, that these were also highlighted in the Road to Return video. Uh, the details of these guidelines, of course, will be in our written Road to Return plan. So we'll overview seven infection control and prevention measures that are recommended by our public health officials. Um, and our plan is that all adults and students in our schools and district buildings will be practicing these. So to begin with, physical distancing. The purpose of physical distancing is to minimize the number of close contacts that anybody would have. And so of course, we will practice maintaining six feet distance when possible in schools in our district buildings. Schools will also be work, working to organize students and adults to promote directional traffic and directional seating. They will work to um, avoid having large gatherings in any of our schools and district buildings. And they will also work to create cohort groupings of students to, again, minimize the number of close contacts that anybody might have. Regarding face coverings for students and staff, we know that the purpose of face coverings is to reduce the droplet transmission between people. And so in Douglas County Schools, face masks will be required for all students of all ages and all staff members. We ask that students and staff members provide their own face masks. However, the district will provide face masks um, if anybody is without one. And in addition, face shields will be provided for um, uh, instances where a staff member may want to double up and utilize a face mask and a shield. Or if there's a medical reason or educational reason that an adult or child may not be able to wear a face mask for some period of time, they could utilize a face shield instead. We will practice daily symptom and temperature checking for all students and staff. 
We ask that students do the symptom and temperature check before school, as well as staff. If there's a situation where the symptom check cannot be completed, it will be completed upon the arrival to school. We ask that our students and staff enter this data electronically. And of course, we can not emphasize enough that if any student or staff member is feeling sick, they should not come to school. Hand washing and sanitizing are very important, as we know, for killing germs. And our schools will be teaching and practicing these hygiene techniques for infection control. Cleaning, disinfecting, and ventilation, as Dr. Douglas said, is very important. And Mr. Cosgrove will be speaking in more detail about this in Section 5. Douglas County Schools in our written restart plan has clear protocols for isolation for people who are sick, quarantine for people who may have been exposed to COVID-19, and processes for outbreak. I do want to note that this, the State Department of Public Health will be releasing very soon, they have said at the end of July, more clear protocols for handling outbreak and that this would be a statewide standard. Currently, the process for reporting goes through our nursing staff and nursing staff collaborate with the Tri-County Health Department to determine quarantine and outbreak procedures. Depending on what guidance we get from the state, we will adapt to that guidance. And then finally, our school district is in the process of formalizing partnerships with community agencies to provide streamlined referral for testing for our staff. We will be partnering, partnering with Gary Community Investments to provide regular testing for all staff at no cost to the employee. Layered on that, we also are formalizing partnerships with our county, Douglas County, and Stride Community Health to provide priority access to community testing events, again, at no cost to employees. And then, of course, our employees and their families who are insured by our district medical plan have testing available through their health care providers at no cost. Our health insurance providers are waiving those out-of-pocket costs for our employees. So our approach to streamline referral for testing is, is threefold. Lastly, I'll have uh, Mrs. Cantor come up and give a few remarks, and then I think we can take some questions. Good morning. Good morning. I think Nancy and Dr. Douglas did an amazing job of describing the mitigation strategies that we would be able to put in place. And I would also um, emphasize that we have an amazing nursing staff and nurse leadership in this school district that already have processes in place for communicable disease protocol and um, reporting and collaboration with Tri-County Health in what that is. Where the difference comes in with COVID is that quarantining period. So um, those strategies will be um, outlined in our protocol and we already have a strong relationship with them and can call them at any moment to discuss mitigation strategies with regard to that. Very good, thank you Mrs. Cantor, Mrs. Ingalls, thank you. So Director, at this point our focus really is on the mitigation strategies. Um, some of the things that uh, both Mrs. Cantor and Mrs. Ingalls mentioned will also be reiterated later on in presentations from our human resources presentations as well as our models for learning. Um, but directors, a uh, question specific to the mitigation strategies that are um, uh, part of this plan at this point. I'll start with, again, Director Chancho Shore, and we'll work our way down the dais. Director Chancho Shore, are you there? Yes, no questions, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, Director Graziano, questions? No questions at this time. And Director Hansen. I actually am 
I'm wondering if we have general information on um, the challenges that we're going to have in limiting the sharing of devices. Do, do the majority of our schools have Chromebooks for each student, or is that something that um, is going to be a significant challenge? Ms. Zingles. Thank you. That will be addressed when we um, talk about the technology section later today. So hold on to that question, okay. Director Hanson. When we get to technology, we'll we'll address that. Director Hanson, were there other was there another question from you? No, oh, thank you. Okay, very good. Director Holtzman. Um, I think all my questions are going to be more relevant in later sections. So I have none right now. Thanks. And Director Lung, questions. Well, I'm not sure that is um, fitting here or somewhere else, but I'll ask anyway. Um, does the health departments like Tri-County or um, the state give you some sort of um, advisory uh, parameter to see if you have a positive infection rate of over a certain percentage, you should do online only. If you have a certain percentage, within a certain percentage, you should do hybrid. Or uh, if your load and certain percentage is 100% good to do um, um, in-person learning. I mean, do they have a, some sort of general guideline like this that, giving up, that is giving out? They're pointing to Dr. Tucker. <laughs> Thank you, Director Long, for that question. Uh, at the very end of the presentation, I will talk about that. But your question really gets at the heart of what uh, Director Holtzman raised in terms of building a comprehensive dashboard to use. There's no one single metric, whether it's incident rate, positivity rates, that we look at. There are multiple rates or hospitalizations. We are looking at that very closely with our contacts at Tri-County Health Department and with the State Department. Again, uh, we are uh, building upon the relationships that we have with those folks. And I'm looking forward to, at the end of our presentation, to talk a little bit about the dashboard that we are developing and to provide only, and I do mean only, some theoretical numbers we're using to help us decide whether we are uh, engaging in e-learning model, hybrid model, or in-person model. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Director Meek. Uh, thank you. Oops. Is there a requirement for testing? For teachers, I'm sorry, and staff. Um, with our relationship with Geary Community Investments, there will be no requirement to be eligible for testing. Uh, staff members who want to um, have a test would be able to have access through the Gary um, program, which is called COVID Check Colorado. Currently, the plan is, is that they would have that option twice a month, every two weeks. So it's optional for it, employees. Yes. <clears throat> and then I think my other question is really around the self-reporting that is both for staff and for um, students. Can you just speak a little bit more around um, how that looks and will work. We are still working with school principals to iron out the logistics of how that will work in schools. Currently, as it stands, we know that we have one um, school DC Oaks in session and we have um, staff working in our buildings and they're currently entering that information into a form electronically. With our partnership with Gary Community Investments, we will have an app available for use for our students and staff, um, but we are still working out the logistics of how exactly that would work. Thank you. Very good. Regarding physical distancing, I know we have had a lot of questions about that, especially from our teachers regarding the um, practicality of being able to do that. You know, it's one thing for us to say six feet apart. It's another thing if I've got a, a small classroom, you know, that does not allow that. Um, any, any thoughts regarding that in terms of how we enforce or what we can do for our teachers regarding that, that dilemma for them. One thing that's very important to remember is that all of these mitigation techniques are complementary and can be used in combination. And so it's important for teachers to remember that they can layer different prevention strategies in the event that one particular strategy becomes difficult in a certain situation. Very good. 
the more strategies you lay upon layer upon each other, the more protection feasibly you may have. Um, and so it's nice to know that when physical distancing is difficult in a particular situation, the masks, the, the directional traffic, the directional seating, the cohort grouping, the cleaning and disinfecting, all of those things are going to help mitigate that difficulty at that moment with physical distancing. Very good, thank you. And, and to piggyback on Director Meek's question, I know there, there's a lot of concern about the self-reporting uh, with regards to what's our backup plan, um, you know, should a child come with a fever? I mean, it, it, or if the parent doesn't insert that information before the child comes, um, what, is our, what is our plan in terms of responding to that scenario? The plan would be that the student would have an opportunity as they arrive to school to do that symptom check and temperature check. Okay, very good. And then the other thing Staff I would just well. um, question about is, is um, we had an incident uh, just a couple days ago where students outside uh, waiting to get in, in the school, hot sun, temperature check, and I, I think this is a question really is for you, Ms. Cantor, as well, is all of a sudden she's running a fever. It appears she's running a fever. So she gets sent home. There's, there's concern that she has COVID from her peers. Um, any, can you, any reassurance about how we can make sure that we're accurate and that's not just because I'm standing outside and my forehead is warm? Yes, this is a common problem that we've been seeing for, for staff members as well who, who check into buildings. And um, I think the strategy is without other symptoms, identifiable or known exposure, that we pull, pull those folks aside, let them rest, have a drink of water, and, and recheck again. It's, it's okay to do that. We understand that there are circumstances that artificially raise temperatures, and we want to give every opportunity for that to come down. Um, knowing that some people may walk around with a temperature or emerging illness that they're not aware of. Sure. So the, the purpose of this screening is to try to capture those folks and be as conservative as possible in preventing emergingly ill people to enter buildings. So, right. But right. absolutely, they can get another chance, and, and there's, there will be protocols and training in place for those uh, folks who are doing the screening to give um, staff and students another opportunity to pass that test. Very good. Thank you yep. for that. All right. Very good. Well, again, and, and one thing I will just echo that you said, Ms. Cantor, we do absolutely have the best nurses of anywhere and, and just so proud of, of our health officials that are in this district as well as you. You've been recognized by Dr. Douglas as one of the best as well. So we just uh, want to give you some accolades as well and, and your staff for all the work you're doing and will be doing as we navigate through this, these difficult times. So thank you, Ms. Zingle. Thank you, Ms. Cantor. And back to Dr. Tucker to uh, talk to with us or introduce us to the next section. I see Dr. Tucker is uh, managing the Clorox wipes to ensure that everything is sterilized before the next speaker. So just, just so noted. Absolutely. And we're not going to drink any Clorox either. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that too. <laughs> Now we're ready to go to section two, learning environments and delivery of academic programs. Uh, this is Erica Mason, director of our CIPG department, uh, will introduce the other outstanding, can, uh, other outstanding colleagues who will assist her in this presentation. And again, we will uh, address questions uh, at the end of the presentation and uh, Ms. Mason, I'm very pleased uh, that we're able to get several of our outstanding building principals in to really talk to us about their experiences so far and some of the things that they're excited about as well as their challenges. Thank you. Welcome. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. And as Dr. Tucker said, I will introduce my colleagues. Um, Danny Windsor is going to start us off this morning, and he's our Executive Director of Schools for the Parker Region. Um, we have on the phone, I believe, Molly Milley, the principal of Wildcat Mountain Elementary School. 
Katie Lynch, Northridge Elementary, Michelle Frenchy from Stone Mountain Elementary, John Vite from Castle Rock Middle School, and Greg Gochi from Chaparral High School. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Danny Windsor actually to start talking about learning environments. Very good. Good morning, Mr. Windsor. Good morning, it's great to see everybody as well. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank um, obviously the principals that are on our line, but also wanted to thank um, the principals that probably got tired of seeing us all summer long with providing feedback as well. Um, our task force were also a huge part of this messaging as well. Um, and just wanted to thank them for their time, effort, and commitment um, they've made as well. We would not be where we are today without that collective input um, in this process. Today, we're gonna be talking about a, a couple of just main variables. One, looking at learning environments, and secondly, looking at the, dilemma, the delivery of academic programs. Specifically within the learning environments, we're gonna look at things such as classroom setup, non-academic time, recess, and building visitors. From an academic programming side of things, we'll look at our learning models, professional development that's attached to that, and potentially what a day in the life of a student could look like. Within a learning environment, some of the fundamental components we're looking at are things such as furnitures. Um, I know that may seem very fundamental, but it's a huge part of helping us look at the social distancing guidelines and looking at the other health mitigating factors. And so we'll be looking at our classroom setup and how do we maximize social distance. We'll be working, obviously, to, uh, principals will be taking the lead working with teachers. Um, we'll also support um, our principals as executive directors to finalize some of these seating arrangements to ensure that we are trying to maximize all those health mitigating factors, um, one of those being social distancing. We also know in this um, potential environment as well as you look at social distancing, that cooperative learning could be impacted. A part that I know Erica will be able to allude to is we wanna make sure we provide continuous professional development to our teachers to help navigate what this new normal um, looks like for us. We also wanna be very aware of things such as toys and classroom items that can't be cleaned um, easily or sanitized and making sure that those are removed from the classroom as well. Other components such as instructional materials. As a building principal for a number of years, this was one of the first things that popped in my head is how do we navigate the materials of this process? And so um, we very much are going to try to limit the sharing of school supplies and instructional materials. Students um, who bring in their own materials should only be used by that student. In small cohorts that use the same materials, those materials must be disinfected or will be disinfected before another cohort does utilize that. Um, all students, um, as, as I think Director Hansen asked this question earlier, um, we are gonna be very much looking at how do we um, create a device checkout system for our students. And I know Mr. Sethi will be talking about some of those details as well, but it's very much something we need to think about and share in particular devices in this process. The other part, as a, as a former um, middle school and high school um, leader as well, one of the first things that came to mind is what about kids that show up to school? What does this look like about kids congregating and how do we keep them social distance? We're gonna work hand in hand with our leaders because each school looks so different to make sure that there are structures that are set up about creating spaces within libraries, halls, resource centers, and outside um, areas that can help um, create those social distancing areas. And so as soon as we get a better idea of what this look like, we'll focus on how we go about doing that within each of our individual schools. Recess and trying to make sure, as Dr. Douglas alluded to, how do we make sure that um, we stagger those times for recess and making sure that we keep those cohorted groups um, in a way that allows us to sanitize those particular areas. So school may stagger the use of playground equipment and should disinfect it between uses. Um, there are a number of details in which Rich Cosgrove and his team and Matt Van Dusen, who have been incredible at providing a structure of um, PPE that's gonna be provided our school to help do this. But we also are ensuring that students will wash their hands and sanitize their hands before going outside and before coming back in. Water fountains as well is another component that says, how do we ensure that we navigate this? Water fountains will not be permitted, however the water bottle fills. Um, could also be something that could be filled up. I know there'll be additional details on that. And as far as face coverings, we do say face coverings do not need to be worn outside. However, a big uh, disclaimer to that is also making sure we keep social distancing in mind as, this, um, as, as we look at this as well. Building visitors, we are very much trying to limit people, um, our visitors and volunteers and non-employees in the building during the school day unless it's absolutely necessary. 
Um, and this is a challenge as we have such an incredible community that wants to be a part of this solution. At the same time, we also want to make sure that safety is a priority in this process. Um, as far as delivery drivers, we are going to have designated areas within our schools for pickup and drop off. If they're entering the building, they will have their temperatures taken and will be wearing a face mask as the requirement. We're also looking at drop off spaces for outside and main office areas for parents to be able to place items so we don't have um, folks in and out of our buildings. We will have a system at our schools for checking students in and out during the day. Um, and that will look, at, it could look a hair different each of our schools because of the setups of what that looks like. Um, but again, if we do need to have visitors in our building, they will have their temperature taken and there will be a uh, face covering on as well. So I'm going to turn this over a little bit to Erica Mason to talk a little bit about the academic programming and the three main components which we've talked about, such as in-person learning, hybrid learning, and 100% e-learning. Thank you, Danny. So as Dr. Tucker mentioned and Danny just um, read as well, we have three main models of academic delivery. The in-person, hybrid, and our 100% e-learning. At any time, we might move into or out of one of these scenarios, with the exception that of, of our students who will have that 100% online choice at all times throughout the school year. We also know that throughout this, we will have to be flexible and agile in meeting our students' needs, and that we'll continue to assess this um, in a continuous improvement model as the year goes on. So it's important to note the coloring on these slides that indicate the different tracks for the models. Uh, they're not showing up very well. The two first columns are actually blue and the last one is yellow. So in paying attention to this, our 100% e-learning option is, like I said, available all year long for those families who opt for e-learning the entire year with the, um, with the option to reevaluate at semester. So the in-person and hybrid is important to think about as in-person, if we think about our in-person students, if there is a, t a time that we, there is a decision made to move to hybrid learning, there also could be for these same students a, de a decision to move into e-learning as well. So I wanna talk about the de definitions of each. In-person learning will look very traditional, very much like their in-person learning throughout a normal school year. A hybrid approach is when we have cohorts of students. This cohort would reduce the number of students in a building at a time to about 50% or even a little bit less because we consider those students who are in the e-learning option all year long. I think that alludes to what um, Dr. Douglas talked about in maintaining some of that distancing. Instructional delivery. So you can see in most of these that instruction is synchronous, synchronous most of the time. Synchronous means that the student is seeing their teacher in a computer um, or an in-person environment. Asynchronous is that learning opportunity in which students wouldn't be seeing their teacher live. They may see, be seeing a recorded video, working on tasks or activities. During a hybrid model, the e-learning days would be primarily asynchronous because of course their teacher is going to be teaching the other cohort at that time. The curriculum for our in-person and for our hybrid, and in the case that those students were ever to move into an e-learning, would be their typical school curriculum. And you can see the different learning platforms there that would support that curriculum for each of those. For our 100% e-learning students, they would have access to a curriculum called Edgenuity that gives teachers opportunity to um, customize content and still deliver synchronous instruction to those students as well as asynchronous instruction. And then you can see the learning platforms that would be available for those students. At any time, it's really important for our students to have consistency in both their curriculum and their learning platform. So for any student, that wouldn't change throughout the year unless they were in to move into that choice of the 100% e-learning option that is um, not an in-person piece, if that makes sense. In all three cases, attendance would be taken in Infinite Campus. 
These pieces are important, the grading and the attendance and the assessment are important to think about because we think about the difference between remote learning from the spring as we move into a rigorous instruction through e-learning as we move forward this, time, this year. Um, you can see then how students are assigned to their buildings and the teachers that would be teaching those students are all Douglas County licensed teachers as well. Okay, I'm gonna hand this over to Danny and also to our principals and EDOS to talk about the day in the life of the students as these measures would relate to those students. Great, thank you. So day in the life um, of what it would look like for 100% in-person learning. Um, what it would look like, students would be arriving um, at our schools and obviously we would be trying to closely monitor that. That could look like in staggered times um, as well, but social distancing would be tried to be monitored in place while also trying to ensure safety of students getting in the building. Um, we would, um, students again, would follow a typical kind of day within their normal class schedule between core classes, specials, and electives. Um, from a lunch side of things, I know um, Rich Cosgrove and his team will talk more specifically around what that looks like in our lunches and some of the precautionary measures we put in place, but they would be socially distanced at lunch. Um, and our goal is to, again, as we talked about, set up classrooms to be socially distanced and really being intentional as, students, as soon as students walk in with their mask on to be able to be assigned to seated areas that can allow us to practice that three to six foot social distancing and those other health mitigating factors. Um, to talk a little about cohorting, I'm going to turn this over to our assistant superintendents to talk a little bit about what cohorting could look like within our schools as well. So I'll turn this over to Mr. Knight. Good morning, board. So we've heard cohorting uh, mentioned a couple times this morning. We want to talk a little bit about what that would look like for both of our in-person options, both 100% in-person as well as a hybrid model. And as Ms. Ingalls mentioned earlier, it is one of a one layer of a multi-layer approach to make sure that we're keeping students and staff safe. At this point, we would look to cohort at, at an individual basis in working with our school principals. Obviously, cohorting in, say, a Mountain Vista High School might look a little different than a Northeast Elementary. But the goal would be to cohort students, whether they are on a bus, in the classroom, or in after-school athletics or activities to the greatest degree possible. This helps us both with uh, disease transmission as well as tracing at the end. Um, you see a chart here that was used with a state superintendent meeting just a week or so ago. In the graph you see on the left is the student in red is a, a positive COVID case. You can see if they cohort, we can actually limit that down to 20 students. So it's only 20 students who have a possible transmission as well as only 20 students you'd have to isolate or quarantine after the positive case was confirmed. Whereas on the right, if there was not cohorting, you can see now you have, I think, 80 students who A, are uh, at risk of disease transmission as well as 80 kids you now have to quarantine or isolate. So our goal will be the graph over there on the left to cohort kids to the greatest degree possible. But we understand that's gonna look different in each school. So we will work individually between school leadership uh, and our principals to develop the, the most cohorting possible in each of our situations. In looking at a hybrid model, in a hybrid model, we are talking about, um, and again, the task force has alluded to this and is also on our websites in our return plan, road to return plan. It's, it's a lot of language has been around the AB model, meaning that students would attend um, in person in a cohort, like a cohort A two days a week, and then e-learning three days a week. Cohort B would be two days a week, and then three days of in-person learning. So when you look at the chart that is there, you could see cohort A potentially could be in person on Monday, e-learning on Tuesday, in person on Wednesday, and then e-learning Thursday and Friday. Cohort B, you would see the opposite of what that would look like, where our Monday would be e-learning, Tuesday in person, Wednesday e-learning, Thursday in person, and Friday e-learning. Now, one of the concepts specifically around the hybrid model is really we would be operating more on a 50% capacity or less. Um, and so when you look at that continuum between looking at cohorting 
and capacity and how that's in alignment to different potential grade levels from elementary to middle to high. Our ability to control things at a greater level in our secondary schools can also be done through limiting capacity. What's another layer to this as well is we also are gonna be having students who have selected e-learning which potentially could decrease that 50% or less because more students would be doing e-learning as well. And so our ability to look at that hybrid model would be 50% or less, but could even look like 40% or less in a cohorting model, which then we could look at the other health mitigating factors such as six feet of social distancing. What does it look like and be able to manage that number of students in a class, while also ensuring you're keeping materials clean and safe as well, limiting transition times with a number of students in classes as well. So in this model specifically, um, we'll show you some examples of what it could look like um, around some of these models. But really during the e-learning day, students will be working independently on class, on class discussions, assignments, and projects that were previously recorded. And so we know we need to make sure that these lessons are accessible for all students, as well as when those regular times are, but also recorded for those situations where we're unable to also get on um, line as well. There'll be different video recorded sessions, they'll have an opportunity to be able to connect with teachers as well in person through different calls, um, but they also can connect with those teachers in a hybrid model where a teacher can control that rotation of, again, doesn't need kids opportunities to learn outside the classroom to then transition it back. And so again, there'll be regular continuous professional development to provide teachers with the tools to do these things. A caveat to that is with our center-based programming, specifically around our SSN students and our effective needs students where these students would be attending four days a week. Um, and so um, there is some cohorting we could obviously do with those particular students as well. But again, this is a hybrid model of learning. When we look at potentially um, what a day in a life could look like for a student in a 100% e-learning option. So again, we've talked about in-person, hybrid, and now we're talking about the third option specifically around 100% e-learning. Our goal is to try to be able to put some structure to this where students have the opportunity to have synchronous learning opportunities. And again, these lessons can be recorded for asynchronous purposes for students. But we really could look at this from an elementary perspective. From an elementary perspective, there'd still be an opportunity for students to be able to have literacy options, math, specials, and social studies, but also that opportunity to have kind of a morning meeting and conferencing with your kiddos to connect with your kiddos in a variety of different ways. Obviously, we wanna monitor what that screen time looks like. I think that's something that I think resonates, I think, with all of us and how we can navigate that. Um, but again, here's what it could look like from an elementary perspective. From a secondary perspective, you'd see some similarities, but maybe some of the, the classes look a little bit different in how it's structured. But students would still have the opportunity to be, take courses such as Algebra One, Biology, Advisement, other electives such as Drawing and Painting, um, English, PE, Geography, and we could set some different structures up for the students. And we've talked about Edgenuity being that option to be able to provide those elective-based programming so students still have the opportunity to participate in this. And so this is what a schedule potentially could look like. I know we have some leaders and principals that obviously can be able to speak to kind of some of these details. And obviously, I'd welcome any of our leaders to be able to chime in on this from um, um, Molly or Katie, Michelle, John, or Greg. Um, but again, these are some of the different options um, that are there as well. Mr. Windsor, can we ask our leaders to come in and start giving us their thoughts on e-learning, some of the possibilities and some of the challenges, uh, first starting with in-person learning and then moving on to e-learning. And I'm gonna clean the clicker and we can go back with a sample schedule, okay? Yes, sir. Is there a leader you want? So I'm gonna go back to the in-person side of things and allow some of our leaders have the opportunity to um, be able to speak to about what this may look like. And so um, I have you guys here on video. Anybody willing to jump on in between Molly, I see Molly shaking her head, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna let Molly jump on in. You're welcome on that one, Molly. I was just agreeing with you that we're welcome <laughs> to share our opinions. Obviously, this is a big deal for all of us and um, we wanna do it as well as possible. So, um, I guess just to speak to in-person learning, um, I think the greatest advantage of this is obviously having all of our kids uh, under one roof and being able to uh, teach them as much as possible because we know that face-to-face -face is so important. 
and that the uh, classroom community is so important and student interactions are, are really important. Um, it, it comes with a ton of challenges, obviously, because uh, we want to make learning as effective as possible for all of our kids uh, in person. And we, we you know, get concerned about things like, how do I monitor things? You know, what if I don't know if a child was checked um, by their parents in the morning? Um, how do I know that that kindergartner didn't get their temperature checked and might be coming in? Um, and how do I monitor that before they get into that same cohort? I think that's something that we wonder about. Um, I, I think about that cohort itself. Uh, and when I think of wanting to limit that cohort yet, how do I still provide the important services that students need like RTI intervention, um, special education, you know, small grouping, and knowing that that might mix cohorts. So does that, you know, kind of, uh, where does that cohort like live, especially if we're gonna put our kids in, in the lunchroom? all together. Um, I think that's just some, some questions that I have. And then just things, you know, that I think are really important, like disinfecting recess equipment is a great idea. Playgrounds are big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I wonder just logistically how, unless we strap Clorox wipes onto every child's hands, like how do we keep that um, going? You know, how do we, how do we make that feasible and possible? Because I think, again, the key that you talk about with in-person learning is you want to make it as normal as possible. And with that, we have to share and show, I feel like some grace, um, and not make kids feel like I am in this, uh, health bubble and that we're focused so much on these things that we can't, uh, can't even get to learning. So I guess that's just some of my input a little bit on the in-person itself. Um, Michelle, would you like to go next? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you, board directors, Dr. Tucker and Cabinet, for having principals here. Um, uh, very similar to Molly. I mean, my students, um, number one on the uh, forefront of what I think about every night, I feel like, um, and my staff. And my staff are ready and excited to come back. They miss their kiddos. Um, so obviously, in person, 100% would be ideal. Uh, but as a building leader of a fairly large elementary school, um, it comes, as Molly said, with a lot of challenges. Um, and so I just, some of the things that I stay up at night and think about um, are very similar to Molly. A couple of other pieces um, in the classroom, the social distancing piece, depending on your class size, that could be very different in elementary school. Um, we have in elementary, we have lots of fun reading corners and we have our kidney shaped table to teach guided reading. And we have, as you know, Nancy Ingalls mentioned, we have a spot in kindergarten for discovery. We have science experiments going on and understanding that it's going to look very different if it's 100% in person. Um, that social distancing piece is going to be difficult. Uh, and I know Danny mentioned furniture, that seems very trivial, um, but it isn't because we have a lot of elementary school classrooms that have double desks. We have a lot of elementary school classrooms that have tables because of the push for flexible seating a couple of years ago. And trying to navigate that social distance of that three foot marker. Um, I know that um, Nancy Ingalls shared, we can layer the protection pieces. So you have your mask and you have um, your social distancing piece, but I think that is going to prove to be a challenge. Uh, also, I would say the before school and after school congregating, not just at a high school level, but also at an elementary school level. We have a lot of, I have the most supportive community and a lot of our families walk to school together. And so we have, you know, a thousand people in front of our building. And so having to navigate that piece and then also the temperature check piece, I know Molly spoke about that. Um, and I, I did hear about the app, which I'm excited um, about. I'm hoping that the app will be able to tell us if kindergartner A had their temperature checked and the um, information was inputted. So the classroom teacher or the staff member that is actually taking the temperatures for our buildings, um, we'll be able to see, okay, which specific students were not checked. Um, and I, I think that's going to be a heavy lift for staff. I definitely do, depending on the size of your school. 
I, I can't even imagine, Greg, what that would look like um, over at CHAP, but um, I think that's going to be a heavy lift for, for staff as well. Um, obviously, 100% in-person learning is where we all want to be. Um, there's just a lot of pieces that go into that. Uh, thinking of recess and lunch, too, I know um, Rich Cosgrove is going to talk a little bit more about that, but the sizes of our cafeterias um, greatly differ, and um, because of that, that also proves a challenge because I know that currently right now we can split our cohort up and some can eat outside with tents, you know, and whatnot. Um, but if we can't layer the protection there because they're going to have to take off their mask to eat. And so they're going to have to be social distanced. Um, so just thinking about all of those pieces with a school that has almost 700 kids and 90 staff members is pretty challenging and keeps me up at night. Um, but knowing that we will be as safe as possible and um, that our, um, we, we care very much about the safety of our students and our staff, and so just trying to navigate those thoughts. Yeah, those are, those are great, great thoughts, I think, Michelle, going through, and I appreciate both Molly and, and Michelle articulating that. Like, with that same breath and some of that concept, what does that look like for you if we had to look at a hybrid model um, where you had half of the capacity that would be there with some of the concepts you were talking about. Okay, sorry, they were wanting to stay with one model at a time. I'll go back and see if anybody else wants to add to that from an in-person. John? Yeah, I can, I can share in from the, the middle school perspective on this. Thanks for, for having us all in here today. I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't disagree with anything that my colleagues have said so far with uh, some of those things we need to be looking at and making sure that we're um, that we, we can able to do and maintain. When we looked at uh, some of the pieces with the just logistics of, of the spacing within the middle school and we're looking at you know class sizes and then uh, adjusting and working with those class sizes in order to maintain social distancing, that's going to be tough with the average class size that I think that we have in middle school and a lot of our schools. Um, we can work to, to do the mitigating factors, obviously the mass and those pieces, but the, the class sizes will be, will be a challenge with the number of kids that we have in a lot of those classes. I think the other piece too, when we start looking at, and it was mentioned um, by Michelle as well about that arrival and coming in where we're, we're bringing in for a thousand in the middle school, how do we get them into the building and maintain social distancing and getting them to where they need to be to start their school day? Um, when we're looking at just some of that logistical piece of arrival, dismissal, um, passing period as well, we mentioned, um, it was mentioned in here about some directional hallways and those pieces. We can set some of those things up, um, but moving 800 students, 1,000 students through a hallway at the same time in order to, to pass the, the students will be really difficult to maintain that distancing uh, throughout that. So um, something that we've been working with as a leadership team at our school is brainstorming ways to, to mitigate some of these things. And we're still stuck on a few of them, but we're, we're trying to, to work through those pieces. Uh, lunch was brought up as well. Um, we're working with our bell schedule in order to um, add a number of lunches so that we can go from what we've been doing three lunches to move to four or maybe even five lunches in a school day. Um, not necessarily easy to do within our bell schedule, but we're trying to get creative with that bell schedule in order to mitigate the number of students eating simultaneously. It, it varies per school because everyone's got a different bell schedule and that's dictated by the size of the school as well. And so that adds complexity to it also with a middle school of 800 versus a middle school of 1200 students. And so it changes some of those uh, logistical pieces there. Um, and I think the other thing that we've been looking a lot at is our cohort size. We, in the middle school model, with the way that model works, we, we kind of inherently have a cohort created by our teaming. Uh, those teams are approximately 150 students typically on average. And so it gives us a cohort of 150 so that when we move students around within our core classes, we're able to maintain that cohort. Uh, it gets a little trickier and we start moving kids to electives because we can't always break those electives by that cohort within that team. And so we're really working with, okay, what are some of these ideas that we can do to um, create that cohort? You know, we already have it created, but to keep it smaller and not mix it at these different times in the day. So 
a few other of those logistical pieces that we are navigating and, and trying to brainstorm solutions to within the um, environment of being uh, 100% back in person. Although, like everyone has said, that would be ideal. That's the way we want to run the school. Uh, but given the guidelines that we have, we're, we're working through those logistical struggles. Great. Katie, were you want to add something? Uh, did you, were you talking to me, Danny? I was talking to Katie or Greg. If you guys want to add something to that as well. I'd be happy to. <laughs> great, great. Please go ahead. First of, all, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you our perspectives. And uh, Director Ray, I can't, um, I can't agree with you more. Your opening statements about we want we want to be in person with our students. We think that the best learning opportunity for a vast majority of our kids is in person and building relationships between adults in the building and our and our young adults in the classroom, um, you know, and we, and we do have EDCSD as an option for, the, for those things, for those students in which that isn't the best way to learn and they, and they have that opportunity. So I want to give a shout out to them. Um, so you can imagine the logistics of having 2,300 students in a school and, um, you know, currently we're looking at about, um, you know, after the survey results, and I'm, I'm sure people may or may not change their mind. Um, at the survey results, we're, we're at about 80% of our students that would choose to be in person. Um, and I think that's pretty consistent among all nine of uh, your traditional high schools. And so, you know, at SHAP, that, that means 1,840 students will be coming every day. And um, so if you look at the six and then seven mitigating factors or uh, mitigating um, to mitigate the spread of this, I I'm looking at them thinking, you know, one of them is something we can really do well, right? And I'm and I'm and I'm basing that on uh, our hat rule. <laughs> so we have a we have a rule where kids can't wear hats, and and that's probably our most effective hmm. rule that we enforce. And so I think we could get them to wear masks, and <clears throat> I believe they will do that. Um, you know, social distancing. Is, is, is a challenge. Um, if you look at the room that you, you all are in, in the boardroom, most of our classrooms are about half that size, and we have the same number of people in there that you currently have. So you can kind of get a feel for what that would look like. Um, hand sanitizing and hygiene, of course, we would do our best, but with as many kids as we have, you know, some bottles would run out and, and that sort of stuff. But I, I believe that would be something that we could probably also do and, and get our kids to commit to washing hands and cleaning uh, cleaning. Cohorting, however, is would fundamentally change how we do high school. So there are very, very few classes in which we do not have a mixed age group uh, within the class, um, sophomores, juniors, seniors, freshmen, uh, all together. Our elective courses, um, particularly, um, and also, you know, talking about staggered start times, I mean, uh, because, because not one cohort moves from period one to period two together. Um, if you start one period later, then second period is gonna be a disaster. So I think um, without fundamentally changing how we do high school, um, cohorting is, 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 is extremely difficult unless you look at the hybrid model, which I know we'll discuss later. Um, health screening, um, again, uh, I was just talking with Derek not too long ago about what they're doing. Uh, he's got about 60 kids that come in per time. They're looking at taking about 20 minutes to do the health screening for 60 kids. Granted, we've got more people to help, but um, we're talking probably about three hours to health screen all of our kids if we had to health screen everybody and then to identify who isn't, who is, um, how we record that, who's, who's monitoring that. Um, all would take a significant amount of, of human resource to pay attention to and to do our best to, to monitor that. Uh, disinfecting an extremely large building, um, without question, I believe that our, uh, our custodial team at SHAP is the best that there ever has been in the history of being. Um, and yet that would provide, you know, Unbelievable, you know the number of the number of times our toilets flush in a day is staggering, hmm. and um, you know being in there doing that, the 
if you've ever just walked down the main hall at any one of your your buildings like SHAP that you know that, that there's a rail that goes down that thing and, and um, it'd be like painting um, the Golden Gate Bridge. When you get to the one end, you'd have to just turn over and start going back again to try to disinfect all of those touch points. Um, and finally, um, and, and this is no, no uh, disrespect is meant to O&M, but our HVAC system is, uh, has, has issues and, and it's on, it's on, it's slated um, from the bond to, to be, to be updated. But um, I can assure you that there are classes that are extremely warm in the summer and extremely cold in the winter. And I would, I am concerned about the, the ability to turn the air over in there um, like we should. And I know, I know we were, I know that's a, that's in process of getting fixed. So if I were to look at all those mitigating factors with a full in-person learning, we have some, we have some pretty big challenges. So, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Katie Lynch, do you want to add something as well? Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll throw in some stuff. I think Michelle hit a lot of it at Molly um, at the elementary level. Um, a couple other things. Um, again, I, I think it goes back to, you know, what is best for kids and what is best for staff on keeping people safe. Number one, that is our rule in Douglas County is how do we keep people safe? Um, and so do I want all of our kids back in person? You bet. Like seeing their faces and seeing them grow and um, helping teachers make that happen. Absolutely. That is what we want. Um, is that safe to do at this time? And are we able to do, provide social distancing? Um, so the high school has, you know, middle school and high school has thousands of kids and um, how do you socially distance them? And then I think of like, well, you say, well, if they can go outside, we can, um, they can maybe take their masks off. But if you can picture little tiny bodies of six and seven, you know, even five-year-olds um, taking their mask off and then telling them that they have to stay six feet away from each other on the playground, like that's just not going to happen. It's not realistic to happen as much as we, um, I don't know if we want that to happen. Like that's part of growing up and having friends and things like that. And so things that we're planning um, at the elementary level for playgrounds would be things like having four areas. So if you have four first grade classrooms, that's a, each of those is a cohort. So what does that look like um, on your um, playgrounds? What does that what does that look like for kids? Do they have specific spaces? Um, I do have to give a shout out to Matt Van Dusen who um, is helping us with getting some of those supplies. When we're talking about the E23 spray, they've talked about what that spray would look like for playgrounds or large areas. And for parents that are, or staff that are watching, if you can picture like something that you would um, wash a deck with or, you know, like a big sprayer that you, if you were spraying, you know, lots of acres of yards and, and you're spraying things like that, that's kind of what Matt has, um, has been on order to try to do for our playground. So there is a system in place for that. Is it realistic to have social distancing and math with full, full people and, you know, full kids and, and, well, I'm not sure that that can happen, but I do appreciate the, the things that kind of we're putting in place to even, um, you know, move forward. Again, um, the other part when we're talking about um, keeping, like limiting your cohorts with adults, um, I do think it's important to think of the special education, the gifted and talented, um, all of those ELL students, all of those extra intervention specialists, RTI, um, coming in contact with those kids and those cohorts and what that looks like. Um, and so just, um, I think every, all my peers wrapped it up um, quite nicely. Just wanted to add in a couple things at the end there. I would also add specials for elementary as well. Um, our specials team of art, music, PE, technology, science, whatever specials that you have at your school, that would add to the potential um, cohort piece as well as the amount of staff members that have contact with those students. And Michelle, we have a, an elective model for our fifth and sixth grade students like a middle school or high school would have. So we would have to relook at that and whether that's best practice for kids and their safety at this time. And one little thing to add for specials, our hope is that just like we have, um, we're allowing kids to leave the classroom to go to lunch and, and things like that. Um, one of those pieces that we, we considered at our building was to create a larger, maybe shortened specials by a, a section of time so to allow for easier transitions so um, groups aren't passing one another in the hallway as well as time for teachers to um, disinfect or clean any supplies in between. 
I think it, it would be really valuable and it would be a preference for our specials teachers to have specials um, in their classrooms rather than going to different classrooms. And um, yeah, thank you. Great. Danny, if I might uh, yeah. pause Please. this for just a second. Um, I guess a couple of things. One, one is thank you, principals. I can't tell you. I, I know I speak. I think for all the directors up here to hear that our practitioners talk about the challenges of in-person learning is is really resonating with me big time right now. So I just want to thank all of you guys for being honest and candid and and really describing very very articulately the the challenges that we face with in-person learning. Um, I also appreciate. What I'm hearing from a lot of you is, okay, we, we can figure this out. We can figure this out, um, but this is, is this is a wall we just can't get over. And I, you know, I heard uh, Greg say, you know, one out of the seven things I can I can uh, comply with in terms of mitigation, but there's like six other things that we just can't figure out how to do that without turning this whole notion of high school upside down. So, so what would be helpful for me is as we summarize, because I think this might be a nice segue into talking about the hybrid model, is just to hear very quickly, how is in-person learning possible? So for instance, in-person learning is possible if I only have 50% of my kids on campus. In-person learning is possible if I have additional personnel to be able to have cohort groups meet in a private space to do lunch. In-person learning is possible, Mr. Gochi, if I have HVAC units that work on my frickin' roof, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I guess what I'd like to hear is what will make in-person learning possible? Because obviously, and maybe I'm jumping here, it does not sound like 100% of our kids can be on campus and we can honor the things we're being asked to honor with regards to social distancing and all the other mitigating strategies. I'm hearing that 100% on campus is not possible. So what I wanna know is what's possible? In order for in-person learning to happen, this needs to be put in place. Michelle? Um, I would say for my building, the basically what you said, <laughs> Director Ray, 50% um, of our students um, being able to be in person at a time that will help us not only train our youngest friends, um, but also help with social distancing and um, help with that cohort piece. Uh, I would also say additional personnel because of our budget cuts we did have to cut um, personnel. And so, as Katie mentioned, uh, sending five-year-olds outside uh, to potentially go to recess uh, and social distance and whatnot because they won't be wearing their masks, we'll, we'll need additional personnel to be able to um, appropriately and safely monitor our students at lunch and at recess and in the hallways. I think about kiddos going to the restroom and making sure that cohorts are not mixed in that area. Um, and then I, I want to echo what Katie said about Matt and his team. I, I think the PPE for our staff um, is extremely important. I know a lot of my staff are asking about plexiglass and asking about you know, masks and shields and whatnot. And so making sure that we have the appropriate PPE to um, safely, and when I say safely, I mean for our students and our staff um, to safely uh, be in person with a smaller amount of students. I do worry about the, uh, the safety of some of our staff because of the amount of kids they're going to be in contact with. So thinking about, you know, specials and bed and GT and RTI, um, and so thinking about different ways um, with that PPE to help support them. Um, but I definitely think additional personnel and and starting slowly, Dr. Tucker mentioned starting slowly. Uh, so 50% of our students um, in person, because as we've all said, we want our kids. We want our kids here, but we wanna make sure we're doing it safely. I know we can't mitigate every single um, scenario or issue, but we want to be as safe as possible because these are the lives of our students and our staff. Go ahead, Molly. 
Thanks. Um, Michelle, I think you spoke to it so well. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Ray, to, to, to think of like how you, how you worded it, which was how can we do full in-person learning with 100% of our students? In order to do that well, you're going to have to put um, a lot of cohort measuring re relaxed. You're going to have to loosen that up so that we can have SPED groups, so we can have RTI groups. Um, you're going to have to amp up the protective equipment that we use for our staff, um, like Michelle said. I mean, I personally requested, um, I want to make my staff available to teach as much as possible in the most effective way as possible. And sometimes that's going to be without a mask and it's going to be without, you know, it's going to have to shift to a, a face shield. And sometimes it would be to get close to a student to be next to, um, you know, having a, a tabletop shield, you know, sneeze guard kind of thing. So you would have to have that in place to make it work. Um, we would, like you said, have possibly have, have to have more personnel to be able to separate our, um, you know, our, our students. If we were really going to, you know, stay with like a small cohort, we would have to have that. And I think we would need, um, for me, that outdoor seating is, is key. Um, just having the opportunity while we've got great weather in Colorado and maximize that to make sure, you know, kids would be ready to be outside and learning and having some outdoor classrooms as well as lunch spaces um, that kids can access outdoors. We're all eating outside right now. When we, if you even go to a restaurant, you're requesting to eat outside. I would expect nothing less um, to offer that to my students. So those are just a few things, um, if you were to make it full-time, really ha happen well, uh, would be to, to, like, bulletproof your staff as much as possible because they're, you know, uh, potentially sometimes more at risk than even our students and, um, and uh, you know, allow for some, some money to come in to be able to, to make things more effective. Thank you. Katie? I think uh, Molly spoke to it about the outdoor um, seating and learning areas, and that um, is absolutely needed unless you have a building that's already at like lower capacity. Um, so I, I'm over 600, then you look at any middle school or high school model, um, they don't have the classrooms to be able to, like you can say, okay, you can only have a cohort of 10 people in a room. That's great. I don't have another room to put them in, and then I don't have another certified adult to put them in. So, um, again, it would be outdoor seating if we had that. That, of course, goes to other parameters of how do we make sure we're, we have the best security for what that looks like there. Um, but that makes it extremely difficult when you're trying to say, okay, let's take part of our, you know, a third of our class sizes right now. If you had 10 kids in a classroom, you know, a third um, of them, and then where do we provide the spacing for it uh, with tents to, you know, help with sun and things like that, not to mention seating areas. I would also say we would need additional, um, uh, we would need additional uh, thermometers. And I know we're talking about the app of getting that, but I think realistically having six thermometers in a school of 630 students is probably not realistic in order to get started. Um, and so that would be something that I would say would be important. I'm sure, I don't know what middle and high schoolers are getting, if they're getting like 10 or something, but when you look at the ratio of kids and adults using one thermometer, you're again, breaking that cohort um, as, you know, if, if you need to pass the thermometer, then that person takes it, but that's taking away from the learning. And the obvi obviously the objection or the, the part of it is to get kids in and to get them learning. So we don't want them standing there forever waiting to get into the building um, because they're in a line getting their temperature taken either. Okay. Anything else before we transition to e-learning, Craig? Yeah, I, I think I kind of outlined how difficult, if not impossible, it would be for us to come back with full in-person learning. So I think one of the, one of the other considerations is, um, you know, we talked about the full in-person learning of, of paying attention to who's coming and going throughout the day. And, and with high school students with the number of off hours for the juniors and the seniors, um, then that becomes very difficult. So, you know, the initial rush, of course, is for first period, but there's a secondary rush at second period as, as, as students start to enter. And then there are, there are students that schedule a fifth period off frequently so that they have an extended lunch. They can go to take care of whatever. And, or, um, and so that, that coming and going part is, is, really, is really difficult. And so if we, if we start to look at the hybrid model, one of the things that I would challenge us um, to do is 100% learning in person and 100% remote learning are, are this or that. 
uh, what I would challenge us to do is to look at the hybrid model to say, is it have to be this or that, right? And so what, what would that look like? And then the challenge is, of course, with the district as large as ours, what does that mean for um, high schools versus middle schools versus elementary schools? And what does it mean for Chaparral as opposed to uh, Ponderosa or Mountain Vista or, or whatever? So, you know, trying to get some uniformity in that, um, it, it really is a challenge. So I appreciate all the work that everybody's put in. And so I don't want to sound negative about it, but um, I just do think that there's some challenges and I, and I, and I challenge us to, to be maybe even a little go beyond creative once we decide what we're going to do uh, to go beyond to be creative about what that looks like. And then second, uh, finally, is of course, the virus is going to do what the virus does. And uh, we're going to have to be, you know, Dr. Tucker pointed that out. And I, and I want to just echo my support of his statement with that. Great. Very good. And so, Dan, I think and that's a great segue, Greg. Thank you. And thank you, principals. I'm wondering if we can take a break uh, for about five minutes. Uh, principals, can you hang in there with us for a little bit longer? Uh, I see most of you nodding. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to take about a five, seven-minute break, and then we'll talk about hybrid.
Ed, and, and resume our meeting principals again. Thank you for hanging in there with us. And um, at this time, I believe, Mr. Windsor, we're gonna talk about the e-learning model, and then uh, we'll talk about the hybrid model last. So Mr. Windsor, go ahead with uh, any introductions or yep. anything else you would like us to know. Um, I know as a collective group, we've talked a little bit about what e-learning potentially could look like in the varying schedules um, that are there. So we look at essentially secret and asynchronous learning. What I'd love to hear a little bit from our principals is, is how could we make 100% e-learning work? So anybody want to? Oh. Anybody want to delve into about how 100% um, e-learning could work, Molly? Um, so I'm assuming you're, you're thinking if our in-person learning students have to switch to an e-learning model, just to clarify. 100% e-learning, yep, you got it. Okay, thanks. Um, so what I think um, is gonna be most effective, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear the feedback and input from my other elementary, from an elementary lens, of what we're gonna be doing is uh, really prioritizing good training and use of an online platform uh, through Seesaw and Google Classroom from the very first day that we start school to get kids used to that. Um, and uh, the, now this is also saying, can we have them for, for time before we move to an e-learning model? Because I think uh, you're starting the year, and as our former principals on the board know, like you've got to develop relationships, three equals 33, right? And so we still have to do that. But at the same time, we need to equip our kids with how we're gonna manage this online system as we move forward. So integrating that into um, our daily instruction and making sure kids are comfortable with that is going to be key. Um, so that when we shift to an e-learning model, they're still riding on that same platform. They're not jumping into it or trying to start doing new things, um, but they are used to it and they know how to access assignments and that kind of a thing. Um, I also think we need to, as a district, um, have some expectations on uh, the live sessions that our, our uh, teachers provide for students. And so I would feel that, you know, I know um, with my own staff who did an amazing job, I believe with remote learning, um, they were uh, really effective in many ways of providing that synchronous instruction that you spoke of, that live instruction. And I feel like from our parent feedback, that was where they really felt like their kids were getting the most out of their e-learning was through those live sessions. So I would probably prioritize things like reading, writing, and math as live sessions that students would be required to go to throughout the day, um, and then possibly record those if there's a sort of a conflict of, you know, kids can't access that, that they would be able to access sort of that uh, Google, Google Meet or a, a Zoom classroom. Uh, again, classroom uh, meetings and community is huge, and, you know, that's something I feel like our staff really valued as well as just connecting with students and allowing them to connect with each other in an informal capacity. Um, but again, I think the key is having that online platform that you're used to using uh, is big. And uh, I believe we've been told that our, our um, in-person learning teachers will have access to Edgenuity, which is another curriculum resource that they could embed into their curriculum as they move forward. Uh, but then they're using that as a resource and not just kind of jumping from what their scope and sequence has been, but um, jumping in and using that as a resource. So in, some in, of my initial thoughts. Molly, I think you break up a good point. Uh, when we talk about this language of hybrid versus in-person versus e-learning, I think there's that part that I think you clarified about what if we had a transition to. What I would probably say for us to maybe focus to our conversation on this, I think you break up some, bring up some great points in transitioning to. If we had to talk about the students that are starting off in e-learning with the edgenuity as being kind of our platform we're utilizing, if you had to think about from that particular lens um, in that what's kind of the initial feel for you, what do you think we would need to do to, again, make that work from the kids that are selecting 100% e-learning right now and that edgenuity platform? Greg? Go ahead, Greg. So one of the things I, I think that I, I would like to clarify, Danny, and, and maybe I'm wrong, and so maybe I need to be corrected, but my vision of this is that if we have our model where we are offering both e-learning and some sort of either hybrid or in-person learning, 
then the e-learning, the, the students that choose e-learning would then be uh, working through Edgenuity and the rest would be done um, through a version of our, the, the best version that, of the SHAP curriculum or the Douglas, you know, which is, a, which is supported by Douglas County. If we went all 100% e-learning as a district or as, as a, a level within the school district, um, I would advocate that they, you know, Edgenuity is a great tool and a resource that should be used, but it should be supplemented and that I would expect that the SHAP teachers would be teaching the SHAP students. Um, and that may not be possible if we are in person with the remote learning option. Is that correct, Dan? So I think we're, we're, we're spending definitely the, the bulk of time on this part because I, I definitely don't want to confuse the two of, again, transitioning to where our teachers potentially could utilize learning management systems and what that looks like. I think what it comes down to is looking at that edgenuity side, the 100% piece, what would that look like and asking questions like, would that be our staff? What does that curriculum look like moving forward? And so I'm gonna have Erica maybe frame a little bit kind of going into it, but Greg, we absolutely wanna make sure we get to those particular details about how do we identify those things. So we'll, we'll jump back right into that here in a sec. Thank you, Danny. I just wanted to add a few clarifying pieces. So think about our 100% online students that choose that from the beginning. They will be using um, a learning management system, Canvas, and they'll also be using Edgenuity. We have the opportunity that at some point our in-person students may move into e-learning as well. They'll continue with their classroom, um, as Molly mentioned, their Google Classroom, and at the high school, the Canvas learning platform. But they'll continue, as Greg said, with their school curriculum. At the middle and high school, we will have Edgenuity available, but it will need to be supplemented, as Greg mentioned. And even for 100% online students that choose that from the very beginning, that can be supplemented also so that there is opportunity for synchronous instruction for those students. So I hope that adds some clarification. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, Molly. Is that, am, am I allowed? Um, so in talking about full-time e-learning uh, for our students that choose that option, I think, and that's where, Danny, I think I was wondering what, where the clarification was because if I choose 100% e-learning option from the get-go, I'm connected with my e-learning teacher and I'm building that e-learning classroom community and that e-learning curriculum. Um, so that's you know, probably why I wasn't very verbose in, in talking to that direction because that's your classroom. You're still a part of my school, but your classroom teacher is working with you um, here. And that might be a series of kids that come from school to school. And so um, I would trust that teacher um, to deliver the curriculum with fidelity and with excellence and with robustness as is our favorite word right now. Um, we all wanna be robust. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that's kind of where I see that. One uh, clarification question I have is that we have all, we've also told our, our Douglas County staff that if you are an in-person teacher, you are responsible for your in-person learning, right? Um, qu the question I have then is our special education teachers should also be in that same boat, if they are in-person special education teachers, that if I have a student who has special education needs, or for example, gifted and talented needs, that I would have um, an e-learning special education teacher that would also help with that curriculum. Um, and, and, and being the case manager for those students and meeting those set hours. Could you just, um, I just, I think a lot of our, my principal colleagues have not heard that clearly, and I think it's, uh, something that's really important to be addressed that we can't, you know, to ask a special education teacher whose caseloads are all, always very um, heavy much of the time anyway, and they've got such a, a huge commitment to their students um, just face-to-face, -face. like, could you clarify the e-learning expectations for um, our special education students, please? Hi, Mrs. Millie, thank you so much for that question. It really depends on the caseload and the special education provider. Special education providers often, um, their day looks a little bit different than classroom teachers who are teaching in front of kids all day long. And so depending on that provider's caseload, they may have some students that have opted for e-learning and they may be able to schedule themselves to deliver their services to their caseload that might be split between in-person and e-learning. In a situation where a special education teacher's 
day looks a little bit different and they're in front of kids teaching all day long, then they may need some support in pooling the staff that are working to serve e-learning students. As soon as we get the specific information about which students are opted for e-learning and which students are not, we're gonna be able to better determine how that will take place. But it is possible for a, either a related service provider or a special education teacher, depending on how their day normally looks, that they could possibly deliver both in-person and remotely. So as we're talking about the e-learning model then, Mrs. Ingalls, so you're saying that it is, uh, what we've said before is that, I think Mrs. Milley said, if you choose to be 100% e-learning, then you have an e-learning classroom and an e-learning teacher. But you're saying that's not, not necessarily the case with our special populations. You may not necessarily be assigned to a solely a dedicated e-learning special educator. It may be that that educator is doing both e-learning and in-person learning. It depends on the student. So if the student is educated in the general education classroom 80% or more of the time, typically their day is gonna look more like students without disabilities. And so yes, they would have an assigned e-learning teacher. They're gonna have access to that general education content like they would in person. Um, there are some students that are not educated in the general education classroom for most of their day. We also have IEP services that are different than that general education curriculum and those services could be delivered by the school related service provider potentially. So I'm not trying to be ambiguous by saying it depends, but it really does because all of these situations are individualized. Got it, thank you, thank you. I do think I, I appreciate the individualized um, approach to this because I do think, you know, depending from school to school, um, from uh, different, different needs, uh, that we want to make sure all of our, you know, students are getting the most effective education possible, that all of their IEP hours are being met. Um, and I think to be able to do that well on two platforms, both in person and, and on an e learning platform, is something that we really need to make sure we're taking care of our, our teachers our SPED teachers in, in providing that, as well as um, the students themselves. In particular, for example, an effective needs student, I envision my effective needs teacher supporting all of her effective needs students in person and one outside um, in an e-learning platform. And I can, I, can, I can imagine the challenges that that would, that that would provide. So I think that's something I as a leader I'd really like to um, get real specific on to make sure that we're not um, stretching out our SPED staff um, where it, it shouldn't be stretched out. So I saw John Weitz uh, hand go up and then uh, Michelle Franchi. Yeah, uh, to, to piggyback on what Molly was saying, I was glad that she mentioned the effective needs program because um, at South Rock Middle School, we have both effective needs and a, and a severe needs program. And just thinking about the getting the specific needs of those students and what e-learning environment would look like and still having opportunities to be able to support those students in person if that's feasible. So it's nice to be able to look at some of those other special populations and, and look at it very individually. Um, I wanna go back to the other question about you know, kind of what we would need for 100% e-learning and some of the things have been addressed already with uh, the platform um, having ingenuity, having a resource for curriculum, but then again, driven and instructed by our our teachers um, is is definitely a big component of that. Um, I start thinking about um, some of the logistics of that when we start looking at the scheduling piece, synchronous versus asynchronous, and what that looks like, um, and and having kind of an accountability piece to go with that as well. Like we would need grades, we would need attendance, we would need all of these pieces in order to maximize. Uh, anything it would, we could do to maximize student involvement and engagement during this time and um, in increasing that. Uh, I think the other thing that I haven't heard come up yet is looking at that scheduling piece when it comes to teachers, that we have a lot of teachers that have young students of their own and have students in their own house that they would have to balance their job as a teacher instructing in the schedule that we would have in an e-learning environment combined with them having their students in their own home um, while their kids are e-learning and the teacher is teaching other students in other schools in e-learning. 
and just finding good solutions and schedule to logistically make that work for a teacher within their own home in that environment. Thanks, John. And go ahead, Michelle Frenchy. Um, I just wanted to echo Molly. Uh, I, as a leader, I see how hard our staff work each and every day to individualize education for our students, um, all students. And for the special POP, the special education, GT, whatever, you know, ELD, I, I worry about overloading those teachers, having them do two different platforms. I think that is, if we talk about equity, um, I don't think that is an equitable, this, that, that's hard for me to swallow as a leader um, in terms of equity. And I understand that we need to 100% take care of our student needs. Um, but I also think that if we load two different platforms, and, and if I'm wrong on that, then just, you know, totally just say, Michelle, you're wrong. Um, but if we load them with two different platforms, I don't feel like they necessarily are providing their students with the type of instruction that they need because they are trying to navigate two different platforms as well. So I just, I would advocate for trying to find a different way Michelle, in that model. Can you clarify your question? Can you repeat that concern about the elementary students and navigating two platforms? And I, Mrs. Mason, I don't know if your microphone is on. Um, so yeah, so, so Ms., Mrs. Mason is just wanting a clarification when you say loading up with two platforms um, are you concerned about that in the e-learning model? Um, like I, maybe I'm wrong on this too, but, and so honestly, I, I thought this is what I heard, but so let's say you have a, a special education, um, teacher has a caseload of 25, let's just say, and two of those friends decided to do the 100% e-learning model where the other 23 are in person. So my special education teacher, my learning specialist, let's say, who has that caseload is then teaching in person to 23 and then also learning the platform of e-learning to deliver potential um, service minutes to the students that are on his or her caseload uh, through the e-learning platform. That was my, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to advocate that that I feel like personally as a teacher at heart, 100%, um, and as a leader, I just feel like that is a lot for a teacher to navigate, especially when, and, and knowing that kids' needs come first, but especially knowing that a second grade teacher doesn't necessarily have to navigate both of those platforms. So that was just my question, comment. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. And we would take that feedback back and work with Nancy and personalized learning to, to rectify that. All right, thank you, Mrs. Mason. Yes. So, Mr. Windsor, I think, so, so I think what we're trying to do uh, is exhaust the what needs, what do you need, what do you and your staff and students need in a 100% e-learning environment? Great. Great. So I, I just wanna be clear, um, Currently, our, our students are choosing between in-person and e-learning in the survey, right? So they, they, haven't, they haven't actually chosen yet, but they've, they've told us their preference so we could begin to plan. So are we now talking about the whole district moving to an e-learning 100% or are we still talking about what's happening to those students if they choose the 100% e-learning while an in-person learning is still happening? If we had to talk about it, the entire district, going to 100% e-learning. Okay. So one of the things that, I, if I can, I'd like to comment on that, is, at least from my perspective, is that one of the things that we do at SHAP, I think fairly well, is we encourage our teachers to take learner-centered academic risk, um, you know, to try things and to see how they work. I think we learn a lot from our failures. Sometimes we learn more from our failures than we we do our successes. And what I can tell you is we learned a lot <laughs> about what happened last spring. Um, and, and, I think, and I think we can be significantly better uh, moving forward. We've got a new uh, learning management system. So thanks to Marlena and, and the group for, for identifying Canvas. We've had um, some teachers that are beginning the process of developing that and looking at those things. And we have the experience of last spring. So I am 
fairly confident that given the opportunities that uh, we'll be significantly better with that. Now, granted, it's a new skill set, both for teachers and for students, remote learning as opposed to in-person learning, and, and, and there's some growth that still would, would need to happen. But in terms of the mitigating factors for stopping the spread of, of coronavirus, um, they're all taken care of with, with the 100% remote learning. Um, but we have to balance that. I think that the, the, the difficulty in, if for your jobs is that you have to balance that with what's best educationally for kids. And as we all stated before, in-person is significantly better. And that's why I would challenge us to look at, um, you know, if we were 100% e-learning, does that mean the building is closed like it was in, in March? Does that mean our teachers can still get in and, and identify those science demos and put those out for our kids so that they can answer questions? Does that give an opportunity for some of our some of our highest at-risk students um, populations to come in? Um, you know, at a very small percentage, you know, 10, and ask questions, get uh, get get some of the counseling things that they need, look at uh, look at some assessment uh, opportunities for both our teachers and our students and then developing that. So um, that's, that's all I had to say about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Greg. Katie? I come from an interesting um, perspective just because I'm a detail-oriented kind of person, but then I'm also that um, relationship girl too, and so it's a unique combination. Um, I think that if we go to, I have kind of two parts of uh, two parts of this. Number one is I do think regardless if they're doing, they choose the e-learning platform, or if we go to e-learning for a, a certain amount of time, I really feel strongly that they should have the teachers from our building. While I know that that's not possible with everything, um, I do think that it is part of the, the community. And Greg talked about his community at CHAP. That's no different than any other building community. And like, those are my kids. Um, regardless if I gave birth to them, um, they are my kids and I look out for them and I know their family histories and their stories and I'm connected with them. Um, and so for me as a building leader, that is huge. Um, I do have staff that are willing to um, provide that e-learning um, and they might not be required to provide that e-learning, but they are, are I, I think I can put together for the amount of kids that want it, I think I can make that work. Um, because again, going back to that relationship part, it's, um, while it, it, in the spring we did have, we had the benefit of having kids for three fourths of the school year. So they knew their teacher. And so when they're talking on a computer at them and saying, no, I know you can do it. You absolutely can. I believe in you. Take that next step forward. Um, they were like, oh yeah, my teacher really does believe in me versus somebody who they don't know looking at a computer saying the same thing is going to feel very different. So at least if they were in, had the same teachers that were in their same building, they would at least have a friendly face or they could say, hey, I talked to your teacher and she mentioned you're really great at this. How cool is that? Um, so I do think that that's important in making this work. Um, the other thing that I wonder is if we are, and I think you said if the whole district went to 100% e-learning, um, my I guess my wonder is this. If people choose e-learning options, they have edgenuity and they're, and they're using that and their staff being trained on that. If as a district, we decide that we're gonna do two weeks or four weeks or the first quarter or whatever, I mean, the Denver Metro districts are kind of doing their, their own thing. Are our teachers going to be using edgenuity or are they using their own curriculum um, so that when they come back and transition, whether that's two weeks, four weeks, a quarter, and they transition back into either the classroom, whether that's 100% or in a hybrid model, do they have the opportunity to just have that even flow to go? I guess that's the detail part that is um, maybe not so clear to me right now. Katie, those are some excellent questions. We're going to ask uh, Mrs. Mason to address some of those questions, especially a, a part about the rumor that we're going to have staff from across the district or staff members in Florida teaching our kids. Our teachers will be the teacher of record. So I want to ask uh, Mrs. Mason to go ahead and clear that up. And I'll also ask Assistant, to, uh, Assistant Superintendent Knight to speak on that as well. Thank you. And Katie, I'll start with a question about curriculum. And as you described it for our students, that if we were to move into e-learning for some period of time, two weeks, four weeks, those in-person students would have the opportunity to continue with their school curriculum so they don't lose that consistency, just as you described. And that was the intention behind doing that, so absolutely. And then I'll let um, Mr. Knight speak to the other piece. 
I think to the to the greatest degree, we will keep the teacher of record with kids. We will try and keep teachers within schools, within feeders, within regions. It's obviously going to differ from elementary to secondary, but it is definitely our goal to keep kids with the teachers that they are comfortable with in their own school. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate both of those answers. Um, I know that puts a lot of people um, at ease, including parents. I think one of the things that I'm hearing from parents more than anything is, but will I have, you know, a Northridge teacher? Will I have, you know, are they certified in this? Are they certified in that? And so it's nice to know that we'll do our best to be able to, um, to provide that to the greatest extent possible. Great. No, we very much appreciate the feedback on that piece. Director, if you're okay for transitioning into the hybrid option, yes. if you're all right with that. Yes. Oh, so, sorry. Director let, me, let me pause sorry. and just let me see what directors might have questions regarding the e-learning only model, and then we'll transition to hybrid. So I, I did see Director Holtzman, so Director Holtzman, go ahead. And I'm happy to save my question if we're going to be talking about e-learning again, but otherwise I have several questions. Please, please. Um, so just for clarification, when as we've been talking for the past 15, 20 minutes, we're talking about if the entire district were to go online only. Some of the students would be in the remote learning, edgenuity type of situation, and some of the students would have transitioned or would just be a part of their classroom if they were to be in person. So I, I guess I'm just having a a struggle with a lot of equity issues here. I'm wondering how much ingenuity costs. I'm wondering if students who enroll in remote learning with ingenuity, um, is their experience in terms of the curriculum that you're, they're getting going to be transferable when they may choose to go back to in-person? How are they going to be affected? I just feel like we're missing a lot of baseline data on the remote learning in general. Thank you for that feedback. And I can't answer all of those questions fully. Um, I can answer to the best of my ability on some of those. Um, so Edgenuity does have very and Dr. Hard... Mason, if you would get really close to the microphone, I think some are having a hard time. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, there, there's, we've been working with the company to identify the, the rigor that's within Edgenuity so that we can start to, and they have a, a described scope and sequence that we could then crosswalk back to our school curriculum. We have not done those pieces yet. We're just in the beginning stages since we've identified that in being able to move forward with them. That's certainly that was something that we could work on and, and bring feedback back to you. And, and so just to follow up, what's the cost of Edgenuity? Have we purchased that? Is there a cost to it? There is um, working with the CARES funds. I believe that that's in the eight hundred thousand dollar range. I'm going to come back to Director Holzman. I'm just going to do some randomness. Director Lung, Director Meek, um, if you have questions regarding the e-learning model. Did we? Allowed to ask questions for the in person also. I don't think you give them the opportunity to do that. Um, if we can focus on e learning, but, the, then, yeah, but in person has already presented. Yeah, but we, and we'll come and we'll give an opportunity for that. I'm sorry, but yeah, if we could just focus on this one, Director Long, and then we can okay. come back to in person. Um, we hear a lot of concern um, from uh, the last two months of the school years about the rush to uh, e learning and. Um, I mean, to be fair, because we, we were told to shut down one day and everybody just need to scramble uh, the best that they could. I mean, under the circumstances, I think you guys did an excellent job of that. But because of um, that abrupt decisions to move to e-learning and, um, and, and there's some negative um, connotations because of the last experience, if we have to move back um, to uh, e-learning, how can we assure um, our parents that this time we will do better um, than the last time? I mean, what kind of uh, lesson have we learned from last time? And how can we make sure that um, some of the students, for example, you know, um, the one 
who lead one-on-one -on -one lesson, like a severely student, will be able to uh, take care of um, much better. Thank you. I think the difference is in the spring, we talked about remote learning with our sole intent being to engage students and keep them just moving forward, just making sure we were engaging with students. We have been very intentional moving forward for the fall to talk about the pieces that might have been missing from the spring, such as grading, such as attendance, um, consistent scheduling with synchronous instruction, um, a purposeful look at, as Molly, I believe it was Molly talked about, a focus during those synchronous instructions on reading and writing and math. Um, so really being intentional about the academic piece we have a different focus moving forward into the fall than we did in the spring. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, let's. So, so I think what we're hearing loud and clear, and I heard it from Mr. Gochi as well, is that there's, uh, we've learned a lot during this period of time, and there's a lot of change, changing up that's going on, including standardizing platforms. I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened in response to that. But I, I appreciate the question, Dr. Lung, of the reassurance, something that this will look different than it did when we were just making sure the students remained engaged. Director Meek? Well, can I I'm ask sorry. a follow-up? <clears throat> sure. Well, I think um, from what I gather, people want to have a more concrete um, step that we will um, ratify the past situations. For example, you know, um, because of, um, we try to hold um, uh, no harm to the student. So we are saying that all the students in the last semester, um, they will not do better works than uh, the last grade that they have, which I'm sure that if this happened again, this is not going to be the case. Teacher evaluations, how can you make sure that the teacher will be evaluated fairly under online system? I think there's a lot of concern about that, especially the teacher is on a probation uh, status, because I think due to the circumstances, we decided not to give any teacher evaluations um, last time. But I think this is not going to be the case if we move back um, to online learning, right? I mean, um, and also, as Dr. Hose mentioned about the equitability issues um, for ESL student um, and uh, Fee and reduce lunch, you know, student. Um, the, so that is, um, I mean, I appreciate your, your answer. You know, I'm sure that you're going to have a much uh, better way of handling, you know, things. But I think, uh, you know, in times of crisis, people probably want to see more detail um, to make sure that they, 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 they know more and uh, you help them to be more um, settling by seeing, you know, what's going on, uh, and, and thank you. So yeah, so, so again, directors, I want to just remind us where we want to stick with questions. I heard two questions. One is, will student evaluation look different uh, when we go to an e-learning model? And two, I heard, will teacher evaluation look different when we go to an e-learning model? So those are two quick questions, and we'll do Director Meek, and I know we've got some other directors remotely that want to yeah. ask questions too. Yes, I'll be very quick in responding to Director Long's question. We do have a segment here in our presentation when we start to talk about policy uh, uh, implications, and we'll have Mr. Reynolds address both student evaluation and staff evaluation. So we'll have, that, we'll have time for that a little later. And we're still waiting on guidance uh, from that, but we've We've learned a whole lot uh, since last March. We were fortunate to get our students into the buildings with our great leaders and staff members to start preparing, not in just a day's notice, but we had a few days to get that ready. When we get to our recommendation, that will be a huge part of my recommendation, how we prepare to pivot uh, within learning environments. Very good, thank you, Dr. Tucker. Director Meek. So President Reid, I'd prefer to hold any questions until after I hear the, the other option, because I think enough. that will clear things up. Thank you, Director Meek, Director Graziano, and then we'll go to Director Chancha Shore and Director Hansen. Okay. Um, knowing that um, the delivery of e-learning is very different than traditional classroom learning, 
And tell me about if we were to do this for an extended period of time, what would be the implications for staffing, resources, uh, and our teachers? Because um, teaching uh, in an e-learning model is different than a classroom model. That's how we are, as a district are set up. What would that look like and would there be any implications or ramifications long term? Ask Assistant Superintendent Knight to talk about staffing, and there certainly will be ramifications in either environment. Thank you for the question, uh, Director Graziano. And I want to lay a little bit of a foundation that when we're talking about e learning, there are actually four variations of e learning. The one we're talking about right now is if a decision is made today to start the school year in an e learning format, that will have less staffing complications because we already have. Uh, you know, schedules, kids will just work online with their classroom teacher. If we start in person in any mode, whether it be hybrid or 100% in person, you have students who have chosen e-learning. That will have staffing implications and we are working with HR, our school uh, directors and our principals to find those teachers. We have a large number of teachers who have ADA accommodations who will make great e-learning teachers for those students. That will mean some adjustments, some adjustments in class lists, some adjustments in schedules, and most likely some additional staff that luckily we can pay for through COVID dollars. If we start the year in in-person and then we, we pivot back to e-learning, again, kids will just stay with those current teachers. So that should not have uh, staffing implications there. But Luckily, we do have those COVID dollars for some of those teachers. Um, I've used the example you can imagine at a high school level, if you have a, I don't know, a class like AP Calculus, you might have one e-learning teacher who comes from uh, Chaparral High School who ends up teaching kids from nine different high schools. We are going to have to replace that teacher for Greg at Chaparral. So there will be staffing implications so that we can offer uh, both parents and students the, the the mode of education that they're most comfortable with. Um, and again, that is a collaboration going on right now between our directors of schools and HR. And we are trying to marry those students with the teachers who we know um, are most comfortable teaching in an e-learning environment. Does that help? Yeah, I think it's a good start, a foundation. Okay. I mean, I think it's clearly like everything, it's fluid. It's something we have to, it's, we have to keep in mind very closely. So, very good. Thank you. Director Chancho Shore. Thank you. Actually, Director Graziano was touching very, uh, very much on my question, uh, specific to a clarification. And I think you addressed it as well as possible at this time. Uh, clarification for staffing impl um, implications, cost implications, um, how COVID dollars could be addressing those needs training implications and time for training implications. Um, those are my questions as well as I thought I heard, um, and I may have heard this incorrectly, did you say the curriculum cost was between $800 and $1,000 or $800,000? $800,000 for Edgenuity, the platform that you're planning to use for e-learning. And we have federal dollars to cover that price. So I think it's, thank you. It, it's interesting to just look at the cost implications um, that Director Graziano already brought up. And I would only add the training cost implications and training for time um, in relation to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Chancho. Sure, Director Hanson. I feel like I'm asking the same question a third, maybe even a fourth time, but I, I apologize. I'm just not clear on, um, I, I understand that if our district moves to 100% e-learning only, all of our staff are going to be dedicated as e-learning teachers. Correct. If we have the mix of some students electing online and some students electing in person, whatever that looks like, I do not understand who is going to be teaching those students who elect e-learning. Is it 
I, I think I've heard that it is going to be the teachers who have requested an accommodation. And I think I have heard that it's going to be a designated staff member from each building. And I, I need that answer very clear um, to me to be able to um, make that decision as a parent and as a board member for what, um, what this plan looks like. Director Hanson, your description as to uh, who would be teaching is actually uh, the correct answer. Teachers would not uh, teach both, be required to teach both e-learning online as well as in person. And I think uh, we need to continue to do a better job of emphasizing that. You, you will have a track of e-learning teachers. These are teachers and students who've already decided that they want 100% e-learning. That's a track or what we're now calling a cohort of students uh, separate in, of, in and of itself. As you stated earlier, if we all go to 100% e-learning in folks, that is very much a possibility. We're seeing that happen uh, across the state, across the country. And it will be all hands on deck and it will be based upon certification. It will be based upon teacher need again, student need driving this. Uh, you're here later in regards to staffing. Amanda Thompson will talk about staffing and who and how we select people to fill those spots. I'm gonna ask uh, Mrs. Mason to come forward again to paint a clearer picture, much clearer picture than I did in terms of what that e-learning looks like in terms of teachers delivering the model. May I defer that to Mr. Knight? Absolutely. Try to think how to how to say this a different way. So in in an environment where we start out the year in person and we have that cohort of e-learning teachers, um, I, I have used this example. Imagine a, a elementary school with four first grade classrooms that each have 20 kids. And in that school, 20 of those kids choose the e-learning option. You can simply just take one of those first grade teachers who's maybe requested an accommodation or would like to teach online, they become the e-learning teacher for those 20 kids. You simply recalibrate out those other three classes and now you have three in-person first grade classes of 20 and one e-learning class of 20. Those kids stay, the e-learning kids stay with that teacher for the semester and then at semester if they wanna switch back and forth if things have changed or they could stay there um, through the duration. That e-learning teacher, that's their class. We are working through ways to make sure those kids still feel connected to the school. We are working on ways to make sure that staff member still feels connected to the staff. But they will have their cohort of kids. They will have their curriculum. They can move through it, and I'm sure we will work to, to make sure there's communication with the other first grade team so that they can stay as in step as possible but they will have, as Erica stated, additional tools, additional uh, platforms at their disposal if, if, they, if they need to use it. We wanna keep that as close as possible because if at break, 10 of those kids decide, hey, something's changed, I'm ready to go back into the classroom, we don't want that to be uh, too much of a disconnect. Very good. So. Director Hanson, that's, that's pretty clear to me. I'm wondering if it's clear to you. How are you feeling? percent clear. Will one teacher from each grade level at each school then be designated as an e-learning teacher or is it going to be a collective group and it may not be any teacher from your child's school of enrollment? Well we don't want to answer that question yet. We're looking at the data uh, from both staff data where we've asked staff uh, what environment they uh, prefer and then again we'll have a uh, Mrs. Thompson talked more about that. And that's why the student data was so important and that window just closed. So we're gonna uh, look very closely at the student data, the preference uh, by students. We'll look at the staff, the accommodations we need to make. And I think Erica mentioned that earlier. This is still a process that we're figuring out uh, and we'll have it figured out very soon now that the window uh, has closed. Very good. All right. Director Holtzman? So the answer, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Director Hanson. Go ahead and finish. I just wanted to try and wrap that up. So the answer basically is we don't know, and uh, it will hopefully 
all come together with the number of teachers who request to be e-learning teachers and the number of students who request to utilize e-learning. Yeah. The, correct. The answer is that it's a it's a work in prog a work in progress, and the Douglas County School District, like every school district in America, is trying to figure that out. Except for those who've already started e-learning, we are very fortunate. We have a jump on it. Our parents have and our students have filled out the surveys. And remember, uh, staff, parents, it is not definitive. If you said yes, I want absolute one hundred percent e-learning. It's just data, a data collection tool. Uh, you'll hear Mr. Sethi talk about it a little later with technology that we'll go through and students will actually register. So uh, very clearly, it is a work in progress. And I'm glad we have the tools in place to begin to really refine what e-learning looks like, who's going to be in e-learning, or any of the other modalities. Very good. All right, Director Holtzman, go ahead. Yeah, so I just need some help understanding um, a little bit more about the value of edgenuity. Um, I've, I've heard it, but I have no idea what it is. And 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 I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a preschool teacher. I, I'm not a principal or a lifetime educator. So I, I do know that we have Canvas, which is a learning management system. And this sounds like a curriculum resource. Um, I guess my question is, as a board member, my duty is to be a financial steward. And so I just need to know and I don't doubt that the decision is correct, but I just feel like I need to be given the information as to why the $800,000 of CARES money will be designated for this expense rather than um, supporting our staff and therefore our students in some other way. Like, I just need to know the value of that expenditure. They offer, especially starting at our high school, let's, let's start there, they offer a comprehensive curriculum and content that our e-learning teachers could use to support the e-learning. We know that that was challenging, um, making sure that people had a, a full um, set of content to be able to use it in an e-learning environment. It has content to support all of our world languages and math, all of the sciences, um, AP classes, um, many electives classes, like it, it's comprehensive in that it covers most of those high school needs and middle school as well. One thing I didn't mention um, as part of that comprehensive package is it also offers a comprehensive curriculum in SEL and in, in social emotional learning as well. And so that would also be available um, either for teachers to be able to embed within their instruction or for a counselor to go in and deliver as well. So that's part of that comprehensive package. That'll also be available to our middle and um, high school teachers if at some point those that are in person also need to be able to pull it into to their content as well. Just a couple of follow-ups. Um, I think I know that if a student elects e-learning at the beginning of the year, the PPR for that student will stay at the school that they are enrolled in. Um, so, I. I guess my question, I have so many of them about this, but um, who, which administrator will be um, responsible for the, the online only e-learning edgenuity election? Will that be each principal will be responsible for their staff member or will there be another administrator of that e-learning edgenuity school? Great question. We're working on a team that would come together to have director and a strategist type of person to support that also using um, COVID funds. Hasn't been developed yet, but is in talks to be able to support that. Thanks, I'll make it quick. Um, so if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching in the edgenuity remote learning, and I'm sorry, I know that's not what it's called. I'm just a quick way to right, right. designate it. Um, online school, this resource is available to me, but I, I'm sure I must have the flexibility to supplement with my own curriculum, other resources. OK. Correct. And then I guess final question, and I think I heard the answer, but is edgenuity available to our other teachers, the ones who are not designated for um, the e-learning remote edgenuity side? Middle school and high school. At middle school and high school it is. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Yes. 
Very good, thank you. So directors, I do want us to conclude the e-learning piece, and I, and I do want to just a quick uh, reaction to the questions Director Holtzman asked about edunuity is that I think it really does respond, Director Lung, to your concern about how have we increased the quality of that remote learning experience. And certainly, uh, when we ask about the value of $800,000 being invested, that's the answer to the question. Uh, we're, we're improving that experience by investing in that kind of a resource for our teachers. So, so I think that's just one way we can see evidence that we have learned and we're providing our teachers even more resources to make that even a better experience. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and transition into the hybrid model then, because we've seen both ends of the spectrum. We're looking for some middle ground. So Mr. Windsor, go ahead. Great, no, thank you. And, and I, I wanna be able to refer back to um, our particular slides around the um, hybrid side of things. So again, to kind of wrap your mind around it, because again, a lot of these things, excuse me, can blend with one another here that it's hard to, to frame. So again, talked about 100% um, in-person, 100% e-learning. Now we're just talking about hybrid AB option of what that looks like. So when we look at the slide in particular here, again, it's talking about a student to, to be able to um, again, meet two days in person in one cohort, three days again online, and the other co cohort on opposite days, which would allow us to reduce our capacity in our schools to roughly 50% or less um, to then talk specifically about how can this maybe support or help us in those health mitigating factors around social distancing, um, and again, managing transition times, lunch times, all those different components that are there. So I just wanna wrap our minds around that being a, a hybrid learning mo model. I think our principals alluded to, again, in the 100% e-learning, they kind of were talking about what would we need to be able to do this. And so I'd like to frame this question for our principals about as you were thinking about the 100% e-learning um, e and potentially looking at an AB model in particular where you could see a reduced capacity at 50% or less, what's the initial reaction in looking at a you know, how does this help or support this idea of keeping our students and staff safe? So I'd like to turn that over to one of our principals. Katie? Um, I think when we talk about the safety parameters that we put in place as far as like social distancing, um, room in the classroom, things like that, I think it's much more doable with a hybrid model when you're talking about 50% or less of the population. Um, I think it's much easier to, um, you know, have locations that kids can go to when you're when you're down. You do have staff that will be there. Um, the majority of staff would be there. Obviously, some are doing the e-learning um, option and things like that. I think um, one of the the biggest questions I have, and I just learned that the ingenuity would be available for middle school and high school teachers, even if they were doing the in-person learning. I'm wondering what the additional cost is for elementary teachers to have that as well. Because um, when I look at the hybrid model and I think of um, I think of the spring, our teachers were working so hard to try to figure out how to do, um, you know, Zooms and, and provide authentic curriculum that um, was worthwhile for kids and not just busy work. Um, they're going to be double planning because they're going to have their in-person kiddos and they're going to have their online ones. And they're, it might, in, in someone's head when they're planning, they might think, oh, yeah, well, whatever you teach on Monday, you're going to teach on Tuesday. But it doesn't really work that way because on Monday, they potentially might be doing the same uh, work um, that the kids are doing in line. Or it could be just that it's practice from what they're having and they have online platforms such as STEM scopes and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, the other concern that I think about is what does this look like for teachers that have young kiddos? So we've got um, teachers that will be teaching in person uh, five days a week um, while also providing lessons to um, the, I, well, I want to say remote learners because they're not e-learners because they haven't chosen that for the 100%. Um, what does that look like for their, their kiddos at home that have kids that can't be home by themselves? Um, so is, you know, my initial thought, are, are, is base open? Um, is it open? I don't know where we would house them in Northridge. I'm just asking the question. Um, but if, if base was an option, could we do base for staff kids that get first priority? Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I just know that that's the teachers coming to me saying, well, how am I going to make this work? Um, I do think it is going to be a lot of work to plan both. Um, I know that teachers always step and rise to the occasion, so um, they will be prepared. And my hope is that we would give them enough training so that they would do right by kids, both in person as well as remotely, and being able to switch um, and so that it's not just busy work on the days that they are 
um, doing their e-learning or remote learning at home, but that it actually is um, authentic and, and rich in curriculum. So if I may, just so again, we're, we want to really frame this as what do, what do I need to make it work? And so two things I've heard uh, from Katie is one is I, I need a resource like Edgenuity to be offered at the elementary level for, for um, our students when they are on that off day. And the other need is uh, care for teachers who have younger students. Um, so if we can move on to other people that are there principals who can communicate to us. Go ahead, John Veit. Um, you know, when we look, start looking through the lens of what do we need, because I start looking at this and I, I'm thinking about all those mitigating factors and I feel it in this model as opposed to the 100% in person, I can get closer to all those requirements that we're looking at um, as far as the social distancing piece. Um, I would have a shot at social distancing my lunchroom when I look at this because I was I've been doing the math on something like this because you got the e-learning at about 82 percent. So if I take my average or the I mean 18 percent, so I know that there's a certain number that will just choose e-learning, the rest with the in-person. So if I cut my class sizes in half, but yet I'm taking that other 15 percent out of there as well, it starts putting a class size at I don't know 12, 14, 15. And I can start, I, I can visualize managing this more easily and start seeing a, a chance at a hallway passing period be social distance more um, and start seeing some of those class sizes work. But I will say as that, that, that piece that is in need, I still need all my staff. I mean, that's what it comes down to because if we have all of these, the, if we go to this model where it's at every other, I still need all my teachers in order to get those class sizes smaller. I still need enough staff to, to staff the lunchroom to do those things. So I know there's potential of, of losing some of the teachers to do the e-learn, not losing, but having them doing the e-learning so they wouldn't be in the building to support this model. Um, but I would need those staff. I couldn't do it with less staff in order to maintain all these pieces because I wouldn't have the rooms, the classes, and all those things in order to do so. Great, great, great. So of course I've got to say something, right? Um, <laughs> I apologize for this. Um, this is this is the section in which I think we may need to be more creative than looking at just simply a two-day A B rotational model for some of your high schools, because I think you know if you t if you take um, you know currently we're we're at about 1850 to 1900 of kids who have not chosen the e-learning model and have chosen in person, which I would assume would grow actually if a hybrid was offered. I think some of, some more kids would choose to come to that hybrid model rather than the full e-learning. And so you're talking about 900, uh, to anywhere from 900 to 1,000 students. And then, um, so the lunchroom is still a concern. The hallways are still a concern. However, the classrooms are, are significantly better, right? So I think some of those things are, are true. But I do wanna come back to the, um, the question that I think Director Hansen had asked about the e-learning option, and yeah, there are so many questions that still need to be answered with that. And I know where the the data is just now coming in, and I I think we were hoping for this beautiful balance that Ted Knight described of having, you know, four classes and one full class choosing not to do to do remote learning, and then that being matched up with one teacher who would prefer to do remote learning. And if you look at the high school level, um, and, and, I, and I'm sorry, because I just don't know about middle school or the elementary, so I apologize to my colleagues on the, on the call, but you know, our, our kids um, have seven different teachers in a day. And our teachers have five different classes in a day, and most of them have two or three preparations. So that means that not if a teacher goes to teaching remote, we're talking about two or three different classes and now that I have to cover for the people that choose to be in person. And I think those are, those are difficulty. And then um, what do we do with staffing that? We can't just, you know, even if we could just move those kids, that um, I'm sure my, um, everybody's master scheduler right now is running to the uh, cabinet to get their Pepto-Bismol or their antacids because we're, we're talking about really uh, affecting the master schedule with this. So I, 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 I think Director Hanson, I appreciate your, 
your question and your and your push with that because I think those are things that we that we we are facing. Um, again, I just would emphasize that that the hybrid model is much more doable in terms of trying to keep people safe at school than the full in person. It, it still presents some challenges. All of the things that my colleagues said, you know, you know more staff. You know, even if we had the money for more staff, finding those people is, is difficult at this time, um, uh, particularly with some, some of our high needs areas. And so um, this is where I, where I would advocate for us to either look at being, you know, being creative and looking at what are some opportunities for different levels or different needs of schools and, and then how important is it for us to, as a district to be unified in, in how we offer a hybrid model. So clearly we hear the, um, the need for staffing and creativity around staffing. So I, I think that's well established and, and that's uh, a well articulated need. What other needs, principals? And I see Chancho Shore also wanting to jump in with questions. So as soon as we hear from principals, we'll jump into director questions. Go ahead, uh, Michelle Frenchy. Uh, just to piggyback a little bit on what Greg said in terms of logistics, I think that um, to help my families and to help sort of mitigate the logistics around this, helping with scheduling. So I'm assuming that if I have a student who goes to my school and also Ranch View and also Thunder Ridge, that we would all, we need to make sure that those kiddos are on the same or in part of the same cohort. Um, and so knowing that, um, I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a, a piece that we could have help with, um, and then also just for clarification pieces, or the d disinfecting in between. I think the hybrid model would help with that disinfection um, component, and then just clarification. And I'm I'm certain that maybe Rich is going to talk about it later of who's going to be doing that work. Um, if that's going to be the classroom teachers, um, which I worry about that just because that's another you know, piece of their day. Um, but if, if I think about all of the models, hybrid is by far um, the model that I can see as a large elementary school that we can put into place where our students and staff are safe and we have some form of in-person learning, which is what our kiddos um, des desperately need. Great, very good. So Mr. Windsor, if I may, I'm going to go ahead and let a couple of directors jump in with some questions. Please, yeah. uh, Director Chancha Shore and then Director Hansen. Director Chancha Shore, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want some points of clarification, please. Ingenuity is the curriculum that we are discussing, correct? Mrs. Mason? Yes, Ingenuity. Okay, and that's the curriculum that comes out of Florida. Am I correct again or not? I don't believe so. I think you're thinking of the Florida virtual. There's, there's, a, different there's a different curriculum called Florida virtual. Um, um, is this ingenuity the one that outsources teachers or is, I, I still don't understand the answer to will there be outsourced teachers or will they be Douglas County teachers? They would be Douglas County teachers and part of the cost as well is the professional development for them. So we would prioritize their training and have talked with them about how to prioritize training for our Douglas County teachers. Thank you, that answers my question. All right, Director okay. Hanson, go ahead. Is the presentation complete or do we still need to um, finish that before we go to director questions? Uh, go ahead, Director Hanson. Okay. I greatly appreciate the day in the life of a student example, but I'm wondering if we could do the same for the hybrid model in the day of the life of a teacher. I am just really wondering how a teacher is going to have a small group of their classroom on a Monday and have a small group of that same class doing online learning that same day and still keep our promise to our teachers that they will not be responsible for both in-person and online lesson plans. So we're looking for a schedule. I see Mrs. Millie, Millie's hand. Uh, Molly, 
go ahead and insert, and then we'll make sure we get Director Hansen's question answered as well. Is what does a teacher schedule look like in this model? Go ahead, Mrs. Milley. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to address that, what that hybrid model sort of looks like and how you manage that and how we're envisioning that. And Dr. Ray, to go back to your original question, which is like, what do you need to make these things successful? I think the ideal situation in a hybrid learning model is that a te teacher is focusing her attention on teaching those students in class and providing as much direct instruction as possible, modeling, um, guided practice, so that when their students go to that e-learning the following day is that they're putting those things into practice through independent practice. Um, and as a result, you need to be able to have your teacher free to teach your Tuesday students that come in, uh, um, ideally in some of that same way. So I do see it as you're teaching Monday students directly and giving a lot of that direct instruction. And those kids are practicing independently. And then when I have my kids in front of me for Tuesday, I'm teaching them in the same way. And so you create a feedback cycle of saying, I'm teaching you in person, you're practicing independently. When you come back on Wednesday, you're getting that feedback cycle. And then we're jumping off from that point to teach you some more. And then the Thursday kids come in and we do that same cycle. And then together with that e-learning option on Friday, I probably do some live synchronous sessions with all of, all of my students together. But you, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head when we say, I've got to put my direct attention on focusing on those kids in front of me. And then we need to utilize any kind of extra staff support that we have and possibly use CARES dollars to, to provide more for schools that need it through, through EA support or um, other personnel in the building support to do that e-learning option to provide kids some of that support as they work independently through some of those tasks. Um, one of the questions I had that was listed in the hybrid was uh, that we would have asynchronous recorded sessions for kids that are on the e-learning side. I don't know where the logistics of that come in because if I'm teaching in person, when am I going to have time to teach uh, and record a session independently because I'm spending my full day with those kids. Um, Very good. So, so things that we would need there's possibly more personnel and, uh, to be able to support those e-learning students and guide them through that independent work. Um, but that's, that would be the, one of the greatest uh, challenges for sure of the hybrid. Thanks, Molly. And I see Greg's hand, reasons. but I, I want to just pause and see if staff had any other clarity. So right now, Molly's vision is that the e-learning days for the cohort group is done independent. It's not yeah. done with the teacher doing both groups. Is that staff's understanding as well? That's correct. That's been the conversations we've been, we've been having. And so Molly, I think articulated that very well. I think the, um, the asynchronous recording lessons, I think that's that part of Molly talking specifically if it's that Friday and creating opportunities for kids to engage, um, to be able to record those lessons that kids have access to is something that also could be a part of that process. The big part we'd want to make sure though, is that we're making sure that one, we will allow our our schools to also kind of problem solve some of those opportunities, I think, as well, because there are some uniqueness of each of our schools. So, very good, Mr. Gochi, go ahead, jump in. Thank you. Uh, I uh, so at 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 our level, I think we would do things completely different <laughs> than what Molly described. So, I I envision the life of the day of a teacher in a hybrid model would be that the presentation of material would happen um, remotely, right? And so uh, through a wide variety of, of resources, Khan Academy, YouTube, all of those things, there are opportunities for kids and uh, obviously for teachers' demonstrations and, and presentations to occur remotely. And then the in-person aspect of that hybrid model, I see would be um, the education about the application of those things. Right. So, what does this mean? What questions do you have? How do you uh, how do you carry that forward? That and then you know, obviously in science, the lab work uh, would probably dominate a lot of the a lot of the in person day. So, I just wanted to share a different perspective about about what uh, what I see that happening. And of course, there are some things that nobody presents quite as well as a shop teacher. So, those things would have to be done <laughs> in person. Can I add one little thing that I think we forgot to mention is just simply that online platform that all kids are going to be, you know, really needing to rely off of when they're in a hybrid option. So the kids that are 
in person are working through the, the assignments and things like that, um, as well as the people who are out of school working side by side on that online platform, um, you know, no matter where they are, is that they've got that as, as their main resource and that they're kind of stepping off of that platform both in class as well as in the e-learning option. And one last clarity is sort of what I believe Dr. Ray kind of brought up was um, that edgenuity. I believe we were told a couple of weeks ago that that would be an option for all of our staff to use as a curriculum resource to, to be able to um, bring into their units and bring into the, the curriculum that they are uh, overseeing at an elementary level. And so I'd, I'd love some clarity on that too, because especially if we do go to a full e-learning model, um, if, if the need arises, that we've got an additional resource for our staff. This is Mason. Yes, so I wanna first touch on Molly's point just to reiterate exactly what she said about um, the in-person versus the e-learning days being able to have those students in person to support them on getting oriented to their learning platform is a huge piece of that as well. And then to her other question around edgenuity, we've just been in the conversation of, of working through that contract. So I have the feedback on here to explore that pricing. Um, but we do have, the, the intention was for schools to be able to use the curriculum that we just purchased recently with their math and their phonics and the science and so on. Very good. All right, Director Meek. Do you, so, you mind if I add one more? Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Windsor. Hey, um, Greg, I did want to kind of get back to you as well. When you start talking about that flipped classroom model as well, too, I think those are very much options, I think, in this process where I think our schools know what that looks like best for their staff. And so the goal is not to have exactly one way just because there are those dynamics. I think the accessibility of consistent learning management systems with this, which Molly alluded to, is something that's a key part of this. Greg also alluded to that as well about having that common practice of our learning management systems for our professional development team to also provide resources. And also more importantly for our kids and our families to have consistency um, in accessing that as well. So I appreciate you bringing that point up as well. Okay. Sorry, direct me. Right. So understanding that minimizing disruptions to education is a goal that we're all talking about. I'm wondering um, from our building leaders perspective um, in a hybrid model, you know, what that transition looks like if we need to go into quarantine and how you would work that and how it works with the online e-learning. So really the question principles is really that shift of, okay, so now we're in the hybrid. Now we're required to go full-blown e-learning. How does that transition happen? Molly, go ahead. Oh. Or, I'm sorry, um, I, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, unless somebody else wants to take it because there's a lot of smart people in this room. Um, I, I think when you shift from the hybrid, again, you have your foundation of that online platform that your kids have been using both in person and on their off days when they're just at home doing their e-learning. Uh, so when you shift to that full e-learning cycle, um, you've got to kind of like we talked about before when we have to go full e-learning, you, you're gonna set up live uh, synchronous sessions with your class to do direct instruction, but you're still using that online platform where you've got your assignments and the things that you're going to be getting essentially grades and feedback on. Um, and that's going to be something kids are used to using. Uh, and because of the hybrid model, ideally, it's going to be a, a much more seamless transition. We also have to remember that a lot of our kids have used these platforms in the spring. And so um, it's not going to be, I don't think, a huge... Uh, heavy lift, you know, and they're super smart anyway, these kids and technology, you know, to be able to shift them over. But that's where we then kind of put in place that e-learning um, expectation to say, you're gonna teach those, you know, those core subjects of reading, writing, and math in a uh, live session and record those and, and continue to provide feedback in that way, your classroom meeting. So um, I, I know it's not, it's never our ideal situation, but I think it, um, as long as you're using these things in tandem, uh, it'll be an easier transition. Go ahead, Greg. Gochi. So um, thank you. I, I think one of the things, a couple of things that I, I, I want to share from my perspective is, first of all, Dr. Tucker and I had a conversation recently about the potential of opening with a first week of having 20% of our kids coming in every day and 
in that way, starting to build relationships. I know it's not as, it's not what we would, you know, hope for. Obviously, that again, I want to keep that keep that in the forefront. But that gives the people an opportunity to put names to faces, to establish what what's expected, and then moving to a. a and then I my thought went to if we had to remove to remote then as well. So, I uh, I think it's a lot easier to go from remote to hybrid, to in-person than the opposite. And I think that, um, I think that moving back and forth is, is, uh, is definitely a challenge. And so I, I very much appreciate the question because that, that's a, if, if it looks like we're going to have to go to remote in a week or two, then we should start there. I think the second thing that I, that, that, that question triggered in me that I, I think should be considered is, what happens if or when? And if I look at a high school, is what happens if a kid is, does test positive, right? And without the cohorting, that a teacher then will ne- need to be quarantined, and that that then takes five classes out, and then that student was also in six other classes besides that one classes, and it wouldn't in that one class, and it wouldn't take long for for a positive test to rehabilitate. Uh, a school's ability to do to to do this well. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Um, just something came in my mind. Mr. So, Mr. Gocha, you don't. So the cohort model, even with the hybrid, you see some significant roadblocks for a high school schedule. Yeah, because uh, uh, you know, if a kid would go through seven classes. We'd have seven teachers then that would need to be isolated. Gotcha. And so they couldn't teach the B cohort if the kid was in the A cohort. Gotcha. Dr- Director Meek? So I'm not sure if this is the right time, but I, I guess where I, I am a little confused is it seems like if we do hybrid, we've also said parents who choose to do e-learning can do e-learning. So there's really two options that are available. Do we have the resources? Do we have the number of teachers required to be able to fulfill that? If we're to do, if the if the choices were either hybrid or e-learning, right. do we have enough teachers to staff both of those models? Yeah, in our mind, the in-person staffing doesn't change from a hundred percent in-person to hybrid. So you'd have your same process for finding e-learning teachers, um, but in a hybrid model, you're seeing the same amount of kids. They're just only coming half the time. So we don't see necessarily an increased need for staffing moving from 100% in-person to hybrid. Because I thought I heard something earlier that mentioned a teacher of record if you needed to use additional teachers through Edgenuity. So I guess I'm, I'm just confused on that. Yeah. Do you? So I, I think what we're referring to is I think in Edgenuity, in that elementary example that I think you're alluding to, there would be a teacher record for e-learning. It wouldn't be the same as an in-person teacher, though. And that's the delineation between the two. So we would have a potentially a separate grouping of teachers that would be that teacher of record, but not as the same as the in-person teacher of record. I have to think about that. <laughs> All right, you want to ponder that a little bit? All right, direct, any of the directors have, um, and I see some principals, but I also want to give directors a chance to jump in if you have questions. Director Lung. Um, Go ahead. Well, since I'm a high school student, so I'll probably ask the high school's principal these questions. Um, That two days rotation schedule that we're looking at, I heard that um, the majority of the high school principal has different ideas to make this better, namely uh, change it to have Monday and Thursday as in person, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday as uh, e-learning, so that Wednesday you could do an additional more cleaning to be more safe. Can, can you comment on that? I mean, what was the thought behind that? And uh, I, I don't know whether the middle school um, principal and uh, elementary principal have a similar thought about that um, two days rotation schedule for AB. Greg, I think that's directed to you. Do you have some thoughts? Yeah, so um, you're talking about what, what our collective group has been thinking about in terms of the 
rotational period and which which day was an e-learning uh, or a, a, a so currently on this schedule it looks like Friday is the the cleaning day and most of us think that moving that to Wednesday might be better just because um, you know kind of breaks up the day so you'd have two days cleaning day two days and so for planning purposes and and e-learning things that that might work better also um, you know there's there's a group of us who feel like if we could do cohort a on Monday and Tuesday we could run a, a, a block schedule and move those kids through that would minimize the, the number of contacts that a teacher would have in a day it would also minimize the number of uh, transitions that we had in the passing period and if and we if we did those two cohorts in a day and then the deep clean on Wednesday we don't have uh, all of our kids coming in with the exposure um, you know I know the virus lives on solid surfaces in, and that number keeps changing so we're talking about 24 to 72 hours so you know it would give that that deep cleaning day so that the group B cohort weren't exposed to the touch uh, the touch um, transfer as as, con as the same as cohort A. So I don't know if that answers your question the way that you would yeah, look for, but yeah. best thing I can do. Yeah. Direct along, I want to expand on that. Uh, we, we have some of the best and brightest minds right there on the screen helping us think through this. But I want to challenge us, as I always do, to think of us as a school system. Because we're going to be challenged by transportation. You're going to hear Rich Cosgrove talk about that. We've already, we've already heard concerns about having someone there to watch the younger kids, whether it's a school district issue with staff, our parents and community members have that same issue as well. So whatever cohort model we decide to go with, it has to be aligned for elementary, middle, and high. If it's not aligned with elementary, middle, and high, it will not work because what we don't want, we don't want our parents and our teachers who have the younger kids that we heard earlier at home by themselves. So we're gonna to have to develop a cohort where it is seamless for elementary, middle, and high. And our folks have really worked extremely hard to do that, but we wanna make sure that we keep uh, the decisions in mind, what happens at one level has certainly implications and, and an impact, or two or three, on the next level. Ted, do you wanna add a little more to that? Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Yes, this was actually one of our more spirited uh, debates on what was best, and I, I concur with, with Dr. Tucker whether for families or for cohorting, whatever we do has to be consistent among the system. But I would like Molly to kind of discuss the other side of that coin. She has some very valid points for why we chose to do ABAB versus AABB um, at the elementary level. And I know some of her colleagues at, at other levels felt the same, but Molly will probably do a much better job than I in advocating for why that might be best for some of our students. Thanks, Ted. Um, I, I do feel like the Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday cohort is so much more beneficial for our developmental kids, our early learners, uh, for the sake of uh, transition, for the sake of learning classroom routines, as well as being a part of a more consistent feedback cycle. When I think of my uh, kindergartners or first graders or even fifth graders, seeing their teacher for two days and then not seeing them for five more days and being completely independent of that, I think that becomes a really heavy lift to being supporting, um, to supporting them uh, online, which I think is gonna be really tough to do when you aren't seeing them for five whole days. And as we know, um, and I know we've got a lot of our, again, former elementary principals on the, on the board here to say, um, you've got to have that consistent feedback cycle and you have to give kids immediate uh, feedback when they are doing something or else you've got a kid that's potentially learning something wrong independently uh, for five days before we try to identify that and fix that. And uh, I think of you know transitions even when we have a normal spring break and we have to reteach kids routines and um, patterns and how we do things in the classroom and to have that much space of time uh, away is uh, 
I think we would waste that we would waste a lot of time with our kids just trying to get them back into the mindset of being in-person learners rather than doing that every other day shift. And I know I, I understand how our high schools feel differently about that, and I understand the block scheduling, but I also believe um, at this time we know that our older learners are more capable of online learning. They are more independent online learners. Um, so I would ask for some grace in uh, in leaning towards our elementary students and their needs uh, for the sake of the system, if we could. I love my older uh, principals, though, middle, high school. Love you guys. <laughs> but I'm, I got to take care of the babies here. All right. John, I saw your hand go up. And, and just so you principals know, we're not going to mediate uh, debate amongst principals today. So I've got enough on my hands with just seven directors. So um, we'll, we'll let the, John to give us a final word about this variation notion around this hybrid model. Go ahead, John. Yeah. The, uh, thank you, Director Ray. Um, I, in the middle school, and you talked about what does the, the day in the life of a teacher look like in that e-learning or in this hybrid model. And it really kind of lands right in between what we're talking about with with Molly is you know laying groundwork, you know laying out what the kids need to 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 learn and get and then take it home and practice. Within in in the high school, talking more about uh, the dialogue and application and all those other areas that would come with that. The middle school is going to depending on the day and what we're working on, we're going to live in both lands as we as we go through that. The and then looking at that too, the A B. The, with the setup here with the kids doing Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, I find that there'd be a lot of benefit to having kids um, go home and work and do that and come back the next day for that check for whatever we need to do to, to reconnect with them and keep them going. The idea of five days of them not being into school, I think would be tough for our middle schoolers to be, be effective learners and following through with what we're asking them to do in that time. And I feel that more frequent checks and more in-person checks would, would be beneficial. Very good. Okay, Director Chancho Shore and then Director Holtzman. Well, I can I ask one more questions. Well, can we can we get other oh, people in the room? Only ask one question. <laughs> we'll come back to you. Well, we'll get there. Director Chancho Shore, Noah's been waiting. Director Holtzman, Director Long, Director Meek. Director Chancho Shore, go ahead. No, I did not have my my hand up, David. Thank you. Oh, but you texted me and you said you had a question, so I must it must be an old text. All right, so Director Holtzman, Director Lung, Director Me, go ahead, Director Holtzman. Okay, yeah, and I appreciate um, the elementary and middle school principals letting us know. I, I completely agree with the developmental appropriateness of seeing students um, on a regular basis, especially as they're younger. My question is, Yes, we're a system of schools, but our students are of different ages and um, are capable of meeting all of these strategies in different ways, especially at our schools. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, if we think that there's a way that we can make it safer at our high schools, um, because our high school students, if they have seven classes, even if there's only 20 students in each class, that's what, 140 students that will be in their major cohort, not to mention the seven teachers. And it works in the reverse for the teachers. So I guess at the high school level, I know we're talking about the hybrid making 50% of the total population decreased, but our cohorts are still gonna be much bigger than they are at the elementary and perhaps the middle school levels. Because at the elementary levels, I can kind of visualize how we could keep it you know, to a smaller 20, 25. I don't know if we have a number. But there's a difference at the high school level. So if we think that high school students meeting for the two days and then having a day for cleaning, and then the other two days is safer for high school students and their teachers, I guess I'm not understanding why we're not considering it because it is one strategy that we could strengthen at our high schools where we know our kids are transmitting and being infected like adults. Um, so it's a safety issue for me. So I want to caution us to not get into, because I see Dr. Tucker getting revved up. Let's, let's not necessarily get into discussion right now. Uh, Director Holtzman certainly pointed out that the variation to this hybrid model is something that uh, she still sees some benefit in. Um, so we want, so we'll get into discussion after this, but let's stick with questions, Director Lung and then Director Meek. 
Well, I certainly agree with host, Dr. Hosman, but I'm going to ask the other questions. Um, so my concern of hybrid um, is about starving. Um, online and uh, in person probably don't have that issues as a, a principal of ours go point out that um, we, we have, Dallas County School District is the largest employer in, in, our, in our county. So we have a lot of uh, teacher that also a parent with a young kid. Um, so with uh, the hybrid schedule, they will have problem of getting a childcare for, for their student um, while they're working. Young kid, what are we gonna do with them? I mean, they can't bring them you know, to, to school with them. Um, childcare is very expensive. Um, they probably eat up half of their salary to provide you know, childcare you know, for, for those uh, teacher. And, um, and, and I'm worried about losing staff also in terms of um, having uh, some of the surveys that could be 15 to 20% of the teacher may not come back uh, in, in, in class because of the COVID-19. So how are, we, how are we gonna make this hybrid work to support our staff with young children and, and with, uh, for, uh, to support our staff that worry about their health to come back um, so that we have enough people to do the teaching. So any thoughts about uh, child care for, for staff? Yeah, are there been any questions? Go ahead, Dr. Tucker. Yes, President Ray, I alluded to this uh, earlier. Uh, Mr. Gochi mentioned earlier, we're gonna have to be creative. Our base program uh, has done a tremendous job of keeping our kids safe since they opened, what, several weeks ago. Uh, and, the, and our students have been uh, very mindful in situations where they need masks to have those on. And when they don't need them, they're out playing and so forth. Uh, they've done a great job in, in a base program, has served students, uh, or parents of uh, kids in the district as well as outside of the district. So we're gonna have to be creative. Uh, maybe we, uh, through a hybrid model, we can free up some of our space and that extra space can be used for, uh, for daycare and for assisting not only our staff, but also our parents in the community who are faced with this issue as well, uh, child services. So uh, uh, we have a couple districts we can look at where they're doing a pretty good job of taking care of children and establishing uh, some child care services. So again, uh, it's about being creative uh, with, with, with whatever environment we come up with because we're gonna be confronted with this whether we're in a hybrid model or in a 100% e-learning model. But to answer your question, uh, Director Long, very succinctly, we're working through this. We're working with uh, Mrs. Elmore to even uh, you know, take some of the experiences that they have uh, with base and how we can apply that to some of our buildings if we have that space available. Very good. Director Meek. So this conversation has been tremendously helpful in hearing from the building leaders who need to implement this. And I, I know the guidelines just came out Monday, um, but I'm kind of curious if you've had an opportunity to talk with your staff about the implementation and if there are other concerns that have been raised or even it's been very helpful hearing the rationale behind the rotation schedule here. And for example, if there's rationale on why you'd, you'd have your all synchronous day on Friday versus Monday. And I'm, so I guess it's a long winded way of me saying, have you worked with your staff to get their feedback as well on tweaks or changes that might be recommended? Go ahead, um, Mrs. Frenchy. That's a really good question. Um, I. It's a, it's a difficult question though. I've worked with my admin team um, and looked over all of the different platforms, um, but it's, it's hard as a leader because you also don't wanna add additional stress to um, your staff when you actually don't know the specific answer to a lot of the questions. Um, so I have done the best that I could um, or that I can do keeping my staff um, aware of what's going on in the district and all of the different scenarios. But I think there is a piece of that where you just need to, 
you know, keep your core people and chat that through um, along with your building, you know, leadership team that's made up of a couple of um, teachers. And then you share that with the rest of your staff because I want to protect my teacher's time during the summer as well. Um, so I, I think it's hard to involve your entire staff when we don't actually have a definitive answer or direction sometimes. And I don't want to add additional stress to their lives, but I also want to involve, um, involve them. So it's sort of a, it's a fine line, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Millie, go ahead. Um, I think as Michelle said, we, there's a lot of information that we don't know. And I think as a, I, I did speak with my staff, um, I don't know, maybe it was a week ago with the information that was given. And we just talked about, you know, I feel like so much of this, we feel very out of control of our destiny. And, um, and I think that's where you get high emotions and all of that, because we just feel uh, very much at the whim of fate in so many ways. Um, but we talked about what we can control and what we can control is uh, good planning of effective instruction because no matter what, after you put your masks on and you distance your kids, you got to teach and you got to teach well and maximize every moment that we have with kids. Um, their biggest concerns um, really revolved around their safety, uh, which is obviously my concern as well. Um, yes, the safety of their kids, but also knowing that there's a lot of littles breathing on one big person. Um, so, you know, what we can do, you know, to, to help mitigate that and what we can do to help them teach most effectively. And, and that's where we talked about those plexiglass shields as well as face shields to be able to show your face and, and do a good job of teaching. Um, they wanna do a great job for their students. They wanna develop those relationships. We tried to take on the mindset of what is, what is it that we value? What do we find really important uh, in our classrooms and how do we make that possible? So if, so if a classroom meeting is something that you value, how do we make that possible given the parameters that we have, given social distancing, given this or that? Do we go outside? Do we get, you know, how do you get creative with that? If small grouping is something we value, how do we make that happen in a safe way for everybody? Um, so those are some things that we've talked about as a staff. The other main, you know, and big concern again became that cohort. Are we allowed to uh, mix our grade level students up for math uh, as we've done previously or uh, to go to RTI groups when we know we might be pulling for multiple classes at one point in time for a grade level, you know, and then we push those kids back in. I think that's a concern. And as we've mentioned before, the uh, child care issue is, is a huge factor. And if I take all of my staff kids, and I've got a lot, and put them into a, a base system, now I'm mixing up some cohorts again. So are we going to be dying on this hill of, of really specifying cohorts, or are we going to really try to do our best and focus on most effective instruction for kids and utilizing all the great staff that we have to, to meet their needs. Those are some of the things we, um, we kind of discussed. Great. And, and Prin that's a big deal. I want to go, uh, and thank you, Principal. <laughs> so I think we're clearly hearing that there's work to be done and, and how we begin talking with our staff and certainly it will help from today to have a clearer direction in terms of what model we're going to go to. Um, Director Chancha Shore, I'm, I'm sorry, Director Hansen, and then Director Chancha Shore. Director Hansen, go ahead. Thank you, Director Ray. Um, I apologize for asking the same question again, but I really feel strongly that the hybrid option is our best option, and so I want to make sure I'm very clear on um, exactly what this is going to look like. So maybe just for the sake of time, I could just get a yes or no answer, but um, will teachers be responsible to plan, facilitate, and provide materials for both the in-person learning and the e-learning? Whoops, Director Hansen, we just lost your audio, so I don't know. But I hear, I, I'm hearing you ask, the question is, will the teacher that's providing a hybrid model be responsible both in-person as well as the e-learning? And I think we heard from Mrs. Milley that the Yes, they're, they're responsible for both, and some are planning that to be an independent day when they're not in school, but the teacher would be responsible for every day of the week and every child that's in the hybrid model. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Has that been discussed with teachers? Because I know through this planning process, I have heard very consistently that teachers are very concerned about the burden and the workload that 
double duty would be for, um, for what their expectations are. I think um, to answer that question, some of that concern came originally when we learned there were gonna be two platforms that you're gonna have in-person learning and e-learning. And that was when the question said, am I gonna be responsible for, like if I have a class of 25 kids and five of them choose e-learning, am I solely responsible for also teaching them? And so I think that's where the main concern um, showed up was originally when we started talking about those two models. Uh, knowing now that your in-person teachers are focusing on those in-person kids, um, I think our teachers are much more aware that a hybrid option is going to allow my one classroom to go in and out of that uh, e-learning and in-person learning um, more easily because there's still that, you know, you've got your hybrid class that also could be your full in-person class and it could be your full e-learning class that is separate from the kids that choose e-learning from the get-go. They're on one straight track and they're doing e-learning all the way through the semester or all the way through the rest of the year. So those are two, you know, I feel like they're two separate entities. Mr. Gocha, go ahead. Sense. Yeah, I think I was just gonna, thanks again for the, asking the question because I think that that clarification is important that um, students that choose to do the remote e-learning remote e will have a different set of teachers than those kids that have chosen to be hybrid. And if you are choosing to do, and if you are, and I, I and I, I would like to get some clarification about whether teachers have the choice to be hybrid or to be remote, or whether that's going to be determined by ADA and some of those, uh, some of those those factors. So that would be a point of clarification I'd, I'd hope for. But um, with regard to students and teachers that are in the in the hybrid section, those teachers would also be responsible for some form of e-learning for those kids and their classes in the hybrid section, okay. but not necessarily for those kids that have chosen to be remote through the semester. So Mr. Goch, you're gonna to have to hang in there with us in the afternoon to get your question answered. So that's a, a cliffhanger. We'll get back with you on that. Um, Chancho Shore is gonna ask the final question before we break for lunch. Director Chancho Shore, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I, I have a, a, a comment as well. Having the building leaders here having conversations and talking with the building leaders about what they think they really would need to have any of these models implemented in their schools, whether it be fluid or very specific, um, has lent itself to a whole bunch more questions because building leaders are very interested and smart in thinking about what the things they're going to need. So, Obviously, they're thinking about all of these very specific how-to questions, and that leads to more and more questions, but it also leads to more and more answers specific to their school. So my comment and question, questions go together. My comments are building leaders, um, hearing you today really helps me understand and appreciate, again, the, the knowledge that building leaders bring to these conversations even in a time where we have not at any time had to do this kind of work yet. But building leaders know that every single day when you go sit in your chair, you don't know what is going to come to you. And you have to be that kind of person that can be so incredibly flexible that you can, you just have a mind that you know you can figure it out, you know you can do it. So what was really um, exciting to me this morning in this whole conversation was hearing not only that you have a million questions because you're taking care of your kids and your teachers, but also that you can make this work. So I think what I heard, and this is where my question comes from, I think what I heard from all of you was this sounds complicated, this sounds hard, regardless of what, which option we choose, but we have ideas about this. And we also have needs. Um, so my question is, if, do I do I hear correctly that you do have ideas about how to make all three of these plans work? And also, do you feel like our school district will be able to help you make this happen? Or will there be some other very specific things that you'll need from us in order to get our kids to school? Uh, go ahead, Katie. I think um, when 
I do think that we have resilient teachers and leaders um, in this district, no doubt. And I think um, whatever we are told to do, whether that's 100% um, in learning, hybrid, e-learning, a combination, going back and forth, I think we will make work and we'll be flexible and we'll figure it out. Um, I do think that um, we do have a, a thing that is what do we need at our particular school, like a form that is has come out to ask specifics. For example, if we need more tents at, for lunches, you know, to be able to social distance people, we do have that capability of doing that. Um, the things that I've asked for, um, I haven't been told no. It's more of like, yes, how, how can we figure out a system so that can go through and be fair to every principal? So if we need a tent for every school, great. Um, let's get that ordered. If we need thermometers and we need that, like he, um, Matt Van Dusen has been heading that up and has been doing a great job on listening to, to principals and figuring, figuring out what it is that we need at each building. So are there some options that are easier than others? Yes. As Greg um, indicated earlier, it would be easier to go from an e-learning option to a hybrid to a fully in-person versus if we started in, in person, then we jumped all the way to e-learning. Um, I also, you know, I'm a science person and like to watch numbers and things like that, although I don't like the direction that they're headed right now. Um, I, you know, we've got to make what's best uh, for our kids and for our, our community and knowing that parents also have to go back to work. I hear that loud and clear. So will we make things work? You bet. Will we lose sleep? And have we been losing sleep mm -hmm. to make sure that happens? You bet. And we'll continue to do so. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and I'd say along those lines, I mean, to echo what Katie said, we will, we will make a system work. Um, that, that's what we do. That's what we do every day. The, when I look, kind of going back to what do we need as we go through this, like right now we're looking at these three different scenarios of 100% in-person, the hybrid, or the online piece. And I think in order for us to go through that and the timing of what we're looking at, what we need to know is we need to know which environment we're going back in so we can focus our energies on one and not three. Um, then I can really get in and then I can get real specific on what questions and what more supports do I need for these environments as opposed to speculating at three different pieces. It was mentioned earlier about talking about these things with our staff. You know, I've been doing this with my admin and we've been living in this three different pieces world. We've been living in that world with uh, my colleagues at the other middle schools. And the more we can narrow this down, the more we can put our focus on what we will be doing when students are returning or when the school year starts, when whatever that looks like. And so in order for us to make it work, the timing of that, we need to get more specific so we can focus in that one place. All right. So I, I see other principals hands, but I'm going to have to tell you we're going to cut you off at this point just because we need to get lunch. And we'd love for you guys to come back, but we also want to respect your time. Um, as you have heard over and over again, how wonderful it has been to have you guys uh, interacting with us and contributing to the conversation. And yes, we're going to help you, John. We're going to get this thing narrowed down by the end of the day. And uh, hopefully that will um, get you guys into that launch mode of really working with your staffs so and making it happen because we do know that you're the kind of leaders that will indeed. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and take a lunch break. Thank you, principals. Uh, enjoy your lunches as well. And we will be back at approximately 1 o'clock.
And cabinet and administrators, leaders, we're going to go ahead and reconvene for the afternoon now. It's about 1 o'clock. Um, and just for those of you that are, that are viewing, we have uh, had some pretty extensive discussion regarding the three different models of learning from the e-learning model to the in-person model to hybrid. And I think Director Hansen um, really simplified the hybrid model well in just a communication to me that she just sent to me. And she said, basically, the hybrid model is Monday, they're in person, Tuesday, they're independent. And that's how that works. That's, and, and so I think that, and I think Director Meek also made a good point, is we use this term e-learning um, they're, they're, we use e-learning oftentimes in all the other models. So we need to get clear that in the hybrid model, the e-learning, if you will, the, the independent, as Director Hansen said, um, is different than the actual 100% e-learning model. Um, and, and the reason that is because you have the in-person teacher is responsible for that entire week for her group. Sometimes she's responsible for them when they're in class, and then sometimes she's responsible for making sure they have independent type activities to do uh, when they're not in class. And so I think that's one clarification we wanted to make. And so staff, I would just um, stop there. Also want to just check in with Director Hansen just to affirm that that's indeed what we're describing. And Director Hansen, does that clarify it? Good enough for you at this point? It does. Thank you. All right. All right, so Dr. Tucker, we're ready to move on. I don't. I think we've uh, defined the models well. I think we understand where we are. Uh, now we're ready to move on to some other sections and other considerations of the plan. So it's back to you. Thank you, President Ray, directors, our folks here, and as well as our viewers uh, who are logging in. Um, a quick uh, compliment that um, I like the way everyone is wearing their mask, and you're probably saying why why you don't have your mask on while you're talking. I'm maintaining my six feet in our public order, which was discussed prior to the start of this meeting, states that while you are talking, that you can speak without your mask on. So whenever I stop talking, I know Lisa's going to give me the evil eye to make sure I have my mask on. Again, I want to thank everyone for modeling this for our school community and, and staff. Uh, moving on, we're now at Section 3, Personalized Learning. Uh, Nancy Ingalls is back with us, uh, our personalized learning officer, and she's going to go over a couple of things with us. Uh, board members and folks who are viewing, I promise you we will be back up to uh, schedule here very shortly. These next uh, three sections are relatively short, but we want to be thorough in our responses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, I'd like to talk about some assurances first for our special populations. Regarding special education, uh, our schools will ensure that each student with an IEP is afforded a free and appropriate public education. We know that the vast majority of students with IEPs received high, receive high quality, best first instruction from classroom teachers, and they will continue to have full access to that, whether they're in person, in hybrid, or e-learning. Additionally, each student with an IEP will have their specialized instruction and related services delivered for them based on their individualized needs as referenced in their IEPs. If we are in a hybrid or an e-learning situation, our special education providers will collaborate with classroom teachers and collaborate with parents to confirm how those services will be delivered and of course, all of this will be done um, while at the same time protecting the health and safety of all. Our special education providers will continue to monitor the progress on individual IEP goals. Students' accommodations and modifications will be afforded regardless of the learning format that they're in. And we know that our schools will engage in teaching all students hygiene and safety precaution measures and when there are students that require additional support in that, our special education teachers will have tools and resources available to them to provide that additional support in teaching. When considering our students who are English language learners or identified gifted learners, these students will continue to receive the support that they need through best practices. 
These specialists work in a highly collaborative manner with our classroom teachers. Um, and there will be a lens of equity for all regarding any of our students with special needs. Moving on to health, wellness, prevention, and mental health. All of our safety processes will continue to be in place. All of our suicide prevention efforts will continue and our crisis response will be available when needed at any time. There are multiple ways in which social emotional learning will be embedded in um, any of our learning platforms for students. Also support for parents and connection for families to community agencies when needed will be fully available. Every student will have full access to counselors, social workers, and psychologists regarding of the learning, learning format that we're in. And finally, school nurses will be fully available to support our schools in teaching health and safety precautions and also working with schools regarding the protocols that we have related to COVID-19. So as Dr. Tucker said, this section was relatively fast and I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> okay, directors, any questions for Mrs. Ingalls? Director Long? Um, I want to um, ask related to uh, the, the spec and um, especially the one with severe lead, they lead, um, one-on-one -on -one hand holding most of the time and if we are not going with um, the in-person and we're doing either hybrid or, um, or online how can we ensure that um, that some populations that probably require constant um, supervisions or uh, you know in-person uh, learning will be able to get um, the adequate educations, um, thank you. Thank you for that question, Director Lung. As Mr. Windsor stated when he went over the sample schedule, if we're in a hybrid learning situation, our significant needs students who are in center-based programs will attend school four days a week aligned with cohorting rather than two days a week. So they will have more in-person instruction available for them because of their uh, specific needs like you mentioned. In an e-learning format, uh, we would need to determine how we could um, facilitate different modes of instruction for students depending on their needs. It's all driven by the IEP. So our providers would be collaborating with families to determine that while at the same time meaning, maintaining all safety precaution and protocols that we might have if we're in an e-learning situation, 100% e-learning. So Ms. Nigel, I, mean, I was a little distracted. So okay. I understood the SSN students will have a different schedule and be allowed to be at school four times a week. Were there other special at-risk populations that will also have that benefit like our GT, ESL, um, any other populations besides our SSN that will be able to be there more frequently if we're in a hybrid model? We haven't determined that yet, but that is absolutely something that our departments can work with our school principals on. Okay, okay. Other questions, uh, Director Holtzman? Yeah. Thank you, I have one question about GT and one about our students with significant needs. So I'll just start with that one. Um, so some of our students with significant needs also have basically healthcare needs, such as toileting. Um, they may or may not be able to tolerate or wear masks. What extra protective equipment perhaps or a different kind of protect protective equipment will we be giving our staff that work with them since they're essentially sometimes almost performing a healthcare function? Yes, our SSN programs will be provided with additional PPE. Um, obviously, the number of masks that they need will be available in addition to face shields. If they need other barrier type things, uh, those will be available. Uh, they will have ample gloves and we've also um, 
ordered gowns in case they want to cover their clothing. So whatever protective um, equipment they need, they will be supplied with. So, and that would be like a medical grade, if available, like an N95, something a healthcare worker would be provided? I would need to ask Mr. Cosgrove the specifics on what type of masks we're ordering. And then my next question was about GT, and if we have GT students who enroll in our, or choose to enroll in the online only Edgenuity um, program, Will that meet their needs? Um, I know that it's a curriculum resource and it can be supplemented, but I've heard that it's a curriculum resource that's been primarily used for credit recovery. So I had some questions about how it would meet the needs of GT students. Thank you for that question. I'm not prepared to answer that at that time, and I'm not sure if Mrs. Mason has that level of detail about ingenuity in particular. Um, if not, we're happy to work with the Director of Gifted and Learning, uh, Natasha Strayer, and get that answer to you. All right, Director Tantra Shore, and then Director Hansen. Director, I'm sorry, was there, was there more to that response? I just wanted to make sure nobody else had anything to add to that. Thank All right, you. very good. Director Tantra Shore, go ahead. Um, it's my understanding, and correct me, uh, Nancy, if I'm wrong, but what I'm understanding is because we're all returning to school in a slightly different scenario, there will be uh, returning to school IEP meetings being held. So it, regardless of which, um, which rotation or which um, adventure, choose your adventure, for the next several months, parents and children choose, they will have a return to school IEP meeting to be specific about how their needs will be met. Um, at one, am I correct about that? I don't believe that every student with an IEP will have an IEP meeting. Those families that have chosen full e-learning will have an IEP meeting to determine how all of the services will be delivered. If we're in an, uh, yes, go ahead. No, you go ahead, sorry. If we're in a hybrid learning, um, absolutely our special education providers will be collaborating with parents to confirm how services will be delivered and IEP meetings will be scheduled as necessary if there are additional details that need to be worked out. So at any time, a parent can requ request an IEP meeting if they're not sure how their specific individual students' needs might be met in any of the three um, choose, your, choose your school scenario um, is presented for each family. Is that correct? That is correct. A, a parent can request an IEP meeting at any time. Um, and will the, the, the IEP team kind of scenario would remain the same. There will still be a team approach to how our school district will meet the needs of our students regardless of what choice families can make, correct? Yes, that's true. With parents as part of the team. Yes. So uh, one of the uh, questions I had then was, is there a timeline that we will provide for parents in, in um, being able to participate in these um, scenarios where they may choose a different approach to their student's education? Can you give me a little more detail in terms of the choosing a different approach? Do you mean if we started out in person or hybrid and they decided they wanted to move to full e-learning? Um, yes. Yes. So it, at any time a parent wants to be able to request a meeting, there's a, is there a timeline that um, they would be able to have that service provided to them? Um, given the fact we might have lots of people who are looking at um, different scenarios and wondering what that would look like for their special education students? For a student with an IEP, if there's a need for them to change their setting, then the IEP team can convene at any time. We wouldn't place a deadline on that. It, it depends on what the student needs. Thank you. All right, Director Hansen, go ahead. Inclusion is something that's very important to me, and I understand what that would look like in the in-person classroom environment, but I'd really like 
an explanation of what that's going to look like with hybrid and e-learning models. B. Our special education teachers and providers um, collaborate extensively with their classroom teacher colleagues. And so depending on how those um, e-learning classes are planned and designed, there should be a lot of co-planning taking place. Um, and in an e-learning class, essentially there should be the same level of inclusion as there would be in an in in-person class. Uh, but that does take uh, some degree of co-planning to take place. Okay, Director Long. This question is about um, session four, health. Um, Hang on, Director Long, we're not there yet. Are we in still session three? Uh, we're still in three, correct. <laughs> All right. So no, no other questions regarding personalized learning. Ms. Zingles, thank you again for the overview and the presentation and helping us understand the differences with each model. So again, we'll, we'll move on now to section four, which is health, wellness, and prevention. Dr. Tucker or Mrs. Ingalls, not sure which one of you want to do the introductions for section four. Oh, uh, apologies, President Ray. I already went over um, section four. Oh, very my quickly. Apologies. So hit Dr. I'm the Director Lung. Okay. God, I hate it when Director Lung's right. That. Okay, my apologies. Director Lung, go ahead and ask your question <laughs> regarding section four. Um, so I saw a lot of uh, email from the parents who say that um, with the social isolation since March, um, that caused some of the um, mental issues um, for some of their students. And, and also, um, historically speaking, after summer, the kid lost some of the learning. Plus, we have two months of um, remote learning. So when we go back to school, um, no matter what model that we are in, or what kind of increased support that we're going to give to our student to make sure that um, we're taking care of their, their mental lead of, you know, because this is an unprecedented crisis that is going to affect a lot of our, of our students. So, so what, what actions that we will have to make sure that um, they're well taken care of? Um, are we going to increase the number of counselors that we have or the sections or more proactively reach out to the student that, you know, um, that could have issues? Thank you. Yes, we have um, a lot of professional development planned for the next uh, few weeks for our teachers, counselors, uh, special service providers, specific to uh, addressing the, the trauma, the anxiety, the stress related to the COVID closure and, uh, the, and the summer and the anxiety around returning to school. There are, this PD, in conjunction with tools and resources that are going to be available for all of our teachers and our uh, mental health providers and counselors, will help equip them to address these needs with students on a daily basis. Our counselors, socials and social workers, and psychologists will proactively schedule meetings with students. Uh, there will be uh, sort of a... Uh, an approach to um, assessing student needs and checking in with them to, to make sure that we are addressing any of the mental health uh, needs that they have. In addition to reaching out to families and providing support for families. We've also over the summer collaborated with many of our community partners to be available should we be in a situation where perhaps a particular team or school or area might be overwhelmed with need, we can reach out to some of our partnerships to help support those needs for students and their families. Okay, we're gonna have Chancha Shore ask the last question for section four, and then we're gonna move on to section five. Go ahead, Chancha Shore. Thank you, Ms. Singles. Will the same or the current IEP teams stay with the student regardless of which option they choose? To the extent possible, that is ideal, but depending on what's needed for um, e-learning and depending on how that match turns out when we think about the way that Mr. Knight described matching teachers with students who opt for full e-learning there may be a need for a particular service provider to be a different 
person that's more connected to e-learning. Um, but to the extent possible, we would like to keep teams who currently work with students and their families intact. Okay, very good. Now we've completed section four and we're ready to move on to the next section on operations. Dr. Tucker, if you want to get us started. We're now ready to move on to the next section, section five. Uh, we'll ask Mr. Cosgrove to come forward and introduce his co-speakers. Good afternoon. Nope. Can you hear me now? There you go. Good afternoon, directors. With me, we have our new chief financial officer, Kate Katasko who will discuss nutrition services, and our Director of Athletics and Activities, Derek Cheney. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our operations portfolio. And I also want to add that uh, our Assistant Superintendent, Ted Knight, will help as needed if there are any questions on safety and security that I cannot answer. First and foremost, personal protective equipment. As always, our principals ask some great questions. I do want to praise our Director of Operations and Maintenance, Matt Van Dusen. We have been working since late February before the closure on our protocols and our PPE plans to ensure that we're positioned to pivot as needed. I just want to give you some examples of our personal protective equipment that will be available for our students and staff. And we are planning, we're collaborating for CARES funding to order materials for an entire school year, not just for the start. And we already have months worth in stock of these items that I'm gonna be discussing. So touchless thermometers. For example, we already have 600. Great feedback from the principals today. We will certainly continue to revise our plan. And if needed, we will have one for every classroom, for example. And we use those this summer for our fall uh, and summer not only planning, but our reentries to drop off and pick up materials, for example. Mask. We have medical masks, 10,000. We have 3,000 planned for KN95 masks. Director Holtzman, to answer your question. So we'll continue to collaborate with the school leaders, with the DOSs, with Ted Knight to make sure we distribute that at the schools in standard packages so they have that. Clear face mask. We understand the need for people to see each other's mouths and in instructions, so we're planning on providing those. Face shields, we'll have over 8,000 face shields, not only for every teacher, but every staff member, including bus drivers and TEAs in the district. Gloves, we have 800,000 gloves right now. Now granted, they're disposable gloves, but if an EA or a TA needs those, or for our uh, custodial contractors and cleaners, we will always have gloves. Gowns, to answer Director Holzman's questions, if a staff member needs a gown because they're cleaning bodily fluids, for example, we will have gowns available. Plexiglass dividers, we already have, I would say, almost 300. We're gonna have 1,500 plexiglass dividers. What we're doing, in collaboration with the principals and DOSs, we're focusing on the workstations in a school where staff have people come up to them a lot. So that's the security desk, the kiosk, that's the entrance to the school where the secretaries um, and registrars are. It's the administration areas where people share desks or in multiple areas, um, as well as counselors, psychologists, those staff members who have a lot of visitors in and out of those rooms. Stickers and signage for distancing and protocols, hundreds of them simply as reminders to follow the protocols. Tape in case uh, principals, teachers want to tape things off. The plan would not be initially to tape furniture off, it's simply to identify furniture based on spacing where people can sit, but if they want to have directional arrows in hallways 
or markers in front of bathrooms where to stand if we don't have enough stickers or we want to order more. Hand soap paper towels, obviously enough for an entire school year. Hand sanitizer, we have hand sanitizer that's FDA approved and that kills the viruses that uh, are related to COVID. And we have hand sanitizer dispensers in schools. We have the dispensers in, already mounted in every single bus. And we have and will continue to have one bottle for every room. And we have over 3,000 rooms in the district. Cleaning and, and disinfectant supplies. So we use two chemicals. It's called Oxivir and E23. They are both on the EPA and CDC approved list and they kill COVID. The good thing about Oxivir is you don't need personal protective equipment if you're using that in a normal use. So if a staff member wants to get a bottle and spray, they actually don't need gloves or eye protection. Now, one of our custodial contractors will because they're using a lot of it and they're doing it every night. But for normal use, on the label and per the EPA, in fact, it's not used, so it's very safe. Tents and chairs. So I'm gonna jump ahead for Kate's presentation in a minute, but for uh, hybrid, for staggering, for the use of cafeterias. In case two shifts or four shifts can't fit in the cafeteria, depending on the utilization rate of that school, we are researching now and planning to have tents available and chairs, possibly tables, depending on the school by school furniture inventory. So eating as well as learning could be outside. Ventilation, as Principal Greg Gochi said, um, we do have needs in the district. I will say that the HVA system at Chaparral is, thanks to our board, Dr. Tucker and the voters, it's in the 2018 bond. And next summer, all of the rooftop units are gonna be replaced. The mechanical system will be upgraded. That's about a million and a half dollars. And in the meantime, though, I do wanna say that all of our HVAC systems do meet code. The airflow is per code. Now, the rooms could be hot or cold depending on the controls. And we have, as you know, all of the controls projects that we are doing in the bond too, to control that. But on top of that, we have already procured a pre-qualified contractor to basically flush the system twice a day. And that's the second bullet for CDC and the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. That is their leading guidance on what to do. And this is 100% flush. I know we've, re we've received some questions about that. And that is basically at three or four in the morning and seven or eight at night, weather dependent, except when it's 90 degrees out, Hopefully it's not 90 degrees at eight o'clock at night, for example. If so, you'd wait till midnight. You open the outside dampers, you have mechanical controls and sensors on every damper and every chiller and every motor device to bring in that outside air and you basically flush the indoor air to improve indoor air quality. We have and will continue to replace every filter in our HVAC systems. And indoor air quality is continuously checked by the bill engineers and operations and maintenance. And if I can't even back up to that, when we construct a new school, when we, when we do any mechanical work in that school, we commission it and we test and balance in it. And that's two different consultants to make sure it's designed correctly and every louver is operating correctly per code. Disinfecting, our bill and engineers and custodial contractors, of which we have seven, Every single day, at the end of the day, starting at 2.30, during about a six hour shift after that, they not only clean, but they also disinfect every key touch point in every room, in every school in the district. Also on top of that, twice a week, those same crews will come through and clean the horizontal surfaces in every room. And those twice a week could be flexed, depending on the hybrid model, to take advantage of that open space. We will, in, we will disinfect every bus after the morning routes and after the afternoon routes. And we will have disinfectant materials throughout all of our schools for any staff member to use as desired. For transportation, the current guidance is 26 students per bus. That's for a 77 passenger bus and we have various sizes of buses so basically around 24 to 26 on a bus. 
depending on the size, one student per seat is allowed for physical distancing. We will be able to transport 100% of the student with special needs, including homeless and foster, and approximately 34% of the general education population as presented by the task force. And in line with the task force recommendations and the approved framework, we are starting with the most distant routes and bringing them in. So we have nine high schools and middle schools with large boundaries, and we have um, almost 50 elementary schools with smaller boundaries. And it's the same bus drivers in tiers that's transporting these. So they go out in the morning, pick up, and drop off the middle and high, learners, uh, in high schools, and then go pick up and drop off the elementary school kids. So that's why the radiuses are different. So those same 127 drivers for general education, that's what we have, they can transport high schoolers from five miles out and elementary schools. Right now it's looking at two and a half miles out. And that's for eligible students consistent with board policy. As brief previously to the board, there are a number of routes that we will not be able to provide and that's within the walk zones and now within the new distance zones. Within gated communities, however, we'll still be able to transport those students in gated communities, but those gates are within one mile of their home. So we'll move the stops to those gates if those are within the two mile radius. And field trips before and after school, IB, band and open enroll, those will not unfortunately be able to be provided. During the middle of the day, that's when we have a lot of our routes for students with special needs. So those same gen ed drivers then move and transport the special education in addition to drivers dedicated for special education driving throughout the day. Thanks to the voters, thanks to the board, we are issuing smart tag. That's for improved accountability and security on our buses. This year is gonna be a little different. What we did, we created the routes first that we could provide and then the first week in August, those eligible students will be invited to participate through express check-in to get a smart tag. And then we will know following the survey results exactly which kids want to ride and if it's allowing us more capacity, we'll be able to reduce those radiuses and increase our routes. That is a possibility, but we don't know yet. We'll disinfect the buses twice a day, like I said. We have mounts uh, already uh, installed for dispensers. Um, everyone on that bus will wear a face covering or non-medical mask. Again, we will have shields also for the TAs or for any students that need those. And the parents or guardians are expected to take their child's temperature and health screen before a, uh, a student arrives at the bus stop. And just to follow on, there will be no district sponsored field trips um, under this current climate. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Derek Cheney to discuss um, athletics and activities. I'm gonna take this off while I'm speaking, if that's okay. Um, thank you for having us this afternoon, board, appreciate it. Um, just a quick update on activities and athletics. Um, you know, I know there's a lot on your agenda today, but I wanna give you an update on where we are with, with those extracurricular activities. Uh, we are going to do everything we can in Douglas County to continue to promote and support our extracurricular activities, uh, you know, both athletics and the activities piece. Um, you know, we've had uh, stuff going this summer, and I do want to give a shout out to uh, Rich's crew and Matt Van Dusen and Jorge and uh, Rich. Um, Zach Nance said they've been really supportive and helping us go. And, and an extra shout out to Lisa Cantor as well, because uh, I've got her on speed dials. We're going through all these and working through with our, our health department. So thank you to those individuals to uh, help with our summer programs uh, to keep them going. Um, we follow CHAS's guidance, the Colorado High School Activities Association. Um, their plan is currently with the governor's office. Uh, they had to resubmit their plan after the resurgence. Um, and we have not heard back, CHAS hasn't heard back from the governor's office yet. So it is currently sitting on their desk um, and we're waiting to get some feedback from them. So we're kind of like waiting like everybody else to see, see what kind of feedback Chassa gets. Um, you know, one of their challenges, of course, is all the different uh, local health orders. They got people from Durango to Sterling to Grand Junction to the local area. So they're, they're, they have a challenge uh, to see what they can do. So we don't have any uh, direction yet from Chassa. We hope to have 
um, kind of like this meeting, we have one coming up to figure out what our what it's going to look like in the fall. So a lot, a lot of different options. Certain sports could be moved to the spring. Certain could stay. Um, one thing we know we're starting golf August third. So we do, we do, we know one thing. So, um, but it'll be interesting to see where we go. We'll follow. You know, we'll we'll balance Chas's guidelines with local health orders, um, with state mandates, and we'll work to see what we can do to offer everything we can offer uh, for our students because it's 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 a big deal for our students to be able to participate in these activities and athletics. So. Um, one thing to note, second bullet there, those who choose to participate in e-learning, they have full access to our athletics and activities. So uh, that's in state statute. So if someone chooses to stay home for e-learning, if they want to, um, I don't know if they'd want to, but if they want to go out for our programs and be a part of them, um, we would certainly allow that to look full, a full extent um, that we allow anybody for our in-person ones too. So, um, I'll just keep it at that for now, and then if you have any other questions that you want to ask about activities, athletics, when we're done, I'll be certainly welcome to answer those as well. Thanks. Greetings, everyone. Um, so I will speak a little bit about uh, nutrition services and how that will look. Um, to the greatest extent possible, students will be eating in the cafeteria. Uh, we certainly recognize that we've got potential capacity issues and. As many have spoke about um, really opting to do tents or outdoor spaces, sorry, I'm going to do that too, um, wherever we possibly can. So those tents are already being sourced. We are looking to order those as soon as possible and deploy those out to the schools who want to take advantage of that, along with tables and chairs for outside space as well. Uh, staff will be wearing face coverings for the entirety of lunch service. We'll be asking students to be masked uh, while they go through the lunch line and then can certainly remove those masks once they sit down to eat. We're also setting up a touchless pay system so that we're no longer having students hand key in their lunch number so that we limit that touch, touch point as well. And of course, everything being fully disinfected between uh, groups of students. We recognize that there, there could be need for um, additional lunch rounds or lunch periods. And certainly we're working with our building leaders to adjust schedules as needed. We've also had members of our staff out in buildings looking to space out, see exactly what that looks like and make sure that with certain capacity guidelines, we can safely meet those distancing requirements as lunch is being held. Uh, breakfast will look pretty normal. Uh, the grab and go breakfast styles will be, uh, for those schools that offer that, will be eaten in the classroom, brought back to classrooms with uh, teachers making sure that those distance requirements are being met as students are eating. And then one of the bigger updates is around new, new guidance from the USDA. Um, while we were in crisis mode, we were able to serve all of our students free of charge. Um, once school returns, we will only be able to offer free meals to those students that qualify for either free or reduced price meals. We will be able to offer um, meal service to our e-learning students, but if they do not qualify for free or, or reduced price lunch, they would be a, on a pay basis. So our e-learning students can opt or order um, prepackaged meals, either in you know, the beginning of the week or multi-days at a time, with designated pickup times uh, for them to, to pick those up. But the biggest um, sort of ball here is that um, no longer able to offer that, that emergency feeding or that crisis feeding to all of our families free of charge. Thank you. On school security, school safety uh, continues to be our highest priority along with health. And they will continue 24-7, as they have been for emergency management, threat assessment, campus security, and drills. Um, required drills during in-person or hybrid will continue. Um, and while implementing all of the safety and uh, health protocols and facility rentals, um, currently we're renting outdoors only. Um, however, uh, we certainly can migrate to indoors as long as all protocols can be met and we can work that. And we uh, would include the uh, added cost for disinfection of our schools following facility rentals. This concludes operations, uh, unless you have questions. All right, very good. Thank you again. So directors, we'll just uh, start out with are there questions regarding operations? Director Lung, go ahead. I'm going to ask two questions, uh, two quests first, and so I can come back if no other director asks the other questions. Okay. Um, again, let me use um, Rock Canyon High School as an example. Their 
VAC was down 20 times last year, and um, the turnaround rate of fixing it um, is not very good last year. So I'm just wondering, because that's a large component of being, you know, having a safe school. Um, do we go, go, are we going to have a pre-qualified con, uh, contractor that you stand by and uh, fix the HVAC system? Um, and, and can you tell me last year how many system that go down and what's the average length of getting it fixed? And and are we going to have a better plan this year better to address this as soon as possible? That's my question number one. Thank you, director. I don't have that information handy, but I can get it because every single response is in our work order system. And I can not only get the, um, the numbers, but the time of response as well. So unfortunately, I don't have that information. However, to answer your question, the same contractor that we're using to flush our systems is uh, going to be responsible to make sure that flushing works and the controls are set to uh, not only flush, to, but to maximize the airflow, as well as, since this is a control issue, it's a temperature issue. So we will have that contractor available, but I can certainly follow on to answer your question. Yeah, yeah I think there's, thank you. My second question um, is um, about the bus, uh, bus capacity. I believe that there's only one third of the current uh, student that riding bus last, last year will be able to uh, go to the bus this year, and uh, you also point out that there will be 24 to 26 students only will be able on the bus. How can you pick which 24 to 26 students that go to the bus? Right. I mean, and how are we going to address um, the people, the two thirds who cannot ride uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the bus? Um, do we improve uh, high school parking so that all the high school kids who want to drive can drive? I mean, that is currently impossible if we are doing in school, uh, I mean, uh, in-person learning, because we don't have enough parking capacity for high school. Thank you for the questions. Um, basically, how we staff those routes, using last year's matriculation, last year's bus riders, that's what we used as a starting point to create the routes, understanding that 70% plus in the survey said they were not going to take those routes. However, that is not per student. Um, and uh, they, as a parent, for example, could have thought I'm eligible, but even though I didn't take the transportation last year, I'm not gonna take it this year. So we use the matriculation as a starting point and we'll confirm that with the registration. We conservatively loaded those bus routes with the number of drivers and routes to cover last year. And as we get the specific names of students from parents that want to ride, then we will We'll transport all of those within those radiuses out and then add buses as needed. So anyone in those locations, the most distant routes will get transported. The others, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity. We've been working with the principals and DOSs. They are aware that there will be increased personnel traffic at those schools to try to stagger. The number of high school riders um, will programmatically be the same. I mean, we're not getting more high school drivers, whether we're on in-person or, or hybrid compared to last year. So it'll be the same, unless we're hybrid, then it'll be less of a parking issue at schools because only half of the student drivers would be there at a given time. What we are closely gonna be monitoring is the offsite traffic impact of the parents within two miles for elementaries or within five miles for high school driving their students to school. So we are aware of that and as well as other districts. Fortunately, our district is in general, master planned. So some of the neighborhoods aren't as crowded as other districts, for example, um, near us. So, but we are hypersensitive to that vehicular traffic issue around the schools because we will be busing less. But last year, we only bused 11,000 students and 1,000 of those were students with special needs. So last year, it was 10,000 out of 68,000 kids. So it will be a traffic impact, but we don't know how much yet. Other questions, directors? Uh, Director Meek and then Director Holtzman. This is a more generic question, but there's gonna be significant education and communication aspects to whatever choices we make moving forward. And I know we have time dedicated um, an outline for helping teachers and staff. Mm -hmm. And are we gonna talk at some point, is there a dedicated portion of the presentation on parent engagement and um, I think 
it's a it's a Herculean lift in every way to help mm-hmm. parents know who maybe won't have bus service or parents who have children with special needs or parents who have children in athletics. And I'm just wondering when we'll talk about that. Section nine, uh, Mrs. Rader, our chief communications uh, person will talk more about that. And obviously this is also time to hear from boards, board members in our community. I know many of our community members are following along. Uh, so there are questions out there we don't have final answers to. We can build that in our FAQ. We can build that as we continue to revise our plan, but certainly looking forward to hearing from Mrs. Rader. Very good. Okay, Director Holtzman. Thank you. And I wanted to start off by saying thank you for um, looking into the tents and the chairs and the utilization of our outdoor space. I think that's a really great addition. I really appreciate that. I have a question about ventilation and then also one about activities. Um, in terms of the HVAC work that has already been paid for by our bond, and I understand the scheduling of contractors to, to some level. I know I don't understand it as in depth as you do, but to help me and also to really help our public. Um, you know, I know at least in, in my area in Parker, we have several schools that that will be a huge um, improvement for them to get that work done. Is there any way of expediting that work? I, I'm confident if there was, you would have already tried, but if you could just explain that to us a little bit so we all have a better understanding. Yes, thank you for the question. First, the controls work from the mechanical contractor to program the twice a day flushing, that will all be done and in place before August 17th. As far as our bond, we have 61 schools with significant work, basically any school over 2008 when it was opened. And uh, almost all of those have mechanical work because that's, the most, that's most of the tier one the infrastructure of the school. We have already accelerated projects from 2022 to 2021. There will still be some schools in 2022, however, approximately 10 of those. But we'll continue to try to accelerate it. Okay, so, you know, obviously that concerns all of us. Um, One of the reasons it concerns me is because wearing a mask and being in a hot room, it must be a little more challenging than a temperature controlled room. And I know that we're gonna do our best to not have that happen. But if it were to happen, um, do we have, have we considered allowing opening of windows? Is that possible? And if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yes. So for security and utilities control and monitoring, since our utilities budget's approximately $15 million, it's industry standard with large physical plant owners to have inoperable windows, just like these to control the central control. With that said, there are some windows that could be open, but very few. What we have on our to-do list is to see if the local fire jurisdictions would allow us to prop open the doors because fire code requires you to close the school doors and have it sealed and latched. It's not a security issue. It's, it's, it is a security issue, but it's not security code. It's a fire code. So we would need their approval to do that. And we will be asking them. Thank you. And then finally, my question about activities. Um, If you could just talk a little bit about band, choir, and orchestra, and also libraries. Um, Not that library is an activity, although it kind of is at a lot of our schools. It's a a place where students can build relationships and be supported. And also, it's just the location that a lot of our clubs happen. In terms of those things, band, choir, orchestra, and library, have we come up with any creative solutions to help us with social distancing, um, equipment that could be used, or plexiglass. I'm just, I'm myself just brainstorming, but I just know that those areas are especially tough and wondering what we could do to help. Yeah, that's definitely one of our biggest challenges right now. And working with CHAS, so they're actually doing studies going on as we speak through National Federation of High School. Um, There's a bunch of other, like, 40 organizations evolved with this. So just like everything else, we're trying to be creative in how we offer these programs, you know, um, working with marching bands right now and choirs, we're talking about, um, you know, using some of those tents and going outside during when it's nice out, you know, maybe the first quarter, they are doing some of that. Um, You know, if you go by, you'll see marching bands now practicing six feet apart. 
Um, we, we have not gotten approval. I don't know the answer to the in, when we go indoor on that, inside. I think just the short term is we, we can take them outside. And in the meantime, you know, it's nice till October and we can do that. And I've talked with music teachers, maybe that's the first quarter and the second quarter maybe is a music theory, music appreciation type during the, during the winter months. But we, we don't have a good answer on that yet. They're still doing a lot of studies on the aerosol and, and how it projects when you play an instrument. And I've seen contraptions of, of clarinet where they have, they wrap the clarinet and they put a bell on the end of it. And you know they have a slit in the mask for the student. So, I mean, though, that's definitely some things we're looking at. And, um, you know, look, look, you see the kid all, you know, they showed a picture of the slit in the mask and everything covered up. But we're working through that. I don't have a good answer for the indoor part of that right now. So know that that's, that's being looked at. And then hopefully get some guidance from Chassa because they, they sanction all those activities as, as well. So, um, and I don't know about the library piece. I don't really deal with that as much as I do with the band and the choirs. Just as a follow-up to the library, um, that one is a, of special concern to me just because I know that we're working really hard to do cohorting and, and I'm just, I'd like to hear some ideas about how we're gonna do that with the library because it, it's usually open to all students. So um, that would be helpful information eventually. I'm sure we'll talk about this later, uh, Mr. Cheney, but uh, do we have plans? Because I, I think Director Holtzman's um, you know, identified a group of, of teachers that really have some unique circumstances with their class size and their space, like band music and library, et cetera. Do we have plans to have these groups come together and really work through some of these things? Because I'll tell you, we've gotten tons of emails from our specialist teachers, and, and they're all about trying to find solutions. You know, and I just feel like that we, if we can tap them to really come together and, and really make some recommendations because they're a unique group um, do we have plans for that as far as implementation, as far as next steps, I mean, uh, to bring some of those groups together? Uh, yes, Director Ray. Uh, first, I'll talk about the use of uh, creative space, outdoor space, uh, as well as tents, uh, tables and chairs that Mr. Cosgrove talked about. I'll ask Mrs. Mason to talk about uh, some of the specifics for departmental uh, professional development as well as district-wide PD to continue to brainstorm this. Also, we have several of our principals on, and I know that they have begun having conversations in their staff meetings about how can we accommodate not only those specials, those larger specials, but those larger elective classes uh, as well. And just to piggyback on that, I know, and, and I think er, uh, Ms. Erica's coming up, but I know uh, Kelly, one of our strategists, Mihalik from our CIPG, she has been meeting with our band and choir teachers and, and trying to figure out the best way to move forward. So those meetings have happened with uh, one of our CIP strategists and they will continue to happen. Um, but I'll let Erica. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Derek. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Um, Kelly has been meeting with specials and electives. And as you mentioned, they have a lot of great ideas and lots of suggestions that they would like to put forward. I know that the, the specials um, populations at each school are different and we'll definitely need to work with principals to say how might this work and you know depending on how staffing works with those that are the 100% e-learning teachers how how will that impact your specials as well so there's a lot of pieces to think about to arrange that and then um, Dr. Tucker mentioned the the professional development so we will have some professional development starting this week in which we will bring some of our collaborative groups together just to give them time to discuss um, you know, what worked well during remote learning and what will you need to switch and change. And one of those groups is our specials and electives. And then we'll continue to do e-learning professional development in early August, where we continue to continue those conversations for all of our teachers, including our specials and electives as well. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Director Hanson, I know you have a question. Go ahead. Thank you. I've debated whether to ask this and how to ask this, but I think it warrants just mentioning. Um, as a part of our safety committee, I know the extreme level of thought that goes into all of the different um, protections of our actual facilities. And I love the idea of outdoor learning. I love the idea of the tents. Um, I know we're going to have to explore some new ideas, but I just want to make sure that Rich Payne is a part of these conversations and that 
while we are considering all of the aspects of COVID, we're also considering and, and finding ways to um, respect both aspects of safety and um, just making sure that we're not completely disregarding all of the things that we have learned in the past about school safety. Very good. Mr. Knight? Yes, yeah, so Rich Payne, as well as other members of our safety team, are currently finalizing a board memo on exactly some of our posture changes. There are obviously several things that we don't want to share with the general public, but we will continue to make sure that student and staff safety and security are of the utmost importance, and many of uh, those strategies are easily adaptable to any of these learning postures, but you should have that information um, in your inbox shortly. Very good. I appreciate that. And I have one more question. Um, the, the cleaning sounds like a fabulous idea in theory, and I'm just wondering what that looks like in reality and who is going to be responsible for all of this. I'm not sure if anyone's done that math, but um, I'm assuming this is going to be a pretty significant time commitment and I'm not sure how our teachers are going to manage that on top of all of the other expectations. Mr. Cosgrove. Director Hansen, thank you very much for the question. As far as the building engineers and contract cleaners, we have already locked in our contracts. They are aware of that protocol that will be required. They will be managed by our custodial group leads and uh, custodial manager and director of operations as they do every year. So it's basically just a change in their task that we will be monitoring. As far as the disinfection of any learning materials uh, and or the playground, um, we will continue to work with school leadership, the directors of schools and school principals to see the most efficient way to have those disinfections occur as needed. The supplies will certainly be there. We just need to finalize those details. Mr. Kosker, while you're there, um, outdoor education. I know you mentioned there's no field trips uh, for transportation. What, what's the status of our outdoor education program? Uh, we are currently uh, working with our director of outdoor ed. Um, at this time, we're not planning on having students on site down at Stone Canyon. However, she has been looking at plans to bring her programming onto school sites so Very that good. we can maintain distancing. And she's been running day camps um, throughout the summer very effectively. Uh, and she's pretty confident we can have a great program on site. Okay, very good, thank you. Director Long. Thank you. Um, I have questions about, you know, locker, because we are not going to provide any lockers at all. So how could the student put their PE equipment or their band equipment? Um, that, that would create some logistic, you know, problem for them without a locker, especially for high school students. Um, we, have you considered what, what solutions we're going to have? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that we, we're trying to work through that because, yeah, we're not congregating in locker rooms right now. They're not using kids. They're just bringing their own equipment with them. They're bringing their own. They come ready to go, you know, and so um, we, we have talked about that, but we, we, we don't want them congregating in locker rooms as we speak with the guidance we have. So we don't have a good solution to that at this time for the lockers. Okay, my second question is um, open campus. Currently, the high school allow open campus for students to go out to have lunch. Um, that would create a logistic nightmare. Um, when they come back, we don't know who do they talk to. We don't know who do they touch. And so have we considered, are we going to still allow open campus you know, for lunch? And, and if we don't, do we have enough lunch options for the student um, to, to have a school so that they don't have, they don't have to go out to lunch. Because I, I can see that even though in the morning the parents swear to God that you know, they're fine, but after they go to lunch, who knows, you know, who do they touch? Mr. Knight. Thank you, Director Long. That's a, a very good question and one that we have discussed. Current guidance is to um, obviously keep kids as cohorted as much as possible. And as we talked about, we'll work at that with each individual level. It is very difficult at most of our comprehensive high schools to not have open campus. Um, there simply aren't enough places to sit. There simply isn't enough time in the day to 
add more lunch periods. So that is a variable that our DOS and principals will have to work through and figure out again, how do we make sure every kid is fed while keeping the greatest amount of cohorting available? All right. All right, directors, I want to wrap up uh, operations and move on to human resources. Thank you, one and all, for your presentation. Amanda Thompson, Chief Human Resource Officer. I'm sorry, Dr. Tucker, I didn't give you the uh, pleasure of, of, of cleaning and uh, preparing. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon to you all that are here as well. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, present. Mrs. Thompson, if you'll, yeah, I think. It is my pleasure to present updates to all of you and to all of our amazing employees out there uh, regarding any supports and resources available along with processes as we return to school. I want to start off by thanking um, all of our school leadership, our DOS, O&M, HR directors, and so many more leaders and individuals, our principals, for continuing to engage in that process with us. We've been hard at work um, in partnership with all of these individuals around the accommodations processes, equipment needs, and um, as I've shared before, it is really imperative that we continue to collaborate across departments and with our personnel regarding these procedures. So in terms of employee support, we are pleased to offer in Human Resources a multitude of supports for our employees. So we, um, in partnership with Nancy's team, we have clear protocols in place, that just skipped, um, in terms of health and safety measures for staff. And there were links in the earlier part of the presentation around equipment and processes and isolation um, flow charts and things like that. So uh, everyone can find those resources and protocols back there in the previous part of the presentation. We also have in place clear absence and leave processes that are very similar to what employees are already experiencing on any given day or time outside of this when they need to take a leave. Our benefits team has been ready and available supporting with uh, what to do to support our employees with a leave, what processes need to be in place, and what documentation needs to be provided. Soon, in all of the written procedures that are coming out, you will see flow charts around any kind of leaves and um, paperwork needed in terms of relative to a COVID type leave. We also have clear accommodations processes in place. No, that's an active link for people to click on and see what those are that leads you directly to our website. Employees, if they have a health need, if they have, um, if they're part of that vulnerable individuals group, and or if they have another reason that they may request equipment or an alternative teaching location, such as e-learning, they may fill out an accommodations request form through this process that you can find online. We have had people continuing to do so since you know a few months ago. So we do know we have employees that are waiting for more information. Um, part of that is it's that perfect timing altogether. Part of that is what is that desire and need in order to support all of our kids out in the system um, who want that e-learning opportunity. Some of the requests are equipment needs and we thank Mr. Cosgrove and his team for partnering with us because a lot of those have been provided as universal supports for our employees. Um, as we continue to receive requests, we have been in close communication with our DOS and our school principals to make sure they are aware of what those requests are of their employees. That's part of that interactive process, along with communicating with our employees um, about what that process looks like as well. Some might need that medical documentation to support their request. Once we have that information from the school side, the school leadership side regarding how many positions and exactly how that student e-learning data pans out, whether it be by level, by subject, and so forth, that's when we can go fast at work to start to begin that placement process. And I'm pleased to share that we already have meetings, I would call them extended work sessions with our leadership, 
um, including our DOS, which will also mean conversation with our principals around what positions that we can accommodate with, of course, knowing by law we need to look at particular requests first. For example, those that fall within that medically um, in needing of support type request. After we work through all of that placement, um, what we will do, please know, we will try as much as we can to keep people as close to their um, level as we can. We may also need to look at feeder, region. Um, like Mr. Knight shared earlier, there may be some anomaly type position where based upon student need, we may have a very unique position, say at a high school, that we won't have enough um, e-learning um, students for an entire, um, each school, but we may have to look at it in a broader sense as, as well. So as you can imagine, it's a complicated puzzle, one that we take very seriously, and one that we are very grateful for the support um, of our DOS, of our school leadership, and of our principals. So we notify the principals of that. From there is that other domino that comes right after that. The domino of what position does that create over here by placing someone in an e-learning position. Um, we will determine what those positions are in partnership with our school and DOS. And then HR is very prepared to um, post as soon as possible and expedite hiring processes as well and create pools of candidates for our schools to select from in order to fill those positions. In terms of benefits, uh, I, employees may have seen this FFCRA, Families First Coronavirus Response Act poster. I brought a copy of it as well. Um, we have it posted on our website. Um, it's a very um, quick access type flyer um, that helps employees to know what their rights are in leave up in, under coronavirus. So know that we encourage our employees, should they need to be um, uh, quarantined or take a leave or have uh, various types of other needs like a, a child care need due to COVID, um, that they utilize those leave hours first before tapping into their own. That is why they are here and we're so thankful that our employees don't have to access their own leave first. We also have short-term disability available once leave is exhausted. Depending upon the situation, there may be leave um, times where, an uh, say, an employee has to quarantine but they have no symptoms. They may be able to still teach um, their students in, in a different capacity without needing to utilize their leave time. So know that we're still working with our legal team through all of those nuances, and we understand that each and every employee situation is unique, uh, and so we'll work to be very mindful of each of those details and ensure our employees know of their rights. As shared earlier, we have access to testing for our employees through our benefit plans. Both Kaiser Cigna Allegiance offer that. And that is also an active link, employee testing resources that we will continually update with Ms. Ingalls team. That also includes community testing events. And she also shared earlier around regular testing opportunities for staff. We also know during this time, it's extremely important on a regular basis, and especially during this time, to take care of um, ourselves as employees. We have so many staff and mental health supports uh, staff wellness supports for our employees. We have our employee assistance program available that provides um, counseling and other resources directly to our employees and their immediate families. We also have wellness resources from Kaiser and Cigna, whether it's online support, it's webinars, it's mindfulness activities, relaxation techniques. There are so many resources. I encourage everyone to take a look at this link. Our benefit plans also offer mental health supports. And then our district wellness department has mindfulness activities and wellness activities, including a new app called My Strength that helps you manage day-to-day -day things, make sure you're taking care of yourself as well. And again, lots of free programs, webinars, and resources. Substitute teachers is another support to our entire system. I know that's been a question that has come up. We continue to hire 
our subs on a daily basis. We surveyed our current subs, and we have over 500 subs excited, available, and ready to go back to work. I know that there was an impact in spring. We are glad that they have stuck with us, and we are ready to support them via training, whether that be around curricular resources, uh, safety protocols, e-learning supports, and, and much more. So they know they can reach out to us at any time with any additional training opportunities that may, they may need. That is a link as well to hiring additional subs. We are hiring more as we speak. As of last week, we had around 60 new subs that joined onto this number of 500. So that is still an active posting. And we encourage in, any individual out in the system who um, has experience and a desire to make a difference in the life of kids and support teachers to consider applying. We also um, are exploring student teachers and other non-licensed staff gathering their sub-license. There are various levels of sub-licenses and authorizations through the Colorado Department of Education. And there is more information on our website on how to obtain that. And that is part of that ongoing um, fluid support for our schools when vacancies occur. If an EA were to need to go in and support, we would have um, uh, flexible subbing opportunities. Um, I have, I have my teaching license. I am ready and uh, available to go in and support the amazing work of our schools as well. What questions do you have for me and how can I support? All right, directors. What questions do you have regarding human resources? Uh, Director Long, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna ask two questions, two first, and uh, I'll come back if nobody asks the other questions. Um, so my concern is even with the COVID sick days that you have mentioned, the 80 hours, which is going to be equal to two weeks, and the quarantine day, if you're suspect of having COVID, is a 14 days. Um, so in a nutshell, if you are being suspected have COVID, you not only exhausted what you have over there, you probably have to take a couple of your personal day mm -hmm. to cover it. Um, how we can do better for our staff um, so that we could uh, help them out um, of trying to cover the entire you know, uh, periods uh, for the sick leave. And also for our staff that has children in, um, in school, if we choose a hybrid model, for example, so they, they may, what kind of programs are we going to give to them so that they can have some, some more flexible time to take care of their family? Because our employees is the most important asset of the school district, and they know whether we're taking care of them or not. So, yeah. Thank you for those questions. I could not agree more in that our employees are an extremely important asset in our system. Regarding the daycare piece that you had mentioned um, in order to support employees' families while they um, are adjusting to a particular teaching and learning model, um, as shared earlier, we will continue to explore those options. It's a cross-departmental conversation, so know that we'll continue to look into that. I know there are some other ideas out there in the surrounding districts that we could learn from as well. Regarding employees' leave time, um, we do know, again, the FFCRA 80 hours leave is something that we want our employees to, to exhaust first. Um, they do, uh, every employee gets a certain amount of leave time per year um, to access and utilize. And from there, um, they have access to short-term disability, which is at 70% of pay. Uh, and then long-term disability support should it go on much, much longer. Um, in terms of exploring any other additional resources around protecting employees' leave time, I'll need to have further conversation um, across departments to see what resources could be available, if any. Just a quick follow-up. The 14-day the requirement for a quarantine, is that work day or calendar day? I will refer to our experts. It's calendar, calendar day. day. <laughs> so, so. So technically, an 80-hour week could cover 14 days of quarantine. Yes. All right, Director Meek. Ms. Thompson, can you talk through a little bit what the process looks like for a teacher or employee that calls and says they need an accommodation and what that process looks like mm -hmm. and what the options are? 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. So if an employee um, has a need for an accommodation, they contact our accommodations office. And um, number one, uh, this information is any health-related uh, items. Those are kept confidential. And uh, yet we do need to have conversations with their supervisor about their request for an accommodation. There is a form that they fill out through our accommodations office. And all of that information is available online through our, you'll see ADA, um, our ADA office. And we review that information and contact the employee to learn more information about that to ensure that we're engaging in that interactive process and truly understand the scope of their need and request. For example, they may have a health condition that makes it very difficult for them, um, puts them at great risk to be in an in-person environment. Um, as shared by guidelines of, of which of those, if say severe asthma and some other underlying conditions. Um, while they fill this information out, they're seeking that documentation from their um, medical provider, their certified medical provider. And we review that information along with have that initial conversation with their supervisor that there is a health related need that would deem them needing to request um, an e-learning environment, for example. Once we uh, see if we, what positions we have available for that person, we try to best place them if there, are, uh, if there are available positions at that time, depending upon the timing of everything. And we would place them into that position for that duration while we have that e-learning opportunity in place for students and staff. Um, we make all of those um, changes internally for that duration of time. Um, and in the instance that we go back to um, the way it was before all of this came, they would be put back into their original position as well. Did I answer your question, Director Meek? You did, and I'm okay. just wondering, do we have enough time to go through those requests and get everything up and running in time for an mm -hmm. August 17th start? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, we have been working on this actually for months. Um, employees have reached out, and, and we would continue to encourage all of our employees, if you are considering um, requesting an accommodation, please do so as soon as possible. I have staff looking at it all the time. Someone's watching the request right now as we speak. Um, because we want to process those in as timely of a manner as possible, knowing that our school leaders have that domino effect of planning and posting and, and things like that as well. Um, it, it is... Um, it is a tight timeline, and we are willing to work with any timeline that we have. Um, and we know, as I shared earlier, we have conversations and meetings occurring with our DOS Monday, starting extended work sessions. And we review them constantly, have initial determinations. Um, so we will work within the parameters that we have to ensure that um, we can support our students and staff. If I could just follow up with Director Meek's question, is there an appeals process um, so when HR decides whether to approve or decline a request, and, and I guess a real life example is we've got a teacher, a speech and language teacher who requested a face shield and a plexiglass mm -hmm. uh, shield so she could see her student as well as students see her. The shield was approved, but the plexiglass um, was not. And is, is there a process for that, I guess, is one question I have. And then two, it just seems to me we ought to be accommodating, if someone's coming up with a solution mm -hmm. of how they can come back to work safely, mm -hmm. it just seems like we should be bending over backwards to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of help me understand what mm -hmm. happens after I get that letter and it says, no, you can have this, but you can't have this. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that example my way for my follow-up and, and review. Uh, so part of that is engaging with uh, O&M to determine the feasibility of that equipment request. In this instance, if a request is denied, we go back to the employee and say, depending on that request, is there anything else that we can do or provide to allow you to um, do your, your job based on your needs in person or under the structure? So it sounds like to me there is a potential need to go back and re-engage in that interactive process. Very good, thank you for that. Director Chanchashore, Director Hansen, after Director Chanchashore, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Director A. I had, in the last six and a half hours, I've been thinking about this, and it reminds me of the book, um, Choose Your Adventure, School Experience. 
and thinking about all the different um, ripple effects and repercussions of three different uh, options. And the one I'm thinking about right now is the choose your adventure. If you have 100% in person, then you have full staff and everyone is status quo. So bus drivers, paraprofessionals, classified support personnel, and teachers when it comes to financial implications. If you have 100% remote, that changes the financial implications um, possibly. Um, I'm wondering if we thought about what are the financial implications and what are the ripple effects if there's 100% remote, you don't have bus drivers necessarily working. You don't have all of your paraprofessionals or your classified staff necessarily working at the same capacity. Have we looked at the financial implications or discussed in those three scenarios what that might look like? And is there a significant difference? Section 8 is coming up, Director Chancha Shore, so you're just a little bit early. And above just okay. implications will be discussed at that time. All right, Director Hansen. Thank you. Director Hansen, go ahead. Sorry, I've got a lot of technology happening here. It's a lot to juggle. Um, I have several questions, if you'll bear with me. Um, my first question is that it, it seems like we're almost hoping for a magical balance of teachers needing to be a part of our e-learning platform and students wanting to participate in that platform. I know that we have very rough data from our parent surveys about the, the number of students that will be interested or um, likely to enroll in our e-learning option. I'm curious if the initial data that we have from teachers requesting to participate in that platform is close or if we can already tell that we're not going to hit that magic balance. Thank you for that. I, um, we are going to review that data actually next week on Monday in partnership with our DOS um, staff data. I would just say um, right now it, things aren't perfectly even. Um, we have smatterings at each level. We are looking at it by subject area as well. Uh, we would need to see what that student data looks like in a little bit more detail knowing that it uh, recently closed and is being disaggregated for, for review. But, but you are right. Um, I would say in rare instances would it work out perfectly even. And I'll also add, as Mr. Veit pointed out, uh, once we focus on one option for right now, that will shape, uh, give us a great idea. It will start to shape the decisions for staff, whether e-learning or hybrid or what have you. So again, uh, at the end of this meeting, Amanda and her team in consultation with our EDOS and cross departments, including legal, will we'll be able to hammer this out. You are exactly correct. All right. Are there other questions, directors, on regarding human resources? Director Lung? Um, do we have a procedure? Does the current board procedure give um, enough authority to discipline anybody that um, do not follow the COVID requirement, um, such as face masks. Mm -hmm. um, Thank and, you. And can you, I do plan to spell it out to all the staff and students clearly what's the consequence um, if they do not follow the board directions, um, whatever we decide today um, on mm -hmm. how to reopen school? Um, that's my question number one. Thank you, and I can speak to the staff side. In terms of staff who uh, struggle with adhering to safety procedures and protocols and expectations, um, we, we first have those individuals who fall within a medical need where they are unable to, and we work through that process, um, and we provide that accommodation. For those that can and should and don't, uh, we engage in a conversation uh, that would look like starting with the supervisor over that individual for further conversation to better understand and learn can progressively increase all the way up to 
um, documented conversations, all the way up to disciplinary procedures. Okay. Director Meek. So mine is somewhat aligned to Dr. Lung, but I'm thinking of the um, daily symptom screening from the staff side, but it's also the student side. And, you know, how that is being tracked and monitored, and is that a site-based responsibility? Is that a district-based responsibility? Okay. We're gonna, I welcome our team up. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll ask Nancy to address the portion about uh, screening for students and staff. Uh, 60 seconds real quick on here regarding discipline. Uh, I've had some great conversations with several uh, of our board members and staff. We don't want to look at violating the mask as a punitive disciplinary issue. We want this to start out being uh, learning, uh, taking advantage of new learning opportunities in a new environment. Uh, when you look in our revised plan, uh, it speaks to the staff uh, procedures uh, when there are issues regarding staff and masking. There is also uh, a portion of regarding how we address issues with the students. But again, our job as, a, as an entire community is to encourage masking for students and staff, but we do have procedures laid out, developed, and, and approved by uh, our principals, and some of our principals are still on right now. Thank you for still being on. Nancy. Regarding monitoring the daily symptom checking, uh, we will be working with our technology department, school leadership, and principals to determine how that will happen. It does need to be at the site-based level. Uh, but depending on if we're going to use the app or what um, tool we're going to use, we would look to see how we could interface that with rosters and things like that to make it as easy as possible for schools. Director Hansen, if you'll wrap us up with this section, Director Hansen. Thank you. Um, this doesn't necessarily fit perfectly within HR, but I'm not sure where else to ask it. And I feel like it's something that I need some clarity on. Um, and I'm assuming our teachers and possibly building principals do as well. Um, is there any potential scenario where a teacher or principal could create liability for themselves if a child came to school and um, there, there was a situation where the child wasn't wearing a mask and, and other people within the class got infected. Um, just all of the, all of the what ifs, um, I just am hoping we can give some of our staff the assurance they need that um, there wouldn't be any liability for them individually. That um, is a legal question, and so I would uh, defer to our legal team for that. And we can definitely get you the answer to that. All right, very good. Ms. Thompson, thank you very okay. much. For thank you, and, and please know um, in HR, we are here to serve and support you. So if there's anything that we can do, leaders um, and, and employees, please contact us. Very good, all right, Dr. Tucker, the next section. Well, now we'll welcome Mr. Sethi, our Chief Technology Officer, to give us an update on uh, technology and some lessons learned from last spring. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. <clears throat> um, obviously, technology became the front and center of uh, delivering <laughs> education in the last few months. We, in all the feedback we received till date, and in terms of planning for what's to come with all the fluid options, we feel we are adequately prepared in terms of the computers and the infrastructure we need. Our schools currently have almost 40,000 devices with them available to use in the classroom if we do in-person learning. Or if we go hybrid, they're able to check out to students who don't have devices at home and can use them at home. 
We also have on order about, <clears throat> at last count it was about 5,000 computers we have in our warehouse sitting ready to go to schools who need a replacement computers. Um, we also have 700 teacher laptops uh, coming in, shipping in from um, China, uh, but coming in hopefully in the next two weeks to be able to go to classrooms. There is some questions around cleaning. I think that's sort of the big question that keeps coming up. Um, we have clear recommendations in here, but I'm happy to repeat it. We would love for our schools to be able to assign technology to students, so there's not a lot of keyboard sharing. Historically, there have been carts which are used between classrooms, so there's keyboards which get shared. Um, in our secondary schools, some of our secondary schools have allowed uh, bring your own device from the very get-go, and that is a great strategy here. If our students can bring their own devices and our parents allow them, we would strongly recommend that the students bring their own devices. That way they're not sharing those devices. They stay with them. Nobody's touching them. It doesn't require to be cleaned. For lab computers, which is going to happen in a few cases, we have a protocol for using wipes. You have seen the protocol for cleaning our equipment, um, and we have clearly demonstrated it's possible to do it. Uh, so that's all those, all those options are in the plan. Um, we're happy to answer any questions or provide additional support as needed. Very good. Questions regarding the, the technology and, and indeed, as you said, Mr. Sethi earlier, you have been the man of the hour during this time. So we are truly grateful for all the it's work. It's team effort. I have yeah. to give kudos to our team. We were, there's staff which is probably watching right now because that's what they do all the time. They're always <laughs> hooked in and connected. Uh, they were handing out computers in April when yes. everybody was under lockdown, we were giving out computers to five, almost 700 parents who drove by in a drive through line. So that, that was definitely a team effort. Truly a remarkable thing to see. Directors, any, anything else regarding uh, Director Holtzman? Yep. I just have one, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but in terms of the health screenings, I think that you said you were looking into an app or maybe we already have one. If you could just help us understand if you need more support in that area or how that will look at our schools. We have, so for the schools who already started and for the staff when we come in, we created a really simple uh, form for to capture basic health screening data. That data is um, in real time available to our nursing staff to review it. When we think about scaling that to 55,000 students and another five, 7,000 employees, if everybody was in the building, we could we have a, a solution we can put together with our internal homegrown version, but we have also heard of the vendor partners, which they're coming in with testing plus app plus another solution. So we are working with all of those options. I'm pretty confident we'll have a solution. I'm, I'm actually pretty sure we'll have a solution. Uh, we want to make it the simplest solution for our staff to monitor. We also wanted to make the the best solution to give us a heads up in case there's a trend going on in our buildings. And I guess just as a follow-up, um, the cost question. Sounds like if you were working with a partner, maybe there would be no cost, or I don't, just an estimate of costs for those options that you talked about. Yeah, so the solution we, we built internally, obviously uh, we have our own staff building it, so that's, that's definitely no cost. For the vendor solution, I understand that the cost is actually built to the testing side of the solution. And then the monitoring side is sort of included in there because it's interconnected. But the cost is built into the testing side, which depends on how many tests you get. Director Hansen and then Director Graziano. I just wanted to follow up with my previous question. Do you know, just a general ballpark gap, um, how many of our schools have the one-to-one -one ratio for Chromebooks and students? and um, how many will need to purchase additional devices? So I'd mentioned earlier, we have about 40,000 devices already in our buildings. Uh, many of our elementary schools are some on here, and uh, John White School is a shining example. They have been one-to-one -one, um, in their buildings for a, for a long time now. So there's, there's enough schools who have one-to-one. -one. I would, I would uh, remind us that we would prefer school, students who can bring their own devices to bring their own devices that keeps it easy enough so you don't have to share them. But for families who can't afford, obviously, or don't have a device at home which they can share if they're siblings, potentially, our school should have adequate number of devices to, to loan out to those families. All right, Director Graziano. 
In regards to um, the question that Director Holzman had around the, that application to help with the uh, Screen. testing, screening information, does it um, pose any privacy or healthcare HIPAA-related uh, risks? To we yeah. So um, our understanding is one of those partners is working with multiple schools. So when you start working with schools, Colorado has data privacy laws which require them to sign the data privacy for all the school districts. So that would most likely be covered. It's a, it's a rapidly evolving situation. They're building this as they're flying this. So we'll make sure before we implement it, we will have crossed those. Yeah, we would definitely make sure that the HIPAA and the, and the student DPA, which is a little more different than traditional HIPAA, which is student data privacy agreements, are pretty tied with our legal team and the partners. Very good. Any other questions, directors? All right, Mr. Sethi, once again, thank you sure. for that. Um, as we get ready for our next section, as Dr. Tucker is, uh, is uh, doing his thing, <laughs> um, Director Hansen and directors and principals that are still with us, um, regarding the legal question around liability, um, certainly Mrs. Clemish has let me know that she will be providing a memo not only to the board, but also to our building leaders that you understand what are the liability issues that are out there and what are the legal parameters that we have to adhere to. So just know that that will be provided to all of us in memo format. Next up, Dr. Tucker. Yes, I wanna make sure I keep my six feet here. I uh, want to uh, welcome uh, Kate Kataska, our new chief financial officer. And I tell you what, Kate has just really jumped in. I know many of you have already met her. And for some of you, this is the first time you've met her uh, in person. And she has really jumped in like a member of the Douglas County School District family. Uh, she's extra sharp. And uh, as Director Ray pointed out earlier, uh, she has a lot of talent uh, over in the financial side of the house. And uh, she's up to speed. And uh, she, I won't say she's, she hasn't missed a beat. She really hasn't. She's just jumped right in. So let's talk a little bit about budget and money. Thank you so much. So this will probably be the only uh, slide or presentation I'll get away with not having a number on it other than in the header and the footer. Um, the short answer here is there's still a lot we don't know and a lot's gonna come down to especially how our express check-in plays out and where Ms. Thompson talked about the alignment of teachers who are seeking to work remotely either for you know, an ADA accommodation or whatever reason they might have to, and our students and families that are choosing to learn remotely. And we don't quite know how that puzzle, that, that matchmaking event is going to occur. And so that's really our, our biggest unknown. That is the biggest portion of our budget is our staff and our people. And so to, to start making those assumptions now just wouldn't be prudent. We just don't have all the facts. While we know, you know general percentages of, of what uh, percentages of our students are indicating they would like to be 100% uh, e-learning, again, we don't know whether that's gonna be high school, middle school, elementary school, what grade configurations, what student needs those would be supporting uh, and aligning those staff. On the non-personnel side, we have been deploying and sourcing and getting all of the um, uh, uh, related supports and services sourced, purchased, distributed out to buildings. You heard a lot from Mr. Crossgrove about the PPE materials, uh, getting out to buildings, um, things like tents and outdoor furniture and looking into all of that, those types of resources and really deploying all of that stuff that is known that we know we need immediately and we know we need it in time for, for school to start. Uh, the other big bit of unknown is always around the School Finance Act and our rev revenue uncertainty. Um, along with that express check-in uh, comes the true up in October to confirm our funded pupil count. So without knowing what uh, and how many families might choose either our charter options or out of district options or move into homeschooling options, we have a pretty big risk to our overall funded pupil count coming in below what we've had projected. Um, and as I think I talked about um, in a couple presentations ago, um, that, that looming mid-year rescission is, is just sort of always there. So um, I hate to, like I said, I hate to stand up here and not give you firm numbers. Um, that, is, that is part of my job to be able to do that. I, there's, just, there's just too much unknown and we're really waiting to see where those um, firm response rates come from our parents in terms of what they're choosing in terms of their options and how that aligns to the available staff that we have 
not to mention our um, choice between 100% e-learning, hybrid, or 100% um, in-person. So um, other quick update is around our relief funding. We've heard a lot of suggested uses for our different buckets of money. Um, I will keep reiterating that our largest bucket of money, which is around $20 million that we have available to the district, ends at the end of December. So as we think about, you know, whether it's um, extending leave time, substitute cost, flushing or pushing in additional staff, where we might need additional um, paraprofessional support or whatever that might be, all of that uh, would have to be completed by the end of December. Otherwise, we're gonna to need to be taking half of whatever that, that cost is and making sure that we have those appropriate reserves within our general fund to be able to complete us through the end of the year. So I just wanna keep reminding folks of that, 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 that while it's very large and we will spend every dime, uh, it does have that end date. So we need to be really cautious about what it is that we're putting into those relief funds. So with that, um, I will close and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kataska. Just a quick question regarding that timeline in December. Do, is there any um, creativity around that as far as, for instance, can we hire people under the understanding that that position will go away after December, should the, depending whether the funds get replenished or not? Because there's, you know, our state legislature is always, or our national Congress is always doing something as far as trying to put more monies into this relief package. So any, any creative, I know that this kind of rules out personnel is what we've heard in the past because we have to pay personnel for 12 months as opposed to just till December. But any creativity around this with that deadline of December? We absolutely could pay personnel. And if we truly are willing to make that a half year contract or a semester long contract, um, that is allowable within the grant as long as it is support supporting um, COVID-related activities, online learning, professional development, health-related services, um, those types of things. Uh, but we would have to be willing to say that that truly is a through December contract um, and be willing to um, reduce that position or have that go away, making it temporary or contracted or you know, uh, whatever that might be. Very good. So we can, we can sorry we continue to look for those things that are more um, one time in nature where we could do a supplemental pay um, or or something like that. Very good, thank you, Director Graziano. Yeah, uh, my question is just around um, given the unknowns, what's the timeline? Could you give? Do you have like the dates and all when you'll that information will become known that we'll be able to have more information? Sure. Um, the biggest one is on express check in so that we can really tr uh, truly see what our families are firmly choosing and then matching that up with our available teaching staff. So I think Amanda said we'll be reviewing um, uh, that information next week or after uh, express check-in opens up and we can start to see how that puzzle starts to fit together. Um, so that being sort of the, the biggest, uh, biggest piece out there. Uh, we also had one of our building leaders and we've developed a form to start capturing directly from schools and our leaders um, the things that they need in order to open schools. So while we've sourced and have within our inventory um, all of the different you know, PPE and different equipment, now we need to go and say how, how many of these packages do you need or how many of these things do you need that we've already sort of got you know, uh, sitting in stockpile and waiting to, waiting to deploy. So that'll, that'll be part of the process too, is just seeing what other things come out of that um, request form. Uh, and then we have a committee similar to our bond and oversight committee who will meet to review all of those and just you know, start, start making those approvals and getting those resources out as quickly as possible. Director Tajashore, I know you, had a, you, you asked a question earlier regarding uh, budget impacts for each of the learning models. I think we heard from Ms. Kataska that it's, She's not unable to give us those specifics because of so many unknowns, but was there more to your question than just um, budget impact differentiation between each model? Well, thank you, Director Ray. I think I just would love for us to have a running tab because we can't look into a crystal ball. We don't have the answers at this point, but I'd like for us to continue to think about what the financial implications are when you do have remote learning and you don't have classified pay, staff to pay and or uh, bus, bus drivers to pay or things like that. And of course, those are not reasons to make decisions, um, but it, I think it, it is judiciarily responsible to have that information. And I do appreciate that question and we are continuing to run those models. Um, 
One thing that we have to be aware of is while during the spring, when, when closure happened very quickly, we continued to pay much of that staff, even though some of those hourly workers weren't um, necessarily you know, in buildings doing, doing their daily jobs. So we would have to have some, some conversations around whether that is something we are prepared to continue to do um, if we move to that 100% e-learning model. Also recognizing that things get creative again. So if we are forced back to that 100% e-learning model, maybe then that opens up the emergency feeding and that changes what our bus drivers are doing and our food service workers and, and all of those types of things. But we are absolutely right. There are you know, different cost variables in each of those scenarios. Um, we're aware of them and continue to try to model them. I just don't quite you know, have the 100% the um, you know, absolute answer in terms of what that looks like yet. Director Long and then Director Thank Meade. Thank you. Well, welcome. <laughs> um, you know, it feels so bad that you take your job in, in July 1st and then, you know, <laughs> this is something that hit you. Um, I, I certainly understand take your time to, uh, you know, get uh, those informations for us. Um, my question is, um, right now, the way that we are giving our school the money, the care money, is very top down. Have you considered doing a bulk, bulk grant approach, which is we allocate 70 district school a certain amount of money based on their PPR, and then have the local building leader decided based on the guideline you give to them how they can use it? Because the approval process takes resources, take time, and take evaluations. And I truly believe that our awesome principal, which I serve with two of them right now on the board, they know what they're doing. They know the the lead of, uh, of their school much better than anybody else, and they can make the decision much faster as time goes, you know, comes so near with the school opening. Uh, have, you, have you considered that? Um, believe me, I'm a proponent of per-pupil funding, a weighted student funding approach, giving that, that autonomy and that discretion to our building leaders. Part of the challenge here is that guidance has been so slow to come out in terms of how we can actually use this money. So, you know, one, not wanting to push it out, full carte blanche access to it and have, have it had to be refunded or, you know, turn back and have our, our building leaders have to tap into their SBBs because something wasn't allowed or anything of that nature. Now that that guidance is becoming more clear, um, like I said, that was part of the purpose of that form was just to gather what does everyone need and how can we, how can we review that sort of across the board. Uh, and then lastly, I'll say is, is back to that puzzle. If we are gonna use any of this on, on staff or supplemental pay or to fill those gaps where that, that matchmaking between student choice and teacher choice doesn't align perfectly, that might not be a one building, one size fits all building approach. And so we're gonna to need to be able to have that flexibility to you know, put a little more over here and then a little less over here just depending on where those, those choices come out because I think that is gonna be our biggest use of that funding uh, is is making sure we can we can fill those gaps uh, with staff and students. And yeah. Director well, Meek. And making sure yes, of course, an equi equitable distribution of those resources. But um, except the guidance was our biggest hindrance, sort of in the beginning. Thanks. Uh, my questions are around the CARES Act money also, and knowing what a short timeline we have to make decisions for the CRF pot of money, the Corona Relief Funds. Um, you are able to make decisions on how to expend those without action from the board. Is that correct? If it is a, a threshold that is, I think it's about 500,000 and still getting my policies um, aligned, um, I believe that would be something we would be taking to this board for approval. Um, when it's been the you know, multiple purchases of face shields or masks or gloves or things like that, um, those haven't, you know, in, in total in that order, risen to that amount that requires board approval. But anything over that threshold would certainly come through. Okay, thanks. And then the other pot of money is the ESSER, which is about $1.3 million. And as I understand it, they can be spent in one of two ways. One would be um, a Title I allocation only versus um, dividing it up across all public and private schools. Correct. Um, is that a board decision on how those funds are spent, or what does that timeline look like? Um, I believe that would be an internal policy decision. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Tucker. Um, the, the timeline in terms of that, again, I hate to sound like I'm repeating myself, but it, it's, we're still waiting on some of that final guidance and to make sure there isn't a firm direction about which way we have to do it. Um, 
so in terms of that timeline, I, I can get back to you with a firmer date. Um, I need to talk to Ms. Schleisner, who's my, my expert on all things uh, ESSR, ESSER. <laughs> Very good. So, thank you. And so I'd just like to advocate to the board to consider using those funds to help our Title I schools. There are only four Title I schools. Two are, you know, our neighborhood schools, two are chart or, um, Hope Online. And I think we have the ability to decide that we want to allocate those towards the schools that have the highest need students. And I don't know if that's something that the board would want to have a conversation about before decisions are made. All right, very good. We'll, we'll put that on our to-do list. And my understanding, Director Meek and Ms. Kataska, is that that's like a $1.2 million kind of thing. So it's not a... Not that 1.2 million is not a lot of money, but for even for four schools, that goes pretty pretty quick. So um, the other thing I would add to that, if I may, um, is important also to keep in mind that our Title I schools have have received some direct Title I funding. I believe Hope Elementary, if I'm getting, I can't remember if it's elementary or middle, has also received Title I funding because that funding is in arrears. So they're being funded for the the students who were there um, last year. Um, and then also I'll just add is um, if we allocate directly to our Title I schools, that means we can only spend it on those four schools. So we wouldn't be able to support any of the district-wide potential needs, anything that were to occur after December, that we might be trying to uh, extend that runway for things that might start off in that CRF, the big bucket of funds, and have to move back into a different funding source. So just keeping that as mind as well in mind as well. Very good. Any other questions for Ms. Kataska? All right, again, welcome and thank, thank you. you. And uh, Dr. Tucker, if you will, move us on to the next section. Dr. Tucker's doing that. I do want to just, again, I see, uh, looks like uh, Mr. Gochi got done with his lunch. Um, so we're glad to have you back on. Um, but uh, thank you, principals, for hanging in there. Because one of the things we do want to come back to our discussion is um, the models of learning. And certainly what we haven't done yet is really finished our discussion around in 100% in-person learning model. And so I want to make sure that we, give, we do that justice uh, and circ circling back, because that's where we begin. Uh, but I, if, um, if all of you are gang, uh, gang to be able to stay on, we, we really appreciate you guys hanging in there. All right, Dr. Tucker. Uh, Director Ray, uh, directors and our folks here and our folks who are watching, um, I know we're getting close to the end of our presentation because we're getting low on uh, Clorox wipes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're very happy to uh, ask uh, Stacy Rader, uh, head of our communications, our communications officer, to come forward and uh, give us an update and address some of the concerns that uh, uh, Director Meek rightfully so raised. Uh, but before Stacy comes up, I want to publicly thank Stacy and her entire team, especially uh, the folks in communication, uh, you know, Nate and all those folks, Chris, Shaleen, uh, Jan, I can go on and on. Uh, in putting together the video, helping schools across the district communicate. And lastly, uh, Stacy, uh, a lot of us have had a bunch of sleepless nights, and I know you're right at the top. And so thank you for the tremendous amount of time you've put in. You've helped us take a theoretical framework of options, of choices on the 30th of June, and you're moving us uh, with your editorial skills along with Mary Clemish's skills to one of the more uh, comprehensive yet uh, changing plans uh, that we have that I hope that this entire community is proud of. So thank you. There we go. And thank you, board, for um, having the communication section of this plan um, presented because it is, it, it's incredibly important. And it's difficult as, as the last couple of weeks or months, I shouldn't say weeks, years, whatever, um, have been, the, the, good, the positive part of being so intricately involved in 
helping to write the plan with all of the hard work our task force and our staff have, have done is I get to really understand every piece of that plan, which will come in very handy as we start to communicate it. So I'm not going back researching and trying to figure this out from scratch. But I will say, putting together all of these pieces into one document hasn't been easy. And I give kudos to all of you on the board and all of the staff, because I, I read somewhere that this is like putting together the hardest 3D jigsaw puzzle. And that's exactly right. And I'm not even a big puzzle person, but it's just <laughs> super hard. So um, I appreciate it. Just real quick, I know there's two pieces here. One's gonna be parent engagement and really making sure that our families and our staff know what's happening and know what it means for them and their families. And then the other piece of this, which I don't have a slide for, but we'll touch on is how do we notify families if there is an outbreak at a school um, in regards to COVID? So I'll start with the bigger picture. I'm gonna get that full road to return plan document finished and designed and translated if it kills me. <laughs> so we are so close. Um, we are gonna have it translated into Spanish, Chinese, and Russian, and we are gonna have it professionally designed and up on our website. Um, we are also making sure, and we've only been doing this really since the closure in March, um, but making sure that the email updates that are going out, um, that we also have those available in um, not just Spanish, but also Chinese and Russian. So making sure that more of our families are able to understand what's happening um, in the language they're comfortable with. We are doing a lot of email updates. Um, I didn't even realize how, much we, how many we had done until one of my colleagues pulled them. We've done 70 email updates just since um, March. Um, so I'm quite proud of that, but it's also it's a lot of information, and I know that can be information overload at the same time. But we're gonna continue to do email updates to our families. When those are extra critical, we do a push via text and mobile app, just letting people know, please make sure to check your email. We have the Road to Return page up on our website, as I'm sure you've seen. This is really a next phase of what we had up over the past few months. We had a very comprehensive page up while we were monitoring coronavirus that had a lot of different resources for family and staff. What does coronavirus mean? Um, how to talk to your children, mental health resources. This is continuing, but now we're looking forward to the return to school, whatever that may look like. This page will be ever changing. We will have frequently asked questions and answers. I am listening, those of you who are um, watching and on social media, if I don't answer every single comment on our Facebook page or Twitter, I am still writing down every single question that comes through and adding it to our documents so we can get answers. Same with principals that are sending in, in questions via email. Um, informational videos, just as the one you saw earlier, I'd like to do more of those. Um, Chris Chalene has been great in working with our operations and management staff, even doing small videos about how to sanitize properly. So um, those have been fantastic. We are gonna do more virtual town hall meetings, just like we did a few months back. One thing I've noticed about this pandemic crisis, if you will, is parents and staff are engaged. Um, there's no question. We've had in-person town hall meetings in the past where maybe we got 20, 25 people, and we're seeing upwards of 1,000 people at virtual town hall meetings. Um, the last board meeting had a total of 20,000 views by the time it was said and done, so just to give you an idea. Um, we have an engaged community, and I really want to capture that and make the best of it and make sure that our families do have the information that they need. Um, we do have a carousel banner um, and dedicated button on our homepage so that it's easy to find the road to return information. And um, Director Holtzman, to your um, comment on email, we've made it easier to find the staff information as well. The next virtual town hall meetings, we're gonna do one for community, one for staff, will come um, after we have a, I don't wanna say a, a approval of plan isn't really the right word, but when we know what model we're gonna go with after this meeting. We will have virtual town halls scheduled and we will be listening to our families and, and our staff in terms of what their concerns are and what additional questions we can answer. And we always welcome questions on email, telephone, 
um, our, our website form, social media, and so far our community is not shy about asking, um, which is great, but we, we always welcome that. We're gonna ask our board for some help in this next phase as we start getting information out. I'm gonna be pushing on you to help share some information on your social media pages. Um, I will be posting to different community, Facebook pages, moms groups, human, uh, human resources, Highlands Ranch Speakeasy. Um, and then I wanna ask board members, communication team members, school staff, anybody I can get to also help us share on local next door pages. We'll continue to do press releases and responses to media questions. Um, and then I also wanna have a real easy messaging toolkit for our principals. I in no means think that communications is the job of the principals, you have enough on your plate, but I do want you to have access to easy social media posts, newsletter blurbs, sample emails to families that you can use and have those at your fingertips. I have a ton of key messages that I have that I know that we need to make sure that we are touching on. Um, and to your point, Director Meek, that includes what model we're gonna start with, um, that people still have that option for e-learning regardless, um, unless of course we're all on e-learning, um, that participation in athletics and activities is still available, what families can expect when they go back to school, um, what's gonna happen with bus routes. So we'll be working with transportation to make sure that any affected bus routes um, that those families are communicated with. How to apply for re free and reduced lunch is gonna be a big push, not something we've really pushed in the past, but I think it's extra important right now. Um, express check-in, when does it open, how to, how to do that. Um, and then talking to the foundation and seeing if there might be a partnership opportunity for us to um, encourage community members who want to to make donations to the foundation to help families with costs um, during this time. And with the new partnership with COVID Check Colorado, I think that will be huge and we'll definitely wanna let, um, especially our staff know what's available to them and how to access that in terms of testing. We'll I will continue to partner with our English language department and make sure that we're communicating and getting messages out to our non-English speaking families as well. And switching gears real quick before I, I hand it over and, and, and take questions. In terms of protocols, um, we have communications has a great relationship with our health, wellness, and prevention department, our nursing department. Currently, and before COVID, if we have a situation where there is an outbreak in a school, and that has different definitions depending on what we're talking about, we work very close in, closely with our nursing staff who works very closely with Tri-County Health. So if we had five cases of hand, foot, and mouth disease in an elementary school, for example, nursing staff would be in touch with Tri-County Health and they would be in, trust, in touch with communications. We have a bunch of template letters from Tri-County that we use that tell parents what to look for in terms of symptoms for whatever it may be. But we don't feel like that's enough um, to just send a Tri-County Health letter out to families. So we work with principals to make sure that there is a cover email, so to speak, to their families so that we're not creating alarm and they can let them know what's going on and how we're handling it. So I imagine that we'll be doing something very similar with COVID. However, the definitions of outbreaks um, and those protocols are gonna be very dependent on what comes out from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment next week. So we'll be working very closely with our health, internal health department and outside to create those protocols and really lay those out. Very good. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, very good. Thank you, Mrs. Rader. And again, echoing Dr. Tucker's thanks to you and your team. Uh, communication is just vital. We, we couldn't be where we are right now without it. So thank you Absolutely. very much. Uh, directors, what questions do you have regarding the communication strategies and plans? What a surprise. Director Meek has a question about the communications <laughs> <Yeah>. plan. <laughs> All right, Thank Director you. Meek, please go ahead. Um, no, thanks so much for that update. And, you know, a lot of times we say communications. Um, I'm talking about building partnerships, mm -hmm. right? And it's kind of what Dr. Douglas spoke to earlier about needing to have our community's support. and teacher support, everybody. Yeah. I mean, our success in being able to launch the next school year is building partnerships. And I, I've seen our district do a phenomenal job 
you know, in this area. And so, you know, the more that I think we can engage in two-way, you know, communication and helping our community um, understand why decisions were made and help their students prepare for a successful launch, the better. So um, I look forward to hearing what role you feel the board can help engage in that as well. I think we can be reaching out to our other local governments, to other community groups and helping to carry that burden in making sure that we're building those partnerships needed. So thank you. Absolutely, and those are great points. <laughs> Very good. Director Chancha Shore, I believe you have a question. Thank you. Um, just kind of very specifically, if in a cohort situation, if a child is or a teacher is diagnosed, how um, will the quarantine and the communication look for the other 19 or 20 people in that cohort or 50 or 60 people? I know you were speaking a little bit to that, but can you explain a little bit more specifically? Sure, and I'm not able to provide exact details because this is gonna again be very dependent on the guidelines that come out as well as coordinating with legal because I'll be in big trouble if I uh, say the wrong thing. But um, definitely making sure that we notify those who need to be notified. Um, if we're in a, a situation where we're quarantining an entire cohort or class or, or school, then obviously we're gonna be communicating in a much larger level to more people than we would be if one student had symptoms and, and went home to quarantine. So we wanna have that really dialed in and make sure that every level and every piece of that um, meets our student um, privacy and staff privacy um, laws. All right, very good. And Director Meek, final question for this section? And I to uh, Director Chancho Shore's question too, I just wanna confirm um, CDPHE is supposed to be releasing yes. guidelines yes. on outbreak and response, right? And yes. so that will most likely impact some of the planning that we have already. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Exactly, yes. yes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Rader again. All right, Dr. Tucker, next section. And, and real quick uh, to uh, Director Mick's question, we do share our planning documents, our plans, uh, with uh, Tri-County Health, all of our local uh, health officials, as well as the Douglas County Commissioner, so they do have a copy of it. And uh, as many of you know, we have a close-knit group of uh, superintendents along the front range, and we're sharing our plans uh, with them as well. Uh, we're getting ready now to the la for the last section. I'll clean up, and then we'll ask Matt to get ready. Well, Dr. Tucker is, uh, again, cleaning. I know that um, I understand there's some buzzing about why do some people take their masks off when they speak and why do some people keep them on? If you look at the governor's executive orders around masks, there is an exemption that allows for a public speaker to remove their mask during the time in which they're public speaking. So just for those of you that were curious about that, feel free to get on the government um, website and pull down Governor Polis's orders around masks and you'll see I think somewhere in paragraph N that states that accordingly. So that's why some of us are removing masks for clarity and some of us are not. Mr. Reynolds, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Um, and with that, I'll take my mask off. <laughs> Uh, policy implications, uh, not a very, uh, very high priority part of this presentation, but it's something that we have to keep our eyes and ears open for um, as we move forward. Um, policy implications for us are a little bit interesting this year, like everything else. Um, typically, you adjust policy as a result of legislation, and with the delay of legislation and having a shorter legislative session, um, that makes it challenging for us to flip um, the switch on some of these policies. Um, the first one I do want to talk about is a policy that we don't currently have in place that we'd like to introduce. Uh, that's ICICA, which deals with uh, identifying what a, the school year, the district calendar, and also instructional time. So as a result of the pandemic, uh, CDE has provided additional flexibility for 
school districts to be able to document what's really counted as student attendance. Um, in order for us to take advantage of that, we have to have a policy in place and or a resolution that, that identifies what that flexibility is. And this is really in response to e-learning. Um, previously, attendance was really about physical attendance, but the state is recognizing through the pandemic that we will have situations like we did this last spring where attendance may not be physical attendance, it may be something in an online variety. And so therefore, uh, for us to be able to count those for student contact days, instructional time, and also for our student October count, we need to have a policy in place that defines what that is. Um, and we also have to have a, a resolution that clearly identifies what the impact of 2021 is. Um, the policy would be a, some, a policy that lasts beyond this year. The resolution would strictly deal with this year as a result of the pandemic. So that they're, they're twofold. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, General Counsel Mary um, on this, and we have a draft that we'd be putting forth uh, to you all the next few weeks uh, for both the resolution and for the policy. Um, linked on there are the instructional hours are some of the updated guidance that's been given by the, the state, uh, the Colorado Department of Education regarding instructional hours. Uh, the next, and I'm really glad that Greg is still with us, um, is the graduation requirements. So the State Board of Education modified their guideline requirements for 2021 as a result of the pandemic, which gave local districts such as ours flexibility in re-examining our graduation policies. Um, as you may recall, our graduation requirements has four components. Uh, you have credits, you have uh, community service, you have the competencies as, as identified by metrics, and you also have the ICAP, the Individual Academic Plan. And at that meeting, the State Board of Education recognized that the competencies, as identified in the metrics, which are things like SAT, AP test, and IB, were dramatically impacted by the pandemic because testing was not happening in the spring. So they passed uh, their resolution unanimously to give us more flexibility to be able to do a modification to our graduation policy to reflect this flexibility. The other part of our graduation requirements, as I mentioned earlier, is community service. Um, and there have been questions about the limitations that we do have with community service. Uh, community service is something that we definitely value. It, it is one of our policies about community service. Our challenge is making sure that our, our kids can go out in the community and serve in a safe manner. And also on the converse of that, that we have enough places for them to actually serve. Many of the places that do provide opportunities for our kids to provide community service are no longer doing that because of safety concerns. Um, Greg, are, are, if you're still with us, I would love for you to chime in. Um, I've had the pleasure of connecting with all but three of our principals. I've got three more meetings set up this week to, to get their feedback on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. What would, you like, what would you like me to comment on? Uh, perfect. Uh, just give us your thoughts on, on both of those, uh, the flexibility with the uh, competencies and also your thoughts on community service. I guarantee you there's not enough time for me to go on about the uh, com competencies as I see it. Um, but I do very much appreciate the fact that people are recognizing that those tests are more and more difficult to do and I, and I, uh, in this time. And uh, I do appreciate the flexibilities about that. But I would love an opportunity to address that, but the, uh, the competencies in general, but it would take far longer than we have. The community service, on the other hand, um, again, is something we value in it. And it, I, th I think at every high school, um, we appreciate the fact that, that, our, that our kids are a member of the community and we, and we benefit from that and the community benefits from the community service um, requirement. However, I agree with Matt that during this time when uh, you know, putting kids at risk by sending them out into the community and asking them to develop this community service when it may not be available might be uh, just simply not fair to ask a, a graduating class of 2021. Um, this upcoming year. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Greg. Um, I also wanted to address Director Lung's question earlier regarding evaluation. Um, uh, first, the, the certified staff evaluation. Uh, we were hoping for some legislative direction on uh, what was going to happen with evaluations for this year. Um, the legislators did not take on evaluation during this legislative session. 
Uh, therefore, we're approaching this year that um, the evaluation processes are going to go on as normally regulated in terms of the time, the frequency, and the duration. Um, last spring, our governor suspended the frequency and, and duration for last spring. And so this year, without having legislative intervention, we're going to proceed uh, with our evaluations as normal. That being said, uh, when it comes to policies and regulations, uh, there's an opportunity for um, the Colorado Department of Education and also for our State Board of Education to provide us additional guidance on that. Um, and we do expect additional guidance regarding our um, evaluation processes and procedures for our staff. Um, in terms of uh, student assessments, uh, we did get one piece of legislation addressed um, in the assessment realm. Uh, they did remove the uh, high school social studies test as a requirement now. Uh, so that was one piece of flexibility we did get. Uh, the Colorado Department of Education has also um, agreed to administer the SAT two times this year, one time in the fall for those that missed in the spring. So we'd have a 12th grade administration of the SAT uh, in September. They also have agreed to administer the PSAT um, and MSQT for our 11th graders. So they get an opportunity to test and that test qualifies them for national merit. Uh, so we do have a little bit of clarity on student assessment as well. The last component for student assessment is the READ Act and school readiness. Our State Board of Education heard a um, presentation from our Colorado Department of Education at their last meeting. Uh, they did not act at the last meeting and they decided to push that to their August 12th and 13th meeting. So at that time, we'll get more clarity from the state's Board of Education's perspective on what the requirements will be for the READ Act and school readiness. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Just if I could, a quick uh, cl question for clarity regarding teacher evaluation. Those teachers that were in their third year of probationary status and now starting day one of fourth year, are they considered non-probationary now? Or are they still, did they not get that, um, that privilege of becoming non-probationary from having three years of experience? Uh, great question. So this last spring when they, when they froze and he said everything was paused, the frequency and duration, we paused everything at that moment. Uh, we're currently gonna go back and review. It's been several months. So the Colorado Department of Education has an opportunity to review what the governor's orders are. We're gonna go back to the Colorado Department of Education and see what our options are looking at last year. Uh, there are certain uh, parameters within the law that talk about consecutive years of evaluation. So not having an evaluation, we need to check with them on what are our options in terms of applying a probationary and non-probationary status year. So we'll be in touch with the Colorado Department of Education on those. So there's still a possibility that those teachers in that third year will indeed be able to be granted a fourth year as non-probationary. There's still a possibility with that? Yeah, with something as high stakes as this, you know, we'll continue to advocate as much as we can for additional flexibility. Very good, thank you. Questions, Director Holtzman? Thank you for this. Um, I really appreciate that you're going to be looking at bringing us these policies. I think our policies are so important, at least me to me as a board member, because they really provide definition and clarity. I think there's some other policies that can also help us because they provide consistency across our district. So there were a few other policies that I had questions about and was hoping we could talk about today. Um, Policies basically in regards to COVID-19, and I know I sent these questions in advance, um, kind of wondering what that's gonna look like. Um, we have different requirements that we'll be considering in regards to face coverings and hand hygiene and health screenings and um, for both students and staff. So we, ha we currently have policies like JIC and JICDA, which is student conduct, we have a staff dress code, GBEBA. We have safe schools, ADD. We have student wellness, ADF. I'm just wondering um, at what point we'll be making these recommendations a part of our policy and how we'll do that. If we'll be modifying existing policies or if we'll have a new policy that will kind of encompass all of our COVID-19 things. But for instance, I keep hearing that we have mask requirements except in, and I'm sorry, I don't know the exact terminology, but something about medical, um, when, when it's not um, medically avail or able to be done. For me, that needs clarification. Um, what does that mean? 
it, does that mean the doctor writes a note? Are there certain things? And then what does it mean if over time one of our high school students, despite education and warnings and um, all of those things, if they still just adamantly will not comply with, say, the face covering um, requirement, would there then be a consequence of inviting them to attend remote learning? I just want to make sure that these things are consistent across our schools, and I don't think they will be without a policy. And I might just insert a little bit um, with Director Holtzman's question, because um, we have superintendent policies and we have board policies, and, and certainly Director Holtzman's highlighted some of those existing board policies that may be in conf or conflict with the, uh, the practice that we want to put in place. But I, I would suggest, board, that at our first meeting in August, that we really delve deeply into this whole notion of policy, because I think we want to give our Colorado Association of School Boards an opportunity um, statewide to get some clarity in terms of do we make amendments, do we make a resolution, um, and then what? The, how does that impact superintendent policies as well? So I don't know if you'd be comfortable, Director Holzman, because I think it's I think it's a critical question in terms of how we govern and, and how our building principles also are backed with the practices that they have to put in place. But I'd like to suggest that's a huge topic that I'd like to see us deal with in, in our first meeting in August. And I think that's a great idea. I'd be happy to have that done. Um, I also know that we surely have some idea about this. And um, for our community, for our parents, and for our staff, the more information we can give them in as quick a manner as possible, I know will be appreciated. So. <laughs> But if we need to wait till the next meeting, that's Dr. Tucker, quick, quick response to that. Yes, I don't know if our chief legal counselor, Mary Clemish, is on right now, if she's still on, but I can certainly say uh, she's pulled these policies along uh, with members of her team to ensure that the superintendent's policies don't, or, or, or regs don't, uh, conflict with the board policies. And uh, Director Holtzman is right. We certainly uh, have actually looked at these policies and update them and updated them in the past, it's, uh, it's our time now to ensure that we uh, don't have conflicts between the uh, two areas of policies, superintendent reg policies and the board. And uh, Mary and I just had this conversation, I think two days ago, so we're on top of it. Right. I would be happy to interject as well. I've been on and uh, I would just continue to support with both Director Ray and Superintendent Dr. Tucker have shared. We have been looking at these policies, we're reviewing them. Our policies are very generally drafted and provide for the administration to make appropriate rules in order to further the health and safety of our students and to require our staff to comply with health and safety measures generally. We are looking at all of these specific policies, including policies related to student dress for both our students and our staff and uh, conduct on school buses as well as conduct during school. All of these policies at this time already generally allow for our administration to administer rules of conduct that can be enforced related to promoting health and safety and well-being of our students which would, in, in our view, include the wearing of face masks and any other requirements that our students may be asked to comply with or our staff may be asked to comply with, consistent with our health and safety plans related to mitigating COVID the spread of COVID-19 in our schools. So any policies that we're reviewing that we believe require some sort of amendment, we are looking at carefully and we'll bring recommendations the board uh, for the next board meeting. Very good, thank you, Ms. Clemish. Director Holtzman and then Director yeah, Meek. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just think it's important also for the superintendent's policies to be shared and definitely no later than the last next meeting um, considering fall is upon us, so thank you. Very good, Director Meek and then Director Long. Um, there is a webinar on Monday, a CASB webinar focused on reopening schools policies and I do know it's gonna talk about policy versus resolution, but also on policies related to Title IX, which I think we'll have to uh, take a look at as well. Very good. Director Long? So um, for teacher durations, what if, so does the hybrid model and the online model will be the same 
as um, um, in-person learning for the teacher, or are they go by different rules based on what we choose? Great question. The, the rules for SB191 do not talk specifically about the learning environment. So therefore, that it would not change uh, whether there were in full in-person, hybrid, or online. The requirements for conducting an evaluation and the frequency would be the same. All right, very good. All right, Director, so I think that takes care of that section. Thank you. Oh, last question, um, Director Holzman. Yeah, so also in that section and listed on our agenda was the resolution we passed on March 26th um, to increase responsiveness and decision-making efficiency during a state of emergency. So I also wanted to discuss that. I didn't know if it was now or if you want to wait until the future, but. What I'd like to do is wait until uh, we get into next steps, because I think that really fits nicely into that. I do want to wrap up this part of our presentation, Dr. Tucker, and thank you, Mr. Reynolds, for, for yours as well. Um, anything else, Dr. Tucker, as we're bringing the, the, all the considerations that staff have made regarding the reentry plan, anything that you want to summarize with, and then yes, Director Holzman, we'll get into the next steps about implications for us as a board. Uh, yes, and I'll be very brief. Stacy, can we go to slide eight, please? We've covered a lot of territory, Dr. Tucker. Yes, we're not going backwards, I guarantee you. I had the pleasure of talking with our, our building leaders, uh, the ones who uh, we asked to participate in this discussion. And what I heard over and over again, two things, and each one said, what up? it doesn't matter what the option is, Whatever it is, we're going to do it. We're going to make it work for our students. We're going to make it work for our staff and our community. And the second thing they talked about, this is new. And so I ask our entire community, our parents, support staff, teachers, and administrators, board, and I ask for grace from myself to ensure that we understand that this is going to take time to get it right. It's gonna take time to help us understand uh, face coverings. You know, Greg uh, talked about, well, when we look at many of these mitigating factors, one we can do right, right away. Now, we also hope that we can do hand washing and sanitizing, we've been doing that all along. But it's gonna take us as, a, as an American society to get used to wearing face coverings and wearing them right. And we know that has not been a part of Americana. It's not been a part of what we do. So I ask our folks who are watching, I ask our community members to please give adults grace as well as our kids. It's going to take our students and our staff, it's going to take us a while to get adjusted to these things here. Molly talked about the physical distancing and, and Kate, when I talked with them, how we're going to maintain these things here in a school, in an elementary school, or even in a high school. And uh, John talked about these challenges in the middle school. I've had the opportunity to work at all three levels. That's gonna be new, trying to ask our students to stay six feet away from each other and from their teachers. So I ask that we have some, uh, some grace and, and, and some patience, and we're gonna get the cleaning and disinfecting thing right. We're gonna get the ventilation right. Uh, thank goodness our community allowed us to pass 5A, 5B, because I don't know where we would be uh, in terms of staff-wise, budgetary, and not to mention having uh, money on hand to fix our ventilation. So again, we'll get this right. Uh, Nancy and, and her team, uh, along uh, especially with our, with our nurses, and, and Lisa Cantor has been a huge, a huge uh, resource in helping us get the best and quickest and most streamlined testing uh, for our teachers. Again, we're looking at offering t uh, testing for our teachers uh, twice a month. I mean, this is very comprehensive testing, uh, uh, contact tracing, 
uh, with, with teachers, and you're not going to see all of this in a public school system, not very many public school systems, I should say, and this is something that your Douglas County School District is trying to do, uh, which is really unheard of. So again, uh, we're going to manage these protocols, and uh, we're happy, as uh, Director Meek said, as soon as we get the uh, protocols from the State Department, we'll find a way, as our great principals here said, we're going to find a way to get this done. So. Those are my last comments before we go to our recommendations and next steps. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, so, so one of the things I want to do first, I want to circle back to how we began. Uh, we began this morning by talking about that everyone in this room, everyone beyond this room believes that the best circumstance for our kids is to be in person, in school, 100% of the time with their peers and with their teachers. And I know we had some conversation with our principals about that. How would we make that work? But I do want to just spend a little bit of time, board directors, in discussing that. Because certainly, after all this information we've had, we could come back and say, you know what, Dr. Tucker, we think we ought to have our 68,000 kids back in schools on August 17th, full days, five days a week, with their peers, with their teachers. So I want to come back to that because that's the most desired state. So I really want to hear um, from you, and then we'll take a break, but I, I felt like we didn't necessarily give that, that model its full due. We've done hybrid well, we've done e-learning, but I want to come back and finish with in-person, in-person, 100% in-person learning, and like to hear again, whether that's from our principals, whether that's from directors, what questions do you have about our ability to do that? What questions or comments do you have? And you won't get a break until you talk. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gochi, go ahead. Lead us off. Well, obviously I agree with, with what you said. Every, everybody wants to see, wants us to get back to normal, right? And back to normal would be in person and as close to that as we can get. We have to balance that with how to do that safely. And as I, as I mentioned before, um, being able to do all of those, those factors in a school that, that has you know, nearly 2,300 students in it is, is going to be extremely difficult and challenging, if not impossible. So um, I think that's what we have to balance is just what, how to do this well we have our desired state of being back in person, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious and concerned that I couldn't stand in front of my community and say that um, sending your high school age student nor asking my staff, telling them that I can guarantee their safety. And, and you, you had mentioned this really well earlier also that no, no system and no, no thing is without risk. And, um, I just I think that that's, that's a pretty big concern at the time in which the infection rate is fairly high and growing for me to, to consider that. Uh, finally, um, just how quickly things can come derailed with a positive test. And when you have 2,300 students in your building and at a an, at an, uh, positive testing rate of Six percent um, at five percent, right? That math's a lot easier for me to do. Um, you, you were talking about 100, 100 kids, and then um, if they if they follow the thing, and they are, and unfortunately, our students are, are probably the most under tested, and probably the most asymptomatic carriers of of this of anybody there is because they're healthy and they don't show the signs. Um, like older people do. So I don't know if that's really what you wanted to hear, but I, I felt like it was important for me to say. So thank you. No, thank you, Mr. Gochi, for leading off. Mrs. Milley, go ahead. Um, again, thanks for, for giving us a voice today. I think it's just, it makes me feel um, so much better to feel uh, represented. And, you know, I love to talk about education of all kinds. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, to do in-person learning, like you said, we could do it. As I, as I think about just the logistics of it, um, 
for one, I need I need to advocate for our small schools. Um, a couple of our uh, small, uh, small school principals reached out and said that there was a possibility that it could really very safely, they feel like, do in-person learning five days a week. So with um, small class sizes of 15, um, even less in some cases, they really feel like they could be uh, really successfully do that because they're a smaller population. And is there any consideration to, to, to honor that for smaller schools? So I do wanna say that as a, as a larger school, um, maybe of 485 students, um, we can do that. But I also think about the, the last time I was in a room with 20 people um, inside a building and it's been a long time. Uh, I, I can say that for a fact. And so I think just the, the unease that we have just about bringing everybody together all at once is tough and not knowing, you know, I, I need the commitment, for example, of my families, um, my community to be vigilant about testing their kids every single morning or temperature checking them and making sure that they're not bringing sick kids to school because then the whole thing unravels so quickly. Um, and making sure that our staff is healthy because the big fear I have about maybe this full in-person learning is the fact that um, it can possibly crumble so quickly because we just have more kids in the building and, and more kids we would have to quarantine and more teachers we would have to quarantine if there was exposure there. So I think that's just the fear, but um, needing support of, of resources from our, our, you know, our district um, you know, departments to say, what are you providing for me so that I can have lunch outside with my kids? So I don't have to worry about that and I can focus on doing things in my building. I need to know kind of that, what's the, what are you providing for me at a district level? Who's responsible for it and what's the due date? Because I'm, you know, the things that we're working on or thinking about different scenarios where I'm ready to move on. We need to make some decisions and, um, and get to planning here and, and get some action going. So, Thank you, Ms. Thanks. Millie. Thank you, Ms. Millie. Other, other principal group uh, from our principal group, John, Katie? John, go ahead, and then Katie. Yeah, I, I think when we start looking at this idea of, or continue to look at the idea of 100% and everyone being back in, and I, I, I think I said this earlier, I, I'm processing through the logistics of it, and um, to kind of speak to what Greg had said was, I don't know that I can stand in front of my community and say that I can put all these mitigating factors in place with 800 students in my school. Um, when I look at the logistics of the size of a cohort that the students would be involved with, combined with the logistics of moving kids around a school and, and hallways, dismissal, passing periods, all of those pieces, um, we can put things into place, but I just don't know that there is truly the space to be able to accomplish that. And, and I, I really liked what, what Molly had said about the last time I was in a room with that many people indoors. And honestly, it was probably March 13th. And that was the last day we had school before spring break. Um, so just, just some of those hesitations there. And I think it really boils down to the logistics of it with the mitigating factors. Okay, thank you, John. Go ahead, Katie. Could you just like one last little thing, just have to feel for our families who have chosen in-person learning. And I think that's something that I, I struggle with is people who are wanting and expecting us to go back five days a week. Um, I struggle with that because I understand we've got, our families are just waiting for us to make these decisions here and um, and it's stressing all of them out and stressing me out that I haven't been able to share that with them. So Very good. I just feel for everybody. Well, a commitment I will make on behalf of the board is that you will know by the end of this meeting what we're doing. All right, so hang in there. Uh, Ms. Lynch, if you have any other final comments, um, regarding your, your colleagues' comments about 100% in-person learning, anything else that you want to comment on? Yeah, I just, I think uh, Greg spoke to it a little bit about um, the age groups of being um, under-tested. And I just wonder, you know, they some of the plans from the state level show that K through five model, even though we're a K through six uh, building and saying that they don't have, you know, high number of cases. Well, I'm, my question is what percentage of them are actually being tested? tested and then keeping a, a mask on a kid um, in a close space with potentially 24 to 28 students in a class size um, and worrying about what, what does that look like when a teacher is sick and um, heaven forbid we lose somebody in our district 
um, or even in my building, what does that look like for our community? And I just want to make sure we make the best decisions. Um, they're not going to be easy. We're not going to please everybody. But if safety is our number one priority, we've got to make a decision with safety in mind um, and then education in mind. And so we will do right by kids regardless of the decision that is made. Um, but it, there are some decisions that are easier to make when we can uh, potentially have a class size of eight, half of the amount or if we start with e-learning, see what the numbers do in the next two weeks, and if they start to come down, then we potentially go to the hybrid model, which as a parent, and I have two kids, it is hard to plan for what does that look like for me, um, you know, working from home and things like that. I'm not thankful my girls are a little bit older and that they're 13 and 15 and self-motivated, um, but I know that is a struggle for parents with young kids. So. It's a hard decision to make. Whatever decision is made, we will make it work to the best of our ability. All right, thank you again, principals. All right, directors, thoughts? Um, I know Director Hansen had her hand up. Director Hansen, go ahead, and then Director Holtzman. Thank you so much. I, I actually just want to tell all of the principals, thank you. Um, I know that that had to have taken a lot of courage to say. I have never been treated in the manner that I have been treated in the last three months by complete and total strangers. Um, this is an unbelievably emotionally charged topic for, for everyone. And I just want to say thank you for expressing those concerns. And I also want to clarify to everyone listening that it is not the principal's decision. And when you are angry, because this is not what you had envisioned, <laughs> or your child back to school, do not treat these extraordinary people the way that um, that some of us have been treated. So I just wanted to be crystal clear that we appreciate your feedback and the brunt of the responsibility does not fall on you. And we are incredibly grateful that you were willing to share that information. Director Holtzman and then Director Chancha Shore. So the question is about in-person and what our thoughts are about that. So, um, so I agree with everyone, education, public education, pre-K to 12, I can't think of many services that are more essential than that. Um, and they're especially es essential to our students. Um, but with that, I go back to what Dr. Douglas told us this morning about the 14-day incident incidence rate that we are now at 100 cases per 100,000. And he said, and I quote, this is a high to a very high category of risk. Um, and that's not something that I can ignore. Um, and knowing that we've been on the increase. So that is one of the first things I think of. Um, and I also think about if we just look, you know, using our own common sense, if we look at places that have opened up perhaps too quickly, um, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone well. And so I, I think for our students too, you know, we're not gonna be able to provide them normal because times are not normal right now. So that's an impossibility. And it's an impossibility to provide them zero risk in any kind of in-person. But I also just feel like right now, in person, five days a week, is not something I would be willing to um, be in favor of. And that if we did that, you know, the likely result would be that we'd be opening too quick. We'd have to close quickly, creating more transition and instability for our students and our staff. So those are the considerations that are coming to my mind right now. And, and that's where I'm at. Thank you, Director Holzman. Director Chancho, sure. Thank you. Um, there are so many, like I've said in the last several months, there are so many pieces to this puzzle. And everybody who presented us today had a piece. Um, I do honor the piece of the puzzle that the principals um, bring to the table. Uh, uh, maybe I feel like their piece has the strongest voice, even because they're actually on the dance floor doing the dance, trying to figure out exactly the specifics of how. Not only that, I totally support and believe that the principals know their staff. And I believe that they understand what their staff, they're representing um, their staff. We could have 
a multitude of teachers here too speaking to us today. Um, I, I think that the principals have represented their staffs um, fairly in concerns and in, in needs that they would have. So in response to the 100% opening in our schools of over 1,500 kids, over 800 kids, 500 kids all together in one space and listening to all of the presentations, but also especially to our principals, um, I would have to concur that I would not agree with 100% um, five days a week. Right. Very good. Thank you, Talk Director Tantasor. Any, any other comments that haven't been made, directors, before we take a break? Because then we want to give Dr. Tucker time to make a recommendation. Director Lund, go ahead. <clears throat> I think um, most of us want all students back in school, in traditional um, school setting. Um, I have a high school kid, okay? I mean, I, I, can, I, can, I can feel, I can tell you how does it feel um, during the two months um, on the remote learning, okay? Um, and I also envy, I mean, understand a lot of parents' um, concern of not having the social um, interactions of their student, of not going back, you know, to school. To me, although I strongly, you know, support to going back to school for all person learning, but my decisions is based on based on local science and data. As I strong emphasize that um, our decision making, according to American Academy of uh, Pediatrics, um, we need to make sure that we looking into um, data, not products, in terms of what's the best to serve our, not only our student, but our teacher, which is the most important resource of entire school district. Dallas County School District is the largest employer in our county. We have a social responsibility to make sure that we make the right decisions so that we're not going to blow up the entire county and uh, get a high infection rate if we don't do this right. Um, from the science point of view, as Dr. Hosman mentioned about Dr. Douglas' um, argument um, this morning um, about you know the ray, um, not only that, um, I think a couple of days ago you you see that there's a couple of Colorado students die because of a COVID nineteen related illness, so we do know that student um, of that age get affected. And um, the survey said that around 20% of our teachers um, that is in the high risk category, that could be severely affected if COVID-19 affecting them or their family. That is also weighing very high on my agenda to make sure that we protecting our staff, which Again, I highly respect them because they did so much, you know, for my children, and um, they are the important resources and assets, you know, for our community and our school district. Um, and COVID nineteen is not going away. Not only that, the entire world statistics shows that is actually increasing. U.S. is increasing, and we are not seeing it coming back down. And United States of America do not forbidden people from move from one place to another. So even though you say that our number is relatively low, just take one incident of a person that is highly infected going from the neighborhood county coming down here, it could change that. This data is just changed constantly and it's not going to the better side, it's actually going to much worse. So, I mean, a couple of weeks ago during the bomb meeting, you hear me advocating having, um, we don't need to be the first, we don't need to go fast. We should take it slow and see what's going on. So I'm still believing the same thing, which is trying to be go online first, 
and then wait a little bit and see what's going on before we go back to um, uh, in-person learning. We can see that the biggest, largest school district, DPS, down public, the second largest school district, Jefferson County, has already uh, adopted a similar approach. A human life is very sacred and it's very important and nothing can replace a human life when they're gone. So for that, I don't think we're ready for in-person learning. All right, so with that, directors, I am going to ask us to take a break. We're, and Dr. Tucker, we've set the plate for you when we come back at five minutes till four o'clock to hear the recommendation of staff. All right, five minute break.
So with that, Dr. Tucker, um, we will now hear from you as far as a recommendation and then board. Um, I'm gonna ask us to actually take action uh, based on the recommendation, because I feel like, as I said at the very beginning, this is our plan. It's all of us together, so it's not just Dr. Tucker's plan. It's, it's all of our community, our board, our educators, our principals. It's all about us working together to make this work. So um, with that, Dr. Tucker, let's, let's talk about the recommendation. Yeah. Thank you, President Ray, all of our directors, our panelists, our folks who are here in the Wilcox Building, and all of our viewers, and most importantly, our 68,000 students and our 8,600 colleagues. This has really been a, a tough decision, and I'm glad it's a tough decision. I'm glad that it's been one where we've really had to think and ponder. Uh, we had to, first and foremost, remember our why, why we came here in public education, and, and that why uh, is to, first and foremost, protect our students protect our staff before we could get to the educational part. And so I think this recommendation uh, really gets to that. But I'm going to tell you, we um, really want our community to think flexibility. We've been, we've, had, we've been saying flexibility and being fluid all along, and that's where we are right now. But let's go ahead and look at some of the uh, background uh, relative to plan considerations. Uh, ton of input and feedback from staff, families, and what's missing there, students. Uh, we've surveyed our students, we've talked with our students, and community members. Over 17,000 responses were received from the Hanover COVID-19 Extended School Closure Impact Survey from students, parents, and staff. And, and real quickly, that survey really gave us some uh, data about what the experience was for those groups in the spring and it certainly is impacting uh, where we are right now. Uh, more recently, over 30,000 responses to the contingency restart scenario surveys from parents and staff in terms of what, uh, what their preferences were. And also, I want to give, my goodness, I want to give a, a lot of thank yous to the nearly 2,000 folks who applied for the Restart and Recovery Task Force and the 200 folks who sat on that task force. Uh, please know that your input uh, certainly is being honored. Over 32,000 responses to the fall 2020 DCSD in-person or remote learning preference survey from our parents. And let's take a look at a couple of those uh, charts here. Will your child ride the bus to school if they are eligible bus rider? Uh, and looking at health and safety guidelines are followed. Please note the DCSD will review all transportation requests and adjust available routes that you heard Mr. Cosgrove uh, mention. Uh, we're looking at uh, yes, uh, it's the blue dot, 26.6. Uh, the red dot is no, no, we will not ride the bus this year. Again, a major piece of data regarding transportation. Let's look at uh, slide 60. In August, the DCSD plans to return to a 100% in-person learning environment for all students in all grades. We understand that some families may prefer a remote online student learning environment. Please tell us your preference for your child. Now that we've really fleshed out uh, our, really our third option, our second in-person option, which is the hybrid model, these numbers could change and I will remind our students and our parents, it was simply a, and I shouldn't say simply, it was a major undertaking, but it was an undertaking to collect data. Uh, folks were not uh, registering. Uh, let's look at the blue dots, folks, please work with me. I am uh, colorblind, so if I get the numbers mixed up, Stacy, correct me. 100% uh, full-time in-person learning at school, uh, right at 84%. Uh, let's look at the red dot, 16% said that they would love full-time remote learning at home. So 84% preference uh, at school. I think I've covered the transportation one. Uh, yep, covered that one. Okay, jumped again. We talked about what are beyond, um, you know, our surveys, beyond uh, our conversations with folks. Uh, did we create 
a toolkit? Do we create a decision metrics? Uh, and yes, we have uh, done that. We have run these numbers by um, Tri-County Health. We've had conversations with the Denver metro area. And there are other uh, models that we're going to, um, and other items that we will add to this model. As you know, here in the state of Colorado, it's uh, protect our neighbors. And that's pretty much uh, almost business as usual. And as, that rela as it relates to a school district, that means in-person learning 100% every day. As you know, uh, when we talked with Dr. Douglas on the 13th, our case positivity numbers were much lower. They were like two, two and a half percent. And the incident rate was much lower. Since that time, as he discussed, those numbers have gone up. And this is a behind the scene model that we're gonna to continue to use and bring forth to our community in working with our healthcare experts and using data, using science to help make our decision and also using good common sense. So the next area is safer at home. When the numbers rise a little higher, really where numbers are uh, right now, and then really uh, it's something that our board uh, has to feel comfortable with. At the end of the day, uh, we bring recommendations to the board and the board approves. Uh, the board will have to approve this matrix we're using. We're gonna add the incidence uh, rates. We're, we're really looking at it right now with the positivity rates. Generally speaking, and folks, please don't quote me on this, and as it is stated here, this is just one data point. It is not the sole basis for DCSD's learning model designs. Generally in person, from zero to 4% incident rate, you can do in person with cohorting. You need to have an e-learning option available in the event those numbers uh, spike. We do have that. Uh, where we can uh, pivot from full in-person to e-learning. We're still uh, refining it. I think by the time school starts, we're gonna be in good shape. Again, looking at social, dis uh, social distancing by six feet when possible and adding those other mitigating factors like improving masking and hygiene and so forth. Now let's move over to safer at home. That's where we are here in the county. Those rates are generally from about 4% to 10%. Again, folks, please don't quote me. It's just one general guideline. And that's why I asked Dr. Douglas the question again. None of us here is an expert. That's why I've always brought experts in to ask them those questions. Uh, when the numbers were lower, uh, Dr. Douglas said, well, if you put these mitigating uh, factors in place, well, you can do in person. Now these numbers are a little higher, and I asked a question. Again, using common sense and watching these numbers here, if we go slowly, if we're operating at a lower rate, what does that mean for the Douglas County School District? Cohorting of students to rotate between two days of in-person learning and three days of e-learning each week. You'll never have more than 50% of your students. In actuality, you're gonna have much lower than 50% in a hybrid model because if we look at the, uh, the pie chart earlier, about 15% of our students, of our parents, said that they're going to take uh, the start off with the e-learning model anyway. So in every building, the maximum amount you'll have is 50%, and we're anticipating it to be much lower. Still in a hybrid uh, model, social distancing, six feet when possible. And now let's move over at stay at home. That's easy. I will never ever be comfortable with asking our students and staff to come in a building when those rates are 10%. It's really difficult as we watch our rates now move from six. And I agree with Director Long, we don't think that they're going to get um, any better back down to the two and a half percent uh, within the next week or two. I certainly don't think that. And that's why we're watching the uh, two week or 14 day rolling average and, and applying that rolling average to those three different models. Most hex, uh, health experts across the country like Dr. Douglas uh, believes that, you know, when you're, you know, less than 4%, you can do in, 
person, but we're in a position right now, we're right in the middle, uh, where really our only options can be hybrid learning or e-learning. As I said on the 13th, folks, we have to be flexible. We may start out in e-learning, and that's probably where we're gonna be for a while. Or we recommend hybrid learning. We're gonna have to, in a moment's notice, switch to e-learning. I don't think the numbers in the next couple of weeks will be of such that we can pivot from uh, hybrid or e-learning to in-person. So again, this is the uh, model we're using and Director Holtzman will add uh, other metrics like the uh, incident rate as well. But because the uh, positivity rates really defines uh, define the uh, incident rates, we're really looking at that number and creating that number. And again, we want the board to be comfortable. At the end of the day, when this is all said and done, this is the board's recommendation. And I tell you what, like our principal said, we're gonna get behind the board. Okay, this is where we are today. We're recommending that pre-K through 12 return to school on a hybrid learning model. And we go back to slide 28, it explains that. The Douglas County School District, your school district, is prepared to trans transition to in-person or e-learning upon recommendations of the health officials and the governor. Looking at the numbers right now and what they're projected to be in the next couple of weeks, we don't see it's, uh, anything happening where we can go directly to in-person. We feel confident right now, as of today, that uh, hybrid learning is our recommendation. Teachers and staff will return on August 4th. They're scheduled to return. That's without students. There are optional professional development days, August 4th, 5th, and 6th. When our staff members are not engaging in those uh, professional development days, they are working with their principals, they're working with their teams in getting their classrooms together, they're reviewing the curriculum, and more importantly, they are talking about how do you maneuver in a hybrid learning environment or how do we operate in an e-learning environment. Speaking of e-learning, there will be e-learning PD for high schools on August 7th, e-learning PD for middle schools August 10th, and e-learning PD for elementary school on August 11th. So we're building both in because I really feel in a moment's notice, we're gonna to have to pivot to e-learning and be prepared to do that. Again, our teachers will have, and building administrators and other leaders will have from August 4th until August 17th before they see students. Let's talk about that. That is not a week, the 17th through the 21st, is not a week to have full contact with students. We're asking the board, we're recommending to the board that during that week, our schools only operate at 20% capacity. 20% of the students each of the five days, because I'm, I'm gonna give you my bias, and you heard uh, Molly and other folks talk about this. I don't know how you can start uh, e-learning without ever seeing your kids. I don't understand how you can do any one of these models without seeing your students, uh, ensuring that they know their teachers, they know their principals, they know their uh, building engineers, et cetera. They know their cafeteria staff. I, I just don't get it, especially with this business being a relational business, not a transactional business. So unless these numbers jump up to 10%, I think we preserve that week of the 17th through the 21st operating with 20% capacity each day with different students. Uh, we heard Nancy talk a little bit earlier. We may have to bring our gifted students. We may certainly bring our sped students in for uh, additional um, uh, orientation, additional uh, work, uh, in, and actually in working with these teams. So I think that can happen. That, that is also a great way to begin our cohorting and looking at how a cohort moves from a building from one building to the next. And so that would be that week. You would never ramp up to 100%. Each uh, uh, day you'll be at 20%. In one of our smaller elementary schools with 300 kids, 
the most kids you're going to have, you'll have 60 each day to walk through uh, the day in the life of what it's like uh, to be uh, e-learning, the day in the life, what it's going to be uh, with our hybrid model of two days of in-person instruction, three days of e-learning at home. We were very successful um, under the guidance of uh, Marlena and Erica in establishing the kindergarten balanced beginnings. We've done it before. We did it very uh, uh, easily, and it, it uh, certainly came with a lot of reviews, uh, rave reviews, because we slowly brought those kindergartners in. We would still do that this year, and then uh, our kindergartners would uh, return on August 21st in this hybrid model, again, pre-K through 12, elementary, middle, and high school, all on the same schedule. And the point I made is about transportation one. Uh, we're operating only at about a third capacity. So that certainly is going to be uh, an issue in us making sure that we stay uh, on the same schedule, elementary, middle, and high, and, and high school. So that's uh, really important right there. Also, it's great for contact tracing in the event and Let's be honest, we're going to have some issues. We're going to have students, we're going to have staff uh, to contract the virus. It's just the way we're, it's the way of the world right now. It's our world here in the Douglas County, our reality. So we want to be prepared for that. And with this recommendation, I want to emphasize again that although we're sitting here today, uh, saying that uh, hybrid is, uh, is our recommendation. I think we must get our students in. We must prepare them so on the 24th, when school does start, it could start in a full e-learning environment. But today, we feel 100% confident in recommending a hybrid model. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. So let's start with questions. Uh, board directors, what questions do you have regarding staff's recommendation? And again, uh, the reference being on slide 28 for those of you that are maybe viewing remotely, that gives a quick overview of the hybrid learning model. Um, and again, emphasis being to that students with special needs, students with significant needs and affective needs would actually attend four times um, a week as opposed to just the every other day. So again, uh, directors, quick questions. Director Lung. Uh, Dr. Tucker, I would like to ask you, um, <clears throat> from what I understand is, um, you know, the high school principal as a whole um, really strongly favor a modified um, two-day rotation schedule and I, I can understand that, you know, because middle school and, and uh, elementary school students are far fewer than uh, high school. Our high school on average have 2,000 and 2,500 students. Even with a hybrid model, 1,000 to 1,300 of them go there. Um, I mean, that, that is probably larger than the populations of the entire elementary school and, uh, and sometimes, you know, middle school. And, and I have high respect for their opinion, and they are the one in the front line. Um, and are, are you willing to you know, discuss with them as a group to see whether, whether it, you know, their ideas of uh, changing the way the schedule work based on the safety reason uh, we work, I mean, again, you know, we, we are a district of choice. I mean, so we have different model to make sure that we don't do one side fit all. And if, if high school have, a, you know, for the populations, for the safety reason, that may want a better schedule to fit their population's lead, um, is this something that you will consider um, to talk to them mm -hmm. and, 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 and give them a different, you know, schedule? A couple points here. First um, and, and foremost, We've had hours upon hours of conversation with principals at all three levels and trying to come to a spot where it's best for all of our students uh, in the district. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Molly mentioned it earlier. I mean, this has been 
a, a conversation uh, with our principal. So whether this has been considered, the answer is 100%. Have we talked about this quite a bit? Yes. Mr. Knight uh, has been in, in most, if not all, of those conversations. But I want to come back to the second point again. Because we have restrictions on buses and how we are going to transport, we have to keep that in mind. And I'll tell you what, this is something that I will certainly, um, you know, I, I just cannot back down on. If we can put together a schedule where elementary kids, where, and where mom and dad are out working, and elementary kids who are depending on older siblings to be there before mom and dad can get there, I think that needs to be very high in our decision making because I don't want uh, an elementary student at home by him or herself because mom and dad have to go to work when mom and dad have been depending on the older, older student to uh, watch the, uh, the youngster. Mr. Knight, anything you can add? I would just add that nearly all of these recommendations that you see were also highly supported by our task force and we have members of that uh, here tonight with the DOS if we want to speak any further to that but I believe there was near consensus at the elementary and middle level to go with the ABAB and I do not believe high school principals came to consensus that AABB was the way to go. Um, I think some felt AABB was the way to go. Some high school principals who I've spoken with felt ABAB was the way to go. And so we've definitely had those conversations and brought forth the recommendation that we think meets the needs of our community and a majority of our principals. Director Chancha Shore, question. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking out, think out loud with me for a minute, um, Dr. Tucker and Mr. Knight, a possible high school teachers will still see 150 kids per high school teacher in a typical schedule. But I think I was hearing some uh, conversations that may have been looking at some other options in cohorting so they didn't maybe have as many kids? Director Chancho Shore, are you referring to maybe a block schedule where the kids are still in school in person two days a week, but maybe they go to half their classes on Monday, half their classes on Wednesday? Is that the version you're speaking of? Yes, I thought I had seen that in part of, a, of the paperwork, but as I'm looking at it now, I didn't see it. Yeah, that is one option that we looked at. And I think from, from Dr. Tucker's perspective, what we are, are wanting for that uh, hybrid model is to make sure that all students in a, in a family are in school at the same time on the same days. So I do believe that's something that we could talk with with high school principals, a, an ABAB model that takes on more of a block schedule would still meet those parameters for us, I believe. So that lends itself to the teachers possibly seeing fewer students per, per day and in their rotation as well, correct? Yes, for a longer period of time. So you may only have four classes on Monday, four different classes on Wednesday, but those class periods would be longer. Okay. So fewer kids, yes. And that's because we still need to meet the instructional minutes. All right, other director questions, directors? Any other questions regarding the hybrid model? Director Hansen, go ahead. Thank you. So, it seems like we are, <laughs> I think that hybrid learning is absolutely the best option to keep our students in the most ideal learning um, environment, which is the classroom for the longest period of time. So I think that what we would have to do first is to get one of the dominoes to fall. And I think that if I've heard everything correctly today, that is parents finalizing their decisions for in-person, which is going to be a hybrid mix of in-person and online learning, um, depending on our numbers. Um, and I think that 
parents need to have a very, very clear understanding of what this looks like for their day-to-day -day lives. And I think that that actually helps teachers understand expectations as well. Um, something that's still very gray to me is what the days look like for both teachers and students when our students are not in the classroom. And I know on the slide it says, um, it refers to the online portion as e-learning. And I think that may be what's confusing me because that, that portion of the day when they are not in the classroom under the hybrid model is actually quite different than the e-learning format, if I understand correctly. So I just want to see if there's any way we could offer very clear um, information for our families and for our teachers as to what those expectations are when our students are not in the classroom on the hybrid option so that we can let our parents start to make those choices and then we can fill in all of the staffing needs from there. So Mrs. Mason is here to just one, one more time to clarify, what does that mean when the child is not in school during this hybrid model? Yes, <clears throat> on the days that they are in e-learning, those would be what we would call asynchronous. So they would not be receiving instruction live from their teacher. They may be working on activities that they started the day before, um, assignments that they were given that were lo loaded into their Google Classroom or Canvas. They may, at some point, there might be some recorded videos, anything that would support the practice and, and work that was done the day before in person. Um, we would work with our schools to determine what that schedule looks like for a day. Possibly there would be times that they could, um, that they would have a check-in. Again, as I'm saying that, we have those teachers teaching in person on Monday and Wednesday, so they're with their other students on those days. So those days on Tuesday and Thursday, for example, would be completely independent. So we would definitely need to work with schools and spell out what a day-to-day -day schedule look like for them. So I think you may have hit it on the head. What we can change that word with is asynchronous learning yes. as opposed to e-learning. On Tuesdays and Thursdays is asynchronous learning. And then to Director Holzman's point, we need to just to show the menu of what asynchronous learning entails. Correct. Um, and that would help Director Holzman, I think, with the clarity she's seeking for parents to understand what this means. Very good. All right. Directors, other questions, and I want to keep it to questions because I also want to move us to a motion, and then I'll give us time to have discussion before we actually vote. So again, these are this is a time for questions. Director Holtzman. Yeah, so my question is in regards to high schools where I just am having the most concern. So my question is, um, in this hybrid model, do we know that in our classrooms we can maintain social distancing with this amount of students? In other words, can we keep at least three feet between students and at least six feet between the teacher and their classroom of students? We have Mr. Weiss also here today, uh, one of our executive directors of schools. So, Director Oltzman, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. So it's about high schools in particular, and, and the reason it's other directors and myself, we've asked questions about cohorts. I think it's clear that we have some concern about the large number of students. It's larger than our lower grades. Um, so I'm looking for other ways to balance that. And I am looking to know how much social distancing do we think or do we know that we're going to have between students in high school classrooms? Um, and how much space will we be having between the teacher and the classroom of students? Yeah, so the high school group of principals have already been working on what could it look like, sharing ideas. Each of their buildings, some of them are very similar, as you know. Others are a little bit different based off of age. I think each of their schools have different classrooms that they're gonna have to work on. In the hybrid model with 50%, it's gonna be a lot more doable. Um, every classroom, I think we can have quality social distancing. Uh, schools are looking at how do we use passing periods? How do we effectively remind kids, help them flow with, with 50%? It helps. And then we're going to have to work with kids. And I think the ownership that we've seen at, at DC Oaks, and you see when you ask students to say, hey, 
how do we do this well, will help. There's probably not a perfect solution. I think as we brainstorm and work together on that, that passing period, we're gonna have to work on some of those electives. We're gonna have to define and say, okay, what are our most complicated electives? How do we do this well? And start working through the solution piece. But I would say for social distancing in classrooms at 50%, just like you heard, I feel more comfortable with that um, for distance and safety. Does that answer it? I mean, I, th I know that you've answered it as with as much detail as you're able to. Um, obviously, I would love to have guarantee, which we can't have. Um, I'm just really concerned with the high school model, and I guess I'm looking for uh, alternatives to how we can make um, the contact less between yeah. the teacher and the number of students and just the students with other students. Yeah. I think even in that, there's been talk where uh, with Rock Canyon and Highlands Ranch, our alternative schools in my region, we've talked about how we can even share on, on how can we clean together. Um, if we have sprays in each classroom, how we have uh, the ability to all pitch in and help and do those things of high touch points, uh, what we can do on those off days or different times and work together and strategize. And depending on where the plan ends, we'll have to adjust, say, how do we do this well? So I think in each of the models that we've talked about, is it uh, A, B, and Fridays as that, that uh, e-learning day, more synchronous e-learning type of day possibly. Uh, we'll have to adjust to say, how do we do this well? In talking with Rich Cosgrove of cleaning and different ways in which we can increase that, uh, even at the high school level, because it is hard to cohort. Uh, reality with seven classes, even if you break it up, you have a lot more kids interacting. And so that is a reality we have to face, but I do think we get mitigating factors that can help. And another one of our strategies uh, we need to continue to utilize is technology. You know, how can we use quote unquote uh, e-learning or uh, asynchronous learning or synchronous learning to bring students together because they don't necessarily have to be in the same place to be educated. And we'll get an idea of that as soon as uh, we, uh, you know, the board uh, approves a plan plan, as I've said before, that could change quickly. Uh, but uh, I think we need to find a better way to utilize uh, uh, technology. Uh, Corey, thanks for speaking on that. I think uh, we have our, Greg is still there, and I know Danny probably wants to add a couple things. And before, before Mr. Windsor, yeah. I know if we could have uh, Mr. Yeah, Gochi yeah. You jump in there, um, and then Mr. Windsor, you can yep. uh, tag on. So Mr. Gochi, go ahead. Yeah, so Director Holtzman, thank you for the question, because um, as you know, our schedule is not built on your last name. And so how we divide our cohorts, our A and B cohorts, um, isn't, isn't necessarily on how on our last name. So I had our master scheduler, Mr. Bowman, look at um, what effect uh, dividing our alpha last name on some of our larger singleton courses, right? Where we don't have the flexibility to move some students without disrupting their schedule. Um, and yeah, there, I will tell you this, that 50% is way, way easier than 100%. And I agree with Dr. Tucker that 50% really means about 40% because of 20% of our, choose, our students are gonna choose or have chosen or indicating they're choosing the full remote. But I think when, we, when the information that, comes, that came out in this meeting about who's teaching the full remote versus who's teaching the hybrid learning, we may have some more kids shift uh, shift to that, but um, it will be difficult to guarantee every class will have, you know, 15 or fewer kids in it, um, and and so we we may not have that, but it would be significantly easier than the full first full full 100 percent uh, in person. Mr. Gochi, thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Windsor. Yeah, Mr. Gochi, thank you. Agree. I, I think it's definitely been a conversation we had. I also. Um, know that possibly Rich Cosgrove can speak to this as well, but I know we've had a chance to measure each of those classrooms as well to really see what that capacity was. I think from there we can start working with our principals as well um, to figure out what is that maximum number that we would really need to look at and then correspond it with what Mr. Gochi said as a master schedule. It's not quite as easy from just breaking it off at L because of all those different singleton classes, but I think as soon as we give them kind of the what we're doing, I think the ability for them to have the how piece of them figuring out is something that I know our leaders have, have the ability to do as long as we give them some very clear constraints on that. Very good. 
Mr. Cosgrove? And direct, directors, if I may. So the directors of schools have for the principals, um, basically it's a list of every single room in their school, the square feet and how many occupants could fit if it's 10 or less, including teachers, if it's six foot separation, 36 square foot per student, and that's not only every typical room, but every elective room and any other room in the district that they may choose in order to fit their student population. So they will be able to ensure that those cohorts, that those A's or B's can fit. Oh, very good, thank you. The uh, Rector Chancho Shore, question? Yes. Thank you so much. So I want to make sure I'm understanding. Do we then, I saw that the SSN and the effective needs students were going to school four days a week to the school building because everybody's going to school, <laughs> but going to the school building four days a week. But mild and moderate um, students, will they be in the general ed cohort? That is correct. You're correct. Thank you. All right, board directors, any other questions? Director Holtzman. Um, so first I just, I do wanna thank everyone. Um, you know, I'm focused so much on just making sure I have the information I need that I forget to do that. And I really do appreciate everyone's work, everybody being here. Um, all that said, you know, lots of good work happening. Um, and obviously there's still a lot of an unanswered questions. Um, I kind of kept track of the ones I asked that we don't have answers for yet. And, and I, I understand that it's a process, um, but there's a lot of them. And I remember hearing Dr. Douglas say also, um, you know, it will take some practice. And you guys have indicated that too. It's a culture we're establishing in our schools about a different, different way of going to school. So I guess my question is, I, I really do like the idea about the orientation, staggered schedule, 20% a day. Would it be helpful if you could do that for one more week? I mean, that's, one week doesn't seem like a really long time to me. And if we needed to do that for a second week um, to feel more confident for our students, our staff, for our parents, I, I would encourage that if you thought that would be helpful. From my perspective, uh, think that's that's helpful uh, but we need to make sure that that first week the 17th through the 21st that we spend that time uh, orienting our students on e-learning and the possibility of switching to e-learning I'll ask my colleagues and they're certainly not shy and then we have our building principals we know they're not shy even when I call them at nine o'clock at night to ask to ask them to be a panelist so uh, any thoughts from you all, again, from my perspective? We want to do this right. There is no magic bullet, and if there's anything that I can demonstrate, and that's, that's about being flexible, being able to make decisions, and being flexible and being reflective in those decisions. And we want to do what's right for our, for our community. Uh, colleagues, your thoughts? All right, let's ask our building principals, building since they're, they're on the battlefield. Let's, um, so the question really is, do you need more than one, orient, one week of orientation time with students? Go ahead, Mrs. Milley. I don't think we need another uh, week of orientation time. I, I feel just a sense of urgency to get our kids in the building, get them oriented, and get started in a habit of that hybrid learning, that Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday. Kids crave routine, and I think the more we stretch that out, we just – we lose that ability to dig in. So um, from an elementary standpoint, and I haven't asked my other elementary colleagues for that, I think uh, knowing that if we were just have 20% of our kids, that's very few at an elementary level typically per classroom. Um, so I think we could do a really good job of getting them going, but then I would love to start the hybrid learning um, for as long as we possibly can and uh, right as, much, as soon as we can. So one week for me. All right, um, secondary level, Mr. Gochi? Yeah. Or do we have Mr. Veit still yeah. on? John, are you there? Yep, I'm there. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. I, I, I both concur with Molly, and um, I also, but I also think that it kind of depends on what, what our next step is. So if we are, if we are uh, have an ability to do 20% and then we're anticipating going to remote learning, then yeah, I probably would like the two weeks just to establish a little better relationship. But if we're going for one week and then going into a hybrid model where our kids are coming, um, I'm with Molly. 
So um, I think I, that's all I would say. Yeah. Greg, and that's a good point, and hopefully I did a decent job of saying, look, when we have this first week, we may have to be ready to go to full e-learning. Thank you for bringing it up. Mr. Veit, go ahead. John? Uh, I, I would agree with my colleagues. I think one week, if we know that we're going to transition to the hybrid model where we get, we're going to continue to see the students twice a week in that setting, I think one week to transition just basically, it's, it's one week. However, that's truly just one day per student. But in such small groups, we can get through our classes, we can get what we need set up, and then uh, get those routines going with that hybrid model. So I think that one would be fine. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at differently if we if we knew our status was going to change to something different, extending that out further, like to Greg's point, could be uh, well spent. But knowing what we've got right now, one week could be fine. Okay, final question from Director Long, and I'm going to ask for a motion. Director Long, question? Um, so, in, so this entire uh, coho things, who's going to create that? Is the principal's responsibility or the district is going to give our 70 district schools principal, this is what it is. Uh, I mean, who's, who, who, who will do this? Uh, Director Long, and I'll, I'll, I'll also ask our executive directors of schools, since they're directly working with principals, and I've certainly enjoyed this summer. I mean, we've been at this uh, since March. Uh, Ted, uh, Mr. Knight and I, and on these calls, and this needs to be all hands on. We will never ever, certainly not while I'm superintendent here, take something this big and give it to principals or to DOS and say, hey, go figure this out. We're gonna figure this out together. We're gonna listen uh, to them. And I think that today is a great exercise of that. So it's not solely on the principal's shoulders and it's not solely on the district's shoulders. And uh, we're gonna look closely to our EDOS. I know, uh, Danelle, you've done some extraordinary work. Um, but I hate to say behind the scenes, but you're really quiet. You're a quiet leader. Uh, can you give us your, your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, exactly to your point, Dr. Tucker, we have already started having the conversations with our building principals about how we would determine the cohorts. Um, we need their voice in it, and, and to what Dr. Tucker just said, this has to be a collaborative decision-making process that as soon as we know that that is the what we need to do, we will get to it very early next week with determining how we, um, how we slice our cohorts into A and B. And um, we've talked about it, you know, starting with alphabet and then really looking at needs base because we want to cluster group some of our student populations based on needs so we can best um, uh, meet their needs through our instructional approach, so. Okay, directors, a motion for the hybrid model, and then I would also ask that you include in your motion the minimally one week of orientation time for students. So is there a motion? All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so like some others on the board here, I'm weighing this not only as a board director, but as a parent of a DCSD student, a proud parent as well. Um, so as a, as a parent, and I would add, before I comment on what David, Director A just asked, as a parent, we spoke, we've been speaking a lot about all the things our staff and principals can do, but I would say as a parent, I think this is an incredible opportunity for our students to become leaders, to exhibit amazing citizenship and guidance within their schools that they'll never have an opportunity like this to do that. So that being said, that's just a little aside, given the survey results, the feedback from our parents, given the guidance that we heard from Dr. Douglas, Tri-County Health, and other health groups out there, given all the discussions that we've had today, and that we've all had previously with our different principals and staff, and the feedback that we've gotten, can't thank our principals enough for, for joining this. It added a really different element to the conversations and very useful given you guys are on the front lines. Um, given the robust detailed plan presented by our superintendent and staff and all this mind you following just following a few weeks after we just went through a massive budget shortfall to the district. So all this has happened on a dime. So credit there. Given that we know students need personal connections, some students face 
face a very harsh reality by staying at home and often a teacher can spot that mental health duress by being in the classroom with them. Knowing the system limitations we have and focusing only on those things that we can fully control. There's so many things we spoke about today that really I don't foresee how we'll ever control. We can just really focus on the things that we uh, are in our power to control. Uh, knowing that we are providing options for all DCSD families to make the best choice for their family. There's, there's great options that we're, we're offering um, here for all our, our students. Um, and knowing there's an understanding and recognition that we need to be absolutely flexible and fluid going forward. Here we are doing just that. We're, we're a minute into do after Dr. Tucker's uh, recommendation and we're trying to you know conceivably pivot after that. And finally, I think most importantly going forward, we need to live out the words we shared to our very own students, the graduating class of 2020, who we told to be ready and resilient. So I think absolutely from our standpoint here today, we as a district, we as leaders in the district, we have to do that for them. So it's with that, um, I feel very comfortable to put forth a motion to approve the recommendation as proposed by Dr. Cook, uh, the superintendent and staff. Motion's been made to approve the recommendation made by Dr. Tucker and staff. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Director Chancha Shore. Further discussion? I would just, I, I would jump in and just echo what uh, Director Graziano said. I've already gotten some hate mail that said I already had my mind made up about a hybrid model. I didn't even know what the heck a hybrid model was until we sat through this work session today. Um, my mind was made up to have 100% students back in school as soon as possible. Uh, that, that was where I was back in, back in June. But I agree with our director, Graziano, the compelling case is that options have been made. We have listened to medical experts. I think we take it slow. Um, I, I heard compelling arguments from my peers that when we try to open things up wide open like we've seen in other parts of the country, it's not been positive, not positive results. Um, I don't think we should live in fear. Um, I hate that notion of thinking that we should live in fear. I, I think uh, this to me is the best of both worlds. It gives us a chance to orient our students. It gives us a chance to get them back in the building. It gives us a chance to learn as we go so that we're not just always in reaction mode. Um, so so I, I think this is really um, a, a middle ground, if you will, in terms of everybody's viewpoints to give us a chance to, to, to learn as we go and to give our parents and our families still options. I'm also like Director Holtzman though, I like details. And so I'm gonna challenge Dr. Tucker and staff um, at our August 4th meeting to really help hammer out this whole high school uh, issue around what that hybrid model looks like. Because um, I think we're still a little apprehensive about how that, how that will work. So I'd love to see us have more details at our next meeting, you know, in terms of really giving you now permission to, to jump in there and launch this. I think you guys will have a lot more to give us at our next meeting. So, um, so I'm very much in favor with the recommendation as well. Other discussion points, uh, directors, before we vote? Director Holtzman? Yeah, I, um, I, I'm in agreement with, with the motion. I, um, I think it's difficult for any of us to get there because we all just want zero risk and we're just not gonna get to that um, with any kind of in-person option. So after having all these discussions today and um, knowing that you're gonna continue the good work, um, that, that's important to me that you continue and that we do hear what Director Ray asked for in regards to especially the high schools. Um, I, I, I think that this is a, an option that we need to give our students and our families. And I, I just wanted to clarify, really the reason I wanted to speak was to clarify that this recommendation also includes the online only option. I'm not sure it's on that screen, but it's included. And um, just take a moment to just really ask our community for support. Um, support by helping us keep the incidence rates low. We can't do this by ourselves. Um, none of us can. Our students can't, cannot do it by themselves. Our teachers can't. 
We need our whole community to participate and to follow all of these mitigating strategies that we've talked about all day. And I would just really ask that people take it seriously. And I would echo Director Hansen. Um, this is a board decision and we're responsible. And I would hope that you would direct your anger to us and that you would support our staff as they support your students. And um, that's all I've got. I do want to just clarify, Director Holtzman made a clarification to your motion, Director Graziano, that also implies that a full parallel e-learning option is also offered as well. Is, is that acceptable to your motion? Yeah, I mean, my understanding was we were going to be offering as an option, as a choice to some people who chose that would be e-learning and if they didn't want to attend or come back in a hybrid or in-person model. So that's- Director Graziano, you're absolutely right. Uh, the e-learning option is available uh, because uh, whether uh, students want to come in person, you have an e-learning option, hybrid uh, as well. You'll, those e-learning students would have, if you will, I hate to use the term track, but they'll have their own track and will have their own teachers in both models. Just want to clarify that as part of the motion. Director Lung, any comments before we vote? Well, I want to um, appreciate, you know, uh, Dr. Tucker's and the staff. You know, you, you guys are awesome. Um, two weeks ago, um, we don't even have these options. And um, because of the science, the data that coming out, and um, you're so willing to make sure that our school district did the best for our student at the same time, you know, do it uh, for our teacher. And, and for that, I, I feel so grateful. And my board colleague at the same time um, is also so willingness to uh, open up to a different options, which as president raised at that, you know, I think many of you are in favor of uh, in-person learning. Um, and and I, I, it just shows that the board and uh, our staff are willing to listen to science to decide what is the best way um, to go. And I personally um, would favor um, to have start with you know, online learning. Um, be, as indicated by DPS and JEPCO, you know, is moving this way. However, you know, I also will support you know, this plan, um, seeing that and knowing that Dr. Tucker said that if things change, um, this will go either way, um, you know, uh, before the school opens. So I have 100% confidence that he will make the right decisions um, if this does not, if the data is continuously coming back, not the way that we want it. Um, and, he, and, and, and so, so for that, um, I, I want to uh, support, you know, our hardworking staff and our dedicated um, uh, you know, superintendents and also, you know, the quick input from our community. Thank you. Director Meek, comments? Um, I just want to thank everyone. I believe our DCSD community needs clarity in order to help with the anxiety and stress that we're all feeling right now. And I appreciate all of the work that the staff has put into creating this plan. I think it's exactly where we need to go. Um, our success in moving towards our ideal state that we all said is in person all the time. Um, we can't do that without everyone partnering together. And so our schools, our central office, our leadership, other external communities. I mean, we, what we are approving today allows us to transition to in person or to flex to e-learning and to be responsive to the health needs in our community. And I just wanna thank everyone for all of your work. And I know we're just getting started with all of the work needed to implement that. Very good, Director Hansen, comments? I think that before we vote, it would just be good for you, if you wouldn't mind, um, President, Ray, is just to summarize exactly what we are voting on, just to state it one more time for everyone who's listening, just to make sure we are all on the same page um, for our community. So we're voting And on... I don't mind restating it now if that's easier, but sure. um, I just sure. thought before we vote, that would be helpful. 
So uh, if, if everybody references slide 63, uh, Director Graziano has made recommendation to approve the recommendation that Dr. Tucker made, and we qualified that by saying, in addition, there is an e-learning model that will be offered as an option to any family that chooses to do that instead of this hybrid model. So again, it's really approving slide 63 plus the e-learning parallel model. All right, any other comments? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Director Chancha Shore, comments? Yes, thank you. Um, education is the responsibility of all of our community. So um, I challenge our community to show how they can continue to support our school district at this point in time. I challenge our, our fellow politicians. I challenge all of our business owners. I challenge our community of parents to how can you help? Um, this is a decision now that our schools need to take forward. Yes, um, it's been about five minutes and we're already see receiving pings and um, text messages about how people feel. Right now, what I really wish and hope people will do in our community is take all of this energy and direct it towards what can your business do to support the people that work for you? What can your government agencies do that support our community so that our schools can fully function in a safe way for our students to get back to school and continue to be in-person learning? So that's my challenge and that's my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Director Chancha Shore. And with that, let's vote. Director Chancha Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye, and that passes unanimously. All right, so last thing on our agenda board is to talk about our next steps as far as continuing to support staff and to continuing to govern with excellence. Um, so a couple things we need to talk about. One is Director Holtzman brought up that we had a resolution or we have an active resolution in place during a state of emergency was the reason we put this in place because at that time we had no idea if we would be able to come back together and, and meet in person like we've done today. We had no idea what the future held in terms of how decisions would need to be made. And so we created a resolution that actually was intended to make decision making more expedient. So we have one question is whether that resolution is still uh, pertinent given that we are maybe slightly out of a state of emergency we're still in somewhat of a crisis mode, obviously, um, but I think that's the question on the table uh, regarding that. And then I wanna talk about, uh, real quickly, our th next steps as far as topics that we need to have addressed or deal with for the August meeting, and then we'll adjourn. So I'm gonna open it up to discussion. The resolution specifically says, resolution to increase responsiveness and decision-making efficiency during state of emergency. And again, this resolution basically gave authorization for the superintendent to do several things, including modifying the calendar, um, doing things like providing school meals, um, adjustments to curriculum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because of us being in a state of emergency, we um, authorized our superintendent to make those quick decisions because it was necessary. So with that board, what are your thoughts about that resolution? Is it still pertinent? Do we still keep it in, intact? Or do you feel like that we need to move ourselves out of the state of emergency to as normal as possible uh, governance of a board? So thoughts about that. Director Holtzman? Yeah, I would advocate <clears throat> that we really, it's every day still feels somewhat like a crisis, but we're in a different place now than we were three months ago. Um, we have a lot more information, although it's emerging. We have more public health recommendations and data, and we have some basic structure, and we just made a very important decision to move us forward. Um, I would advocate, and, and I'll make the motion actually, now or at a different time. Go ahead. Um, I'll make the motion that we rescind that resolution. Okay, so there's, so there's been a motion to rescind this resolution. I would second it. And seconded by Director Long. Further discussion uh, regarding rescinding this, res this resolution. Um, I just want to check with Chancha Shore, Hansen, whether was there any comments, questions regarding that? 
I see no, no, okay. No, thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion, let's go ahead and vote. Chancha Shore. I'm sorry, aye. Uh, Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. Okay, that resolution is now rescinded uh, by unanimous vote. So things that I noted that um, are next steps for us. One is, as we talked about earlier, is we're really wanting, again, to have um, some more information around what does hybrid look like at our high school level specifically, but also giving our staff now time with all levels to begin filling in the details about how this hybrid model is going to work. But so for our next agenda item, really giving our community as well as, as ourselves more education around how this is going to look. Um, I also have on here uh, the COVID-19 risk level guidance that Dr. Tucker briefly shared with us, but it was really in draft form to say, okay, when we're at this percentage of positivity or this percentage of incidence, what does that mean for us in terms of how we go back to e-learning or go back to in-person? So I thought that might be worthy for us just to spend a little bit more time to again support our staff and Dr. Tucker and being able to pivot and make those decisions uh, with having that model uh, well established. And then um, I think, um, then, we, then we talked about policies that we wanted to come back and really talk about how do we support the system in terms of whether that's a resolution to nullify certain details of current policies or to add certain details of policies, whether that's superintendent policies or whether that's board policies. But at that time, uh, having legal counsel, Mrs. Clemens, help us with kind of navigating what that should look like at our next meeting. So those were the three big rocks that I thought I heard for our next steps. Were there other things, Director Lung? And then I see Dr. Tucker as well. Director Lung? Well, I would like to add another big rock, which is now we're going to the hybrid model. How are we going to support our staff? We heard over and over again that many of our staff is also parent. And um, it will create a lot of difficulty for them you know, with childcare, uh, with, the, with their schedule and things like that. And, um, and, and also the liability that they may have. I'm, I'm sure that you know, our, our counselor is gonna give us a memo, but, but I think how are we going to make them feel at ease that with, with going back, um, they are not going to get sued or, or have incurred any expense? So, so I think how are we taking care of staff it is a very, very important topic that I would like um, to be on there. So within that, that hybrid model, uh, as we get more depth, just more explanation about support for staff, support for staff who have children, um, just a little bit more detail on that. Dr. Tucker? Uh, yes, now that we, and especially the board, uh, has a better understanding of this crisis and the different uh, steps we need to take, I would uh, ask that the board, and I'll ask for your uh, assistance and your guidance, that uh, two board members continue meeting with us on the crisis team as we make uh, sense of this situation. That's Again, I'm, I'm, you're right, we've come a long way since March. We have done some things right, and uh, I'm glad of that, and I'm glad the board is comfortable uh, in making these decisions, but I would ask that we set up a schedule to keep our crisis team together, because this thing here is not going away. I think that's, that's a great recommendation, and, and I'm more than glad to continue to, have, to be one of those board directors, but I don't have, to, I mean, we can rotate in if that's preferable. I know we had Director Holtzman and myself, uh, but I would agree, Dr. Tucker, it really, um, I, th I felt made a huge difference into the cohesion of what we did. And if nothing else, it gave me high regard and respect for, for what your cabinet does. So, um, so board, uh, the suggestion is even though we're rescinding the resolution that we maintain uh, this model of cabinet and board communication throughout the next, the, throughout the next year, really, as we continue to navigate that is uh, any any thoughts about that or concerns or questions, Director Lung? Well, um, I would like to have a rotation model 
so I think um, it's important for us, um, you know, I mean, some of us that are willing to, who want to uh, participate, will be able to uh, sit in and get a feel how the sit, you know, uh, looks like. Um, after all, all seven of us are elected equal. Um, and um, I think all of us should have an equal chance to practice and, and know what's going on. And, uh, so sure. that, that would be my So supporting the kind of a rotational model, sure. Directors, any uh, other? Director Graziano? I would just suggest, and I don't know if this was something that was part of the items that you listed, but to me, this would be the, the optimal time to go through the, the, whatever that dashboard looks like that we spoke of. I didn't know if that was something that was part of your the things that we included, but I think we spoke of coming up with like a something that we could look at regularly to see how we were doing yes. with that. And yes. so that's and, the COVID nineteen risk so that level was, guide. That was your yep, okay. Yep. Yep. So, so we then, will. Continue to add detail and depth to that document. Yes, and one other point of emphasis, when I went through this detail, there were, regardless of whatever model we have, uh, now that we have our plan in place, uh, it will always have an e-learning component, whether it's hybrid um, or in per fully in person. Very good. All right. Anything else, board, for next steps? Uh, Director Holtzman, then Director Lung. Yeah, I don't think you said this, but, um I would like to have an update on the high school cohorting um, model and any increased um, mitigation factors at the high school level in particular. So again, along with that hybrid conversation is really del delving more deeply around cohorting, especially at the high school level, what that would look like um, to help mitigate uh, any transmission. All right, Directors, Director Lung. I would like to, um, now we know which model we're going to go with, I would like to get a financial analysis to see how it will um, you know, increase our expense or decrease our expense. And now we actually are proving a hybrid plus the online learning. I mean, staffing will be an issue. Anyway, I want a financial update. I see, I see our CFO nodding vigorously. She's, she's ready to give us some numbers. All right. So that will be part of that hybrid discussion too, is budgetary impact. All right, board, anything else? Anything else for next steps? Well, I'm sorry, Director Meek? Uh, do we need to look at, um, I'm not saying communications. Um, <laughs> do we need to look at uh, tasks for our board committees that we may want to think about how they can help us in the communications piece? So we are, so yes. Committee tasks, we need to prioritize because that's what we typically do on an annual basis on, at this session. So that's something we need to, I don't know if that'll be our next meeting, but maybe the second August meeting, we can uh, become focused on that. Director Chacha Shore or Director Hansen, any um, other next step items that you want to call out? I would like to assure that um, we maintain the ability to participate remotely. So currently we have an active resolution that does allow us to do that. Um, so Director Chanchashore is advocating that we maintain that resolution as an active resolution and not rescind it yet. Okay. And anything else, Director Lung? I, I would like to know, um, does, the reason why we can pass the resolution is because we are under the state of emergency from the governors, right? Because normally, the board cannot have people participate in remotely and vote for that. The statute has changed to where, indeed, we can participate remotely now. Is it only for the, during the crisis, or is it permanently? It's permanent. And so the, the resolution that we passed, though, was temporary. It was, we did not change our policy. So statute has been changed to allow boards to do that. As far as I know, Director Meek, and, and indefinitely, I right. don't think we there's We just any... have to update our policy, though, I believe, yeah. because we handled it through a resolution right. instead. Right. OK. All right. Well, we've come to a conclusion. I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing a benediction other than just how grateful I am to sit with all of you. Um, I, I feel like that we have been thorough, comprehensive, we've been thoughtful, and staff 
Um, my goodness, uh, how incredible it is to be on this journey with all of you. So, so thank you for, for all your great work. So with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn.